Hello everyone and welcome to the complete Linux course. This course was previously hosted on Udemy and I am now making it available to everyone here on YouTube. This course was designed to be a survey of Linux, so we're going to touch a lot of topics. This is a complete list of topics and I will post this in the description to this video as timestamps. But we start with a general introduction to Linux, what are Linux distributions, then we move on to installation, we get into the command line, we move into the file system, how to create, delete, transfer files, move on to some development, some networking, and general, uh, I guess, Linux administrative tests. If at any point you find yourself needing help or you'd like some more one-on-one -on -one attention or a tutor of sorts, I, ha I currently have a great course on Udemy that is Linux-based. It's a pen testing course, and I will put a link to that course in the description as well. So be sure and like, comment, and subscribe. And without further ado, I'll turn you over to Nick, who will be your instructor for this course. Hi, guys. I'm Nick. Thanks for joining me today. Together, we're going to take a journey through Linux and give you the knowledge you need to be a power user. But first, we must ask the question, what is Linux? Well, confusingly, it depends on who you ask. In order to get an idea of what Linux is, we've got to go back in time a bit. In the early 80s, Richard Stallman, then working in the AI lab at MIT, started the GNU project with the goal of creating an entirely free and open Unix-like operating system. This all started when the lab got a new printer, but the licenses restricted his ability to modify the code. He had hacked earlier printers to electronically send messages to users who printed items when the printing was complete, as well as notifying other users when the printer was free to use. By the early 90s, there was almost enough GNU software to create an entire operating system, However, their kernel, the GNU herd, was not yet complete. Meanwhile, in the early 90s, Linus Torvalds set out on a hobby project to develop a Unix-like kernel known as Linux and used GNU software such as GNU's C compiler to do it. While a kernel on its own was useless, he ended up including GNU software with the kernel to release an operating system. Later, Richard Stallman's Free Software Foundation sponsored the group Debian to release a GNU slash Linux distribution that was completely open for people to use and contribute to. Debian, over the years, grew from a small group of Free Software Foundation hackers to the enormous community that it is today. Due to its popularity, Debian has become the base of countless Linux distributions. Because of how open the software is, anybody can read the source code, modify it, and then redistribute it. Because of this, this is what we have now. It's kind of a mess. There are so many Linux distributions that a common problem for beginners is, what Linux distribution should I use? While there are a few distros out there that actually include its own software, one of the biggest problems in Linux is how many distros there are, and the fact that a lot of them are the same distribution with new wallpapers and icons and everything else is the same. Ubuntu was started in the early 2000s and is owned and distributed by Canonical. The base of Ubuntu is Debian, and Ubuntu has become so popular that it has, in turn, been forked countless times. Forking is a process in which the operating system is used as the base of a new distribution. Ubuntu includes its own desktop environment called Unity, and has recently started distributing phones running a version of Ubuntu. Canonical also contributes bug fixes and other contributions upstream, meaning that they send these changes back to Debian to include in future releases. While Debian releases new versions sporadically, Ubuntu's aim was to capture the stability of Debian, but release new versions more frequently. As such, Canonical releases two distributions a year, one in April and one in October. The naming convention of Ubuntu is year-month. So the version we'll be working with was released in October of 2015 and is called Ubuntu 15.10. Every two years in April, a long-term support version is released, called LTS, which is officially supported for five years, while releases in between LTS versions are supported for only nine months. 
The next LTS release will be in April of 2016. So to download Ubuntu, we're going to go to ubuntu.com. And when the page loads, we're going to see uh, in the top navigation that there's an option that says desktop. So just click on that uh, because that's the version of Ubuntu we're going to be working with. And then when you get on the overview page, just click download Ubuntu, the big orange button in the main uh, area. And on this page, it's going to give us a few versions. So it's going to prompt us to download the last LTS release, which was released in 2014 in April. If you're going to be running Ubuntu on a server, it makes sense to run long-term support versions because you only need to install a new version like every five years. Uh, you can install more frequently because uh, there's a new LTS version every two years, but with a non-LTS version, there's only official support um, and bug fixes and whatnot for nine months. So we're going to go with one of the nine month cycles here and download the latest stable release, which is Ubuntu 15.10. This was just released uh, maybe 10, 15 days ago. And we're going to download 64-bit because that's the processor type we're running. You can either click the download button to download it directly in the browser, or you can click alternative downloads and torrents uh, to, to view what type of other files you can download. Now, if you're running on a really super fast internet connection, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, the the in-browser download is probably going to download just as quickly as a torrent. However, if you don't have an incredible internet connection, a torrent download is going to make a lot of sense. It's going to download a lot quicker than it would in the browser. Now, I've already got uh, my version downloaded. It took about 10-15 minutes and just because I have really bad internet at the moment. The next thing we're going to do, we're not going to install Ubuntu directly onto our hard drive yet. That's an awful big commitment to make when you don't really, uh, when you're not really as familiar with the system. So what we're going to do is go to virtualbox.org and this is a piece of software that allows us to create virtualized machines, virtual machines, or a virtual computer, if you want to call it that. This allows us to create different virtual machines and set them up differently, as well as install different operating systems on each one. So when you get to virtualbox.org, there's a gigantic button here that you cannot miss. Click on that. And it's going to take you to the download page for VirtualBox. Now, it offers different packages dependent on different operating systems. This is going to be for the host machine. And to put that in clearer terms, the computer that I'm on right now that we can see is running Windows 10, that is the host machine. So I need to download VirtualBox 5 for Windows hosts this link right here. If you click that, it's going to start the download. Now, I've already got mine downloaded. And we're going to need these uh, in, in the next few videos. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, thanks for joining me again. Before we actually get into the installation and use of Ubuntu, we are first going to talk about distributions and what exactly that means. So to explain what a distribution is, we're going to load up this image here. And this image uh, presented this way and in the slideshow in the previous video is so large that it's entirely illegible. So we actually have to zoom in quite a bit here. Now in the previous video I mentioned Debian and how Debian was one of the first major Linux distributions. Uh, along with Slackware, Red Hat, and OpenSUSE, they are the four different types of Linux distributions. And a type is categorized based on the package manager. Now there are different Linux distributions that are not based on these four. Uh, for instance, Gentoo and Arch Linux. However, we're not gonna focus on those at this time. So Debian starts here in the early 90s. 
and as time goes on it begins to get forked which means that other people come along and use the source code base of Debian to create their own Linux distribution. Now, if we look for Ubuntu, it's, I believe this brown line right here, we'll see how much forking of Ubuntu there's been as well. So here's Ubuntu and immediately we've got all sorts of forks happening. Now, there are two different types of Ubuntu derivatives, and that is officially recognized and not officially recognized. So a few examples of officially recognized Ubuntu distributions are Kubuntu, U Ubuntu Studio, and uh, Lubuntu, Zubuntu, and basically Kubuntu is Ubuntu with KDE pre-installed instead of Unity. So Unity is the desktop environment of Ubuntu. And a desktop environment, we're gonna go more in depth into desktop environments in a, a future video. However, to give a little bit of an idea about what it is, we're gonna just have a look at some images here. So this is Unity. It's got a panel across the top of the screen with different indicators, a clock, and this is a user menu that you can access, user accounts, system settings, etc. On the left-hand side, it's got another panel that acts as a dock. So opened applications and applications that you pin to the dock will appear here. The top button here is to launch the dash. And now, the Ubuntu Dash is incredible. I absolutely love it. While I don't like much anything else about Ubuntu, the Dash is really awesome. So you can actually search for files, programs, etc. And you can even use the Ubuntu Dash to find things online. So it's, it's actually a pretty neat concept. Now, Kubuntu has KDE pre-installed, which is a different desktop environment. And so it's gonna look and act differently. Now this is KDE 5 Plasma. They call it the desktop environment. Um, so KDE Plasma 5. And obviously you can see the differences. It's got a window list here of open windows. It's got the indicators and time over here and the main menu right there, which looks like this. Now, the, the Kubuntu and Ubuntu Studio and others are officially recognized derivatives of Ubuntu, but Linux Mint is not. If we go to linuxmint.com, you'll see that they did in fact develop their own desktop environment called Cinnamon, and Cinnamon, the desktop environment, is absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorites. If we look for, uh, here we go. Should be able to just click on this. No. Oh, yep, there we go, okay. So this is Linux Mint with the Cinnamon desktop environment. It's similar to a classic desktop environment in that it has a panel at the bottom with a main menu and a window list of open windows. Elementary OS is right here. That's another one that I want to talk about. I've used Elementary in the past and it as well in very different ways is very beautiful, very fun to use. It The aesthetics alone are just absolutely mind-blowing. They've got the cleanest interface that I've seen. This is a transparent panel at the top with an applications menu, the clock and indicators, and it's got a dock for open windows. Now, aside from this, their own desktop environment, they've also created other software uh, specifically for use with an elementary OS, such as the Pantheon File Manager. 
And that's one of my favorite file managers, just because it does a lot of different things in a really neat way. Now, with Ubuntu-based distributions, installation is practically the same, with a few exceptions. So feel free to explore the different Linux distributions if you don't think you'll have problems following along when things look a bit different. Now, when I get Ubuntu set up, I'm going to make some configurations and changes and show you guys uh, sort of how to do that stuff. But feel free to, you know, explore the vast ocean of Linux distributions. So in the next video, we're actually going to be installing VirtualBox and Ubuntu, and we're going to be playing around with that a little bit and explaining the installation steps. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys again soon. Hello world. Thanks for joining me again. Today we're going to be installing VirtualBox and Ubuntu in VirtualBox. So the files that we've downloaded in the first video, uh, one of them is the actual VirtualBox installer, and then we also have the Ubuntu ISO, or disk image. So we're going to start by running VirtualBox installer as administrator. Now the installation of this is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, it doesn't really require you to configure anything. So once it comes up, just hit Next next, next, uh, yes, and then install. And once this installs, you'll see how we are able to create virtual machines or virtual computers that we can run on our host Windows operating system. And the virtual machines will have their own virtual disk image, uh, which is basically like a hard drive. So we can create that and you'll see what I mean in a moment. So once the installer finishes, we're going to leave that checked because we want to start the virtual box uh, immediately. So just hit finish and should start up here. Right there. So this is a virtual box. It's a very clean and simple interface. Uh, you've got a menu bar up here, uh, which you'll probably never touch. And then you've also got a toolbar with icons here. So to get started, we're going to hit New to create a new uh, virtual machine. And I'm going to name it Ubuntu. Uh, the type is Linux, and the version is going to be, it should default to Ubuntu 64-bit, which uh, is great because we've got a 64-bit disk image to use. So click Next, and here we're going to allot it a certain amount of our actual RAM to use on the virtual machine. Uh, you can set this to whatever you like. Typically, uh, you don't want to go into this um, orange or pink field because that's going to give you less RAM on your host machine. So I typically like to set it to about half of my total RAM, which is 4096 megabytes, 4 gigabytes. Uh, once you've got this set, just hit Next, and we're going to create a virtual disk now. We're going to be using the VDI, or Virtual Box Disk Image Format, so just hit Next. Uh, the difference between dynamically al allocated and fixed size is that in a moment we're going to be able to choose a target size for the Virtual Box Disk Image. Uh, with a fixed size, that's always going to be the same. So it's always, if we set it to 20 gigabytes, uh, that's always going to consume exactly 20 gigabytes on our host hard drive as a file. If we dynamically allocate it, what that means is that we can set the target size to 20 gigabytes, but if there's only like 5 gigabytes of actual data on that virtual drive, it's only going to consume that five gigabytes on our host drive as a file. So dynamically allocated is always what I use. Uh, it just seems better. So hit next, and here is where we are able to choose the target size of the hard drive. So I'm going to choose 20 gigabytes. Hit create, and here is our virtual machine. 
Uh, we have an option to start it right now, which is going to be useless because we haven't yet told it what type of installation uh, media we want to use. So select the virtual box in the left hand menu and hit settings. When the settings comes up, there's not much we need to really uh, do here. Uh, if we go to system, uh, we need to make sure enable IO APIC is on. Uh, hardware clock and UTC time should be defaulted as well. Uh, if we go to the processor tab, we see that it's using one core of my quad core processor. Now we can increase this, but I find you get worse performance uh, the more cores you use. So we're not going to do that. Uh, acceleration should always be enabled. If you have trouble with this um, and you're on Windows 10, you've actually got to do something else. So if I go into Programs and Features by right-clicking on the Start menu icon, then go to Turn Windows Features On or Off. Now, here's an interesting thing. Hypervisor is a virtualization technology that Windows includes by default. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, pre-configured to use. Uh, if it's checked, that means it is. If it's unchecked, it means it's not. Uh, so if you have trouble with setting up a virtual machine, uh, basically what you're going to want to do is, first of all, come in here and make sure this is disabled. So make sure it's unchecked. If it's checked, uncheck it. It's going to prompt you to restart. Uh, once that's configured, you've got to actually go into your BIOS and you've got to enable virtualization technology for your processor. So to boot into the BIOS, you're going to restart your computer normally and as soon as it comes back on, before you see the Windows logo or anything like that, you're going to repeatedly strike the key. Uh, it's normally F10. Your uh, motherboard might have a different key that it uses to get into BIOS. Sometimes it's F2. So just try that and once you get into the BIOS, uh, follow these images and you should have no trouble at all. So back to the virtual box. Um, if we go to display, we're going to see that the video memory is set really low at 12 megabytes. Uh, that's not going to really help much. So what we're going to do is Put that up all the way to the end, which is 128 megabytes. Uh, it should give better performance. And we're going to enable 3D acceleration. 2D acceleration is only available on Windows guest machines, so that's relevant at this point. Uh, if we come down to the storage item, this is what we need to use to tell the virtual image to um, load up our Ubuntu ISO. So select the empty disk here. And on the right hand side, you'll see this icon here. I've already pre-selected it in a previous run, but uh, what you're gonna do is click choose virtual optical disk file, and then browse to where you save the ISO. Select it and hit open. Now this tells the virtual machine that we want to use this ISO to boot off of and to install the system. We don't really need to go through anything else, um, so just hit OK. And now we can start the virtual machine. It might take uh, a little bit longer to load in a virtual machine uh, as, as uh, opposed to actually booting the ISO image on your hard drive. Uh, that's a process we'll cover later, but for right now, we're going to stick with VirtualBox, and it, it is a bit laggy, so I apologize for that. So here is the loading screen. It's very minimalistic uh, running in VirtualBox. It, it is quite a bit different, but again, we'll get into that. So we're just going to wait for it to boot. It uh, showing a warning message there that's not really important because it is going to load. Now once it does load the interface, we're going to see that we get scroll bars here. We can scroll up and down or left and right. We don't want that. That's going to make it difficult to navigate the machine. So what I'm going to do is go up to view, go to full screen mode. 
Now in full screen mode, if you want to exit, you've got this little menu down at the bottom that you can access. You can unmaximize it, you can entirely close it if you want to. We're just going to let it load up the installation. Now when, when loading the installation, uh, you can try it first or you can just install it straight to the disk, or the virtual disk in this case. So I'm going to click Install Ubuntu. Uh, for the purpose of this video, I don't want the installation to take too long, so I'm not going to download updates while installing, but I am going to install third-party software. If you're using this on your personal machine and not a server, you're probably going to want this because this allows you to play MP3, MP4 videos, and, and a host of other uh, file formats that it will recognize with proprietary third-party software. So uh, we're going to hit continue. So running in VirtualBox, um, it's going to be safe to erase disk and install Ubuntu. It does, it's not going to erase your entire hard drive. It's going to use the 20 gigabyte virtual hard drive that we have predefined in previous steps. Uh, however, I want to show you uh, a little bit more about the partitioning that we're going to be, again, diving into in a later video. But for right now, it's a good idea to have a bit of knowledge. So select something else and hit continue. And this is our virtual disk drive. It's called SDA. What we're going to do is create a new partition table because we haven't, it's, it's a fresh hard drive there. Hit continue on that message and we've got 21,000 megabytes. A free space. Now we're going to create a partition which is going to serve as a swap area. Now swap space is basically like extra RAM that's, oh I forgot to uh, resize that. Let me uh, change this here. I'm going to delete it and start again. So this is our free space. Create a swap drive. So in the use as uh, drop down, select swap area. Change this to about five gigabytes. That should be fine and hit okay. So swap space serves as a sort of extra random access memory uh, that is not on the RAM but it's actually on the hard drive. So it's a bit slower than RAM and it uses it for different uh, reasons and it uh, it's necessary. So uh, on an actual installation, I like to set that to about eight to 16 gigabytes, uh, but we're working with limited space here. So I'm gonna make it five gigabytes. Now, once you get that created, you're gonna see that the free space is now down here and we've got 16 gigabytes left. So hit the plus sign down here we're going to use it as X4 journaling file system. That's just the file system type. If you drop that down, you've got all sorts. You can use the old FAT32, FAT16. Um, we're going to stick with this. This is the best option to choose when running Linux. It's uh, really fast. And the mount point, we're going to set that to a forward slash. And what that is going to tell the installation is that we want to use this partition that we're creating right now, the 16 gigabyte partition, as the entire file system. So in Linux, uh, forward slash represents the root. Uh, and if I wanted to set this uh, to my home partition, which is a specific partition for user files, I could actually type home, reduce that size, and then use another partition for the root. Uh, we'll get more into that. Uh, this is pretty flexible, so I'm just going to install everything to this partition and hit OK. The device for bootloader installation, typically we don't need to touch that at all. Ubuntu is pretty smart with determining where to install the bootloader. Now we're installing this in legacy mode, not EFI. If you've ever heard of EFI, it's an awesome technology to use when dual booting uh, multiple operating systems 
But as for this demonstration, we're in VirtualBox and we've only got one. So it's going to install it in a legacy mode and the bootloader is going to be written to the very first sector of this disk drive. So when you're ready to move forward and you've got something that looks similar to this, hit install now. Uh, this is going to basically ask you, are you sure you want to make these changes because everything is going to be lost for any partitions that you're going to format, which are these two here. Yes, we want to do this. Uh, here we're going to choose our time zone. Uh, you've got uh, smart areas where you can pick. Um, you'll see the actual location down here. When you've chosen your time zone, hit continue. We're going to choose a keyboard layout. For most of us, this should be fine to use uh, English US uh, for the keyboard layout. If uh, you've got any of these alternative keyboard layouts, you're going to want to choose the correct one. Otherwise, keys may be mapped incorrectly. Um, I, I really can't help you with determining which one to use. Uh, you can actually type here to test. So if I want to make sure my my left key under the A is uh, a backslash, I'm going to click that, and it's not actually. That's uh, weird. I never use that key anyway, so <laughs> I always use the English uh, U.S. Let me see if they've got English Canada. Got U.K. French Canada. Uh, we're going to stick with this even though one key is, is messed up. We've still got one, two, and all the numbers and all the, the uh, letters. So that's the most important thing. Uh, so hit continue once you've chosen the correct keyboard layout based on your keyboard. And now we're going to set up our user. Uh, the computer name, this can be anything you want. It's a way to identify your machine, um, both in computer language and uh, if you're looking, uh, for instance, on your router and you're trying to see what machines are connected, the computer's name will be shown. So I'm going to name this Megatron. And then choose your username and your password. And you've got some extra options here. Log in automatically or require password to log in. This one's more secure. If you uh, throw caution to the wind, you might want to select this option. And then hit continue. Now we're presented with a little demonstration of uh, what to expect with Ubuntu. You can use these icons to scroll left and right. Uh, this demonstrates the software center where you can install and uninstall and manage uh, software on your computer. Comes with Rhythmbox Music Player, which is uh, great. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've had no need to use anything else. So, uh, comes with some image software. Uh, GIMP, you can install it, it's not pre installed. This is basically like an open source uh, alternative to Photoshop, and it's got the video editor as well. Firefox is pre-installed. Chromium you can install, and you can also install Flash. Chromium is uh, an open source version of Google Chrome. You can also install Google Chrome, and we're going to be going through that in the next video, which is going to be a basic configuration. You've got LibreOffice pre-installed. One great alternative to LibreOffice is called WPS Office, and I've actually had the pleasure to try that out recently. Uh, it doesn't use the ODT format, so uh, it's it's not going to suit me. So I'm going to stick with LibreOffice once we get this installed. Uh, here's uh, uh, an image of how you can customize your machine. You can set the background. Obviously, that's a feature you would expect with an operating system. Uh, you can also uh, make other configurations, and we're going to get to that uh, directly in the next video. And this is how to get support with Ubuntu. So Ubuntu has a lot of great outlets for asking questions uh, or reporting bugs. 
there are bugs. Uh, you'll probably not encounter any, or if you do, they'll be small and really won't uh, affect you, hopefully. Uh, we, we have some links here that uh, we can go to once we uh, reboot into the full operating system. This again is just the installer. Uh, community.ubuntu.com. They've got forums.ubuntu.com and also ubuntu.com slash support. They've also got chat. Um, uh, I think it's Freenode uh, is the chat server. They've got their own channel on there. So we'll also look at that once we can uh, it, it reboot into the system. So for right now, I'm going to pause uh, the screencast, and I will be back once the installation is done, and we can have a look at the system itself. All right, so the installation has been a success, and at this point, we need a restart. Uh, so I'm going to, and I'm also going to hover my mouse over this bar and select Devices and uncheck this disk. I think we need a wait actually. All right. So this should restart now and take us into the Ubuntu system. Hey guys, um, so the virtual machine actually uh, locked up there on that warning message, so I had to use the window controls uh, to actually close it. Um, hopefully you guys don't have the same issue. But uh, once we have that shut down, uh, we want to make sure that it's not going to try to boot up using the same uh, ISO because we no longer need to install it. So we need to make sure that this is empty. Um, if this is checked, uh, just click it, it should uncheck it, uh, hit OK, and now we're going to start the machine. So it should be uh, exactly the same as the previous uh, boot process. It's going to show this screen and then it should show the Ubuntu loading screen. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to click view in the menu bar and go to full screen mode. Uh, you can also uh, click a combination of the right control key and F in order to do this. So this is called light DM. It's uh, the, the login screen manager for Ubuntu. Uh, we see our user here and a password. So I'm going to put in my password here and hit enter. There we go. So this is Ubuntu, and it's going to load up with uh, a modal during your first launch that shows you keyboard shortcuts. Uh, the most notable thing here is that the super key here is uh, what the Windows key is called. So on your keyboard, you've got a key in the lower left that has the Windows icon on it. That is the super key. So thanks for joining me, and in the next video, we're going to be going through a basic configuration of the system. Hello world, this is Nick. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, in this video, we're going to be setting up Ubuntu and performing some basic configurations for the system. First off, uh, we need to install a VirtualBox component called Guest Editions, and this allows us to run the, the virtual machine more stable and with higher performance. So uh, as again in the previous videos I'm going to full screen and then once you've got this in the menu bar on the bottom you're going to select devices and insert guest editions CD image. I've already inserted that which is right here. Now, as you can see, the performance here is quite horrible. So I'm going to run this. I 
click on properties I'm going to make sure that it's executable and it is now we do have to go into the terminal or command line for a moment so this is going to be your first look at the terminal we are going to cover uh, quite a bit of the command line interface in Linux in I believe uh, the second or third module of this series it's quite big and it can do quite a bit so hit the super key and that's gonna bring up the dash you can also click this icon on the top left to bring up the dash here we have different scopes so uh, the default home scope is going to be loaded right now I'm going to switch to applications in applications we're going to see installed recently used uh, plugins so I'm going to select installed and here we can actually look at the applications that are installed in the system right now this is pretty inefficient if you're trying to launch an application and know exactly which application you want to load. So I'm going to close the dash here. Turn to the desktop. I'm going to hit the super key to bring up the dash again. And I'm just going to start typing the application name that I want to run. In this case, it's going to be terminal. And you can see at this point, once I get term written in there, the first result is terminal. That's what I want to launch. If the application you are looking for is the first in the list, you can just hit enter. And it should launch that application. Now, there are shortcuts also in Linux to launch terminal. And one of them is to just click Control, Alt, and T on your keyboard at the same time. And that's going to bring up Terminal here. Now what we need to do is open it in this specific location. So within the File Manager, I'm going to right-click and click Open in Terminal. Now here we can see this is the location that we're in. We're in uh, VBox Editions right here. So what I'm going to do is run this program here. It must be run with administrative privileges, which means need to add sudo to the beginning of this command. And the great thing about Linux is that for anything to actually modify the core of the system, uh, install applications, remove them, uh, you know, stuff like that, it requires administrative rights and it's going to force you to enter your password. Now this can get uh, frustrating sometimes and so there are ways around it and we're going to discuss that in a uh, very near future. Run files or files with .run file extensions can be run directly from the terminal by just basically typing the name of the file run. Now why I put a period and a forward slash here is to indicate to the terminal that the file that we want to run is in the current directory. So period forward slash in Linux means current directory and that would be this. This is the directory we're in. So this tells it that the file is in this directory and the run extension automatically runs it. So we don't really need to, you know, issue a whole ton of commands. It's, it's pretty simple as far as running files. Now it's adding kernel modules. So the kernel, as we discovered in video one, is called Linux. That is uh, the kernel for uh, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, Fedora, you know, every Linux distribution out there uses Linux as the kernel. So the kernel's job is to translate um, between software and hardware. And so in this instance, what we've got right now is a screen resolution is pretty terrible. I think it's 12, 
1280 by 768. So it's uh, very square, not yeah, widescreen. So what we're going to do by installing these modules, this is going to allow us to configure the screen resolution to that that the hardware actually supports. And so that's why we need to install VirtualBox guest editions in order to get better performance. It's also very laggy right now. And what we should see is that once we reboot after installing these uh, VirtualBox editions files, when we reboot, we should see a huge increase in performance, which is going to be great. Seems like this is going to take a little bit, so I'm going to pause the video and I'll be back when this successfully installs. All right, people, so it is done. So what we're going to do, as suggested on this line in the terminal right here, we may want to restart. So close this, close this, and this is painfully laggy. It's not just, you know, a bit laggy, it's pretty painful. Uh, so in the user menu here, the cog icon, we're going to go down to shut down and select restart. So as you can see, the first notable thing once restarting with guest editions installed is that the resolution is now correct. It's running at 1366 by 768 pixels, which is exactly what we wanted. I'm going to enter my password and hit enter. And now we're going to see if it's actually going to speed up and provide better performance for us. And that looks to be the case. I'm going to open the dash. It's a bit laggy, but not too painful. So that's good. Now, we're actually going to get into the customizations. So the, the dash here, or the launcher on the left-hand side, already has some items pinned to it. If you don't want something pinned, you can simply right-click, unlock from launcher. Now let's say you want to move stuff around. You can hold your left mouse button until it slightly displaces it, and then you can move it up and down and place it wherever you want to. In order to get to the configurations that we want to make, we need to download some files. So open up Firefox. And what we're going to be looking for is a theme and an icon theme. Now, what is a theme in Linux? GTK is the, is the theming engine that Unity uses, Unity being the desktop environment we're currently in. The GTK theme controls everything about how things look. And so these window controls appear this way right now. The title bar is a dark gray. The selected color is orange, which means if I select items, it's orange. If I select something over here, it's orange as well. These are all things that we can change, but in order to do that, we need some GTK themes, and we get those by going to gnome-look.org. Now, in my experience with Ubuntu 15.10 so far, where it's newer, it's using GTK version 3.18. And so older GTK themes appear to break. Uh, we may be able to see that here. Uh, this is a theme for GTK 3.16 and 18. Let's have a look at that. we can click on the images here to see larger versions of the image. And that looks like a neat uh, theme. I think I want to use that. So in order to do that, we scroll down here where we see the download links and we want to make sure it's compatible with our GTK version. So click download on the second link on this theme. Uh, you guys feel free to really explore the themes here on GNOME Look and we will uh, install them together. You guys can pause the video if you want to and find some. Oh. 
some of the links to download the themes and icons uh, link to other locations. This specific instance is DeviantArt. And so I will click the download button here. It's a 4.5 megabyte archive file. And so I'm going to open it with my archive manager. You could also save the file to your downloads directory, but I just want to open it. Now, once it's opened in the archive manager, we can see the theme file here. We're not going to select that. We're just going to click extract. And this is going to open up a file browser where we can actually choose where we want to extract it to. So I'm just going to put it in downloads and then select extract. Once it's done extracting, we can either close this message and leave the archive manager open. We can show the files and leave the archive manager open, or we can quit. I'm going to click quit for now. We're also going to need an icon theme, and there are similar issues with icons as there are to GTK themes for different versions of GTK. Some icon themes don't appear to have every uh, necessary icon, so they, they can look a little messed up. I think I like this one. So again, I'm going to check it out in a larger image here, and that does look pretty nice. That's nice and flat. So I'm going to download that here. Now icon themes typically are a lot larger than GTK themes. I've seen archives as large as, uh, you know, 300 megabytes. That's quite large. There's no download button here. So let's look and see if they have a uh, different way to install them. Here's the download link right here. It's on GitHub. I'm going to click that. And I'm also going to open that with the Archive Manager. And while that's doing its thing, we're also going to find a nice wallpaper that we want to use. So I'm going to search this. Go to images. I'm going to take this one. Once it loads the image, I'm going to right click and click Save Image As. I'm going to save it into my downloads directory. We've got about one minute remaining for the icons here, so I'm just going to minimize Firefox and we are going to install an application that we need in order to really configure the system. You could go to the system settings and this is good for some things, and I'll show you here in one moment, but there actually is a tool designed to give you even more control over your system. So this is the system settings, and here you can uh, very, very minimalistically change the appearance. And by that I mean it lets you change the wallpaper and the size of the icons on the left. That's not exactly how much customization we want to do. Uh, it also has a behavior tab. You can auto hide the launcher if you want to. We don't want to, so I'm going to turn that off. It gives you great control for mouse, uh, your power settings. You can change the screen display if your screen isn't displaying at the correct resolution. You've got sound settings uh, and you've got a lot of other things here, so explore that. If you'd like. I'm going to close that for now. Here's the icon archive that we downloaded. I'm going to extract this into my downloads directory. Now I'm going to install something called the tweak tool. This is the tool that I was referring to earlier that's going to allow us to 
really configure the system. So bring up terminal with control alt T. And once terminal comes up, we're going to run another task as an administrator. So we're going to type sudo. The program we want to use is called apt-get, which this is what you use to manage software, either install or uninstall. The action we want apt-get to do is going to be install, and then what we want it to install is called Unity Tweak Tool, and then hit enter. Put in your password. It's not going to show the letters being typed, but it is going in. I'm going to quit out of that now. While it's installing Unity Tweak Tool, there's something we need to do with files. So if we go to my home directory, and then into downloads. Here are the files that we've saved. This is the icon theme and this is the GTK theme. So these are the actual theme directories. We can see if we go in here we should see um, some other files that include an index of the theme. So these are the files we're going to copy. So we're going to select them all and hit Control C to copy them. Then hit Control T to open a new tab in the file manager. And in the new tab, we're going to go to Home. We can't see the hidden directories. So hit Control H. It's going to allow us to see all the hidden files and directories. Now, any file or directory that begins with a period is denoted as a hidden location or hidden file. We need to create one of these for themes. So right click and select new folder. Type in period themes and hit enter. Then in this themes directory, hit control V, we're going to paste the themes that we selected uh, in the other tab there and copy them over. We need to do roughly the same thing for icons. So if I go back to my other tab here, back up to downloads, and then into the icon theme directory. Okay, so it's one level up that we've got to copy. So go back to downloads Control C. Let's go back to our other tab here. Go back up to home. Now we need to create another hidden directory called icons. It's very straightforward stuff. So period icons enter. And it's lagging a bit. There we go. Let's go into this directory. And then control V to paste the previously copied files. Alright guys, that actually took a really long time. Uh, I suspect because it's running in a virtual machine, it's emulating the file system type. I really can't wait till we can install it directly to the hard disk, which is going to be not in the next video, but in the, uh, in the module after that. But we finally got the icon theme copied over into the icons directory. We have also got the Unity Tweak tool installed. So if I open up the dash and type tweak, it may not find it because we just installed it. There's an issue I've been noticing with, with Ubuntu 15.10 so far is that changes in the dash aren't made as soon as they should be. So I'm going to scroll through here and see if we can see we don't, the dash hasn't been updated. Uh, so I'm going to take this opportunity to explain to you guys a little bit about how a file system works. 
If we go to computer, that is going to go to the root directory, as I explained in the previous video. Now, slash home is right here. That's where our user directory is. Slash user is used by the system for a lot of things. Bin in this user directory contains binary files that you can run. Uh, but you wouldn't typically run them by uh, navigating to the bin directory. We're going to go back to user, and you guys feel free to do the exact same thing if you have the same problem. We're going to go into share, and the share directory in user basically is used as a place to house configuration files for the binary applications. We have an applications directory. And this directory has all of the installed applications. These are all dot desktop files. You can't see the file extension, but that's what they are. And basically, when you run one of these or from the dash, these files contain what binary files to run, from where, how, etc. Should see Unity Tweak Tool right here. There we go. So if you double click on that, it's going to launch the tweak tool, which is exactly what we want to happen. And now this is what we're going to be using to customize the system. First thing I want to do before I even do that, I want to change my desktop wallpaper. It's as simple as this. Find an image file on your file system. In this instance, it's in our downloads directory. Right click it and select set as wallpaper. Good stuff. Now I want to change some things about the launcher. Here we can also set it to auto hide, which we're not going to do. We can change the icon size, so I'm going to take it down to 38 pixels. I'm going to make it a bit more transparent. You can also change it to a custom color rather than a color based on the wallpaper. So this would be blue in this instance. If I turn transparency all the way down, we see what color actually is chosen. So I'm going to set that to about there. We can change the panel as well. Looks like it locked up a little bit. There we go. We can make the panel entirely transparent if we want. We can make it kind of transparent, or we can make it not transparent at all. This really depends on the theme we're going to be using. If we go back to overview, we're going to come down to appearance and select theme. Our theme doesn't look like it uh, works, so let's have a look. I'm going to go up to my home directory. The themes. See, ah, uh, oh, there we go. Here's the problem. So in each one of these, we need to take the directory and pull it back to themes. So in the theme dark, I'm going to pull that up to themes. It's not working. Hold on. This is very sensitive. Let me try that again. Once we see that, we should be good to drop it. There we go. Go to the other, the main theme file. Drop it right there. All right. Now, we do actually have to restart Unity Tweak Tool. Still not picking it up. Cool. So we're going to go to computer, user, share, applications, way down to the bottom, launch Unity Tweak Tool, select theme. Now we can select 
the seam that we want to use. There we go, this is actually broken, it appears. Uh, see the window, you can see a bit of fray right there. Looks like it is indeed broken. So this is one of those broken themes I was talking about. It's not too broken though, you really can't notice. And then over in icons, we're gonna select the icon theme that we also just downloaded. Which was Masala. We can go over to cursor as well. Change it to a black cursor. Let's go to window controls. This doesn't work. I've noticed this and it hasn't been fixed yet. It's going to keep the window controls up here. I'm going to come back to the panel settings because it's very transparent at this point. Oh, that looks nice. Oh, it's supposed to be entirely transparent. Set it like that, that looks all right. There we go, so we have a briefly customized version of Ubuntu. Feel free to explore a little more and do any configurations that you wanna do. In the next video, we're gonna be discussing desktop environments. So this is Unity, albeit a slightly customized version of Unity. In the next video, we're going to be installing Cinnamon and maybe a few others. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, thanks for joining me. Uh, today we're going to be installing Ubuntu alongside our Windows installation on our actual hard drive. So you're going to need a few things for this. First, you're going to need a USB disk drive. I recommend 8 gigabytes or larger. Uh, and you also need a program called UNET Bootin. So to get that program, uh, open a web browser and type in UNET Bootin dot SourceForge dot net. And when you get to this page, download the Windows version. and I'm gonna select open. Now, while this is downloading, uh, I want you to plug your USB disk drive in. And once it's in, right click on your start menu icon. Uh, this should be the same for every version of Windows since uh, Windows XP. Uh, when you right click it, you should get a menu and there should be disk management in that menu. So click on that and we're going to format our USB drive in order to be able to install the ISO image of Ubuntu on it, which we downloaded in the first video. So in the disk management screen, um, you're gonna see a lot of things. Uh, actually, you're probably only gonna see a few things because you haven't yet uh, done any formatting to your hard drive. So what you should see is a few smaller a few smaller partitions at the beginning of your hard disk, and then a very large C drive, which should be uh, NTFS. That's your Windows partition. Um, mine have already got some partitions here from previous Ubuntu installations. We're not gonna worry about the disk zero right now because that's not what we're focusing on. First, we need to find our USB stick. Uh, you can usually find it by the size of the device and right click on it and click format. And you can name it anything you like. The important thing is that the file system must be FAT32 in order to boot off of the uh, USB stick. So make sure that's selected. Uh, leave everything else, and I recommend checking this uh, perform a quick format. Otherwise, it's going to take a while. So leave that checked. Okay. Now it's going to format, and it should happen pretty quickly. And then what we're going to do is once it's done, you actually need to unplug it. So remove it from your USB port. And then put it back in. 
And what this is going to do is it's going to mount it so that UNET Booten can see it. And so we can install on there. Now I got a notification here that said it's the F drive, so it's already selected. So I don't need to do anything here. I need to select disk image because that's we're going to specify the ISO image that we're going to burn to this USB disk drive. So hit this uh, button over here and browse to the file that you want to install. So mine is in downloads Ubuntu. And this is the same ISO image we downloaded in the first video. It's the same one that we installed on, in VirtualBox, and we're going to be using it now as well. So select it and hit Open. Now, if your drive is blank because you took the disk, uh, the USB disk out and then put it back in, all you have to do is toggle this over to hard disk and then back to USB drive. It should find it. You should have a list here. Make sure you choose the appropriate one and then hit OK. Now it's going to start the burning process onto the USB disk, and this is going to take a little bit. It should take five minutes or so. I will be back when mine has successfully burned. So when it completes, you should see this screen, and it's going to prompt you to reboot now or exit. Now it's important that you do one thing before you reboot your computer. Windows has a feature called Fast Startup. And that's going to interfere with your ability uh, to access the Windows drive. So we are going to need to repartition the Windows drive, so we need access to it from Ubuntu. Now, how fast startup works is basically when you shut down your computer, normally your computer doesn't fully shut down. And so there's still things running, or, or at least a saved state. So it's like hibernation. So we need to change how that works. So what you're going to do is uh, right-click on your battery icon and click Power Options. I'm going to go to Change Plan Settings here. And then on the bottom, click Change Advanced Power Settings. And that's not where we need to go at all. Uh, sorry about that. Cancel it here. All right, here it is. So on the left-hand side, ch uh, choose what the power button does, and then change settings that are currently unavailable. And this will allow us to change the settings down here. Now this should be checked unless you've manually turned it off already. What you want to make sure is that this is unchecked. And then hit Save Changes. So feel free to either reboot now or exit and then manually restart the computer. So when your computer's turned off, you're going to turn it on, and you're going to have to press the key to enter into the BIOS boot menu. I'm working on an HP laptop here, so my key is F9. So when you hit the power key, you're going to need to repeatedly tap this key to make sure that it, you get it at the right time. It's usually a small window of opportunity there to uh, get it. So. I'm going to just tap on the F9 key, and I'll be presented with this. You should have something similar. Now, if you're on an EFI system, that's great. Make sure you choose the USB drive UEFI and hit Enter. So you're going to use your up and down key and then hit Enter when you select the correct device. And this is going to let us boot off of the uh, hard disk. So click Try Ubuntu and then just wait for it to start up. It should be relatively quick. And there we go. We're now booted into Ubuntu. So select the, uh, double click the install Ubuntu icon on the desktop. And when it opens the installer, select your language. And when you're ready, hit continue. You're going to want to connect to a Wi-Fi network unless you're connected through Ethernet. I've already connected to a network, so I'm not going to do this. Uh, but 
connect to your network so that you can download updates while installing and you can get the most fresh packages from the repositories. And hit continue. You're going to see these uh, big check marks telling us that we're all good to go. You're also going to want to check download updates while installing and also install third party software. And I've already got these checked. You want to make sure they're checked. If they're not checked, check them. You don't need to install third-party software. All this allows is for playing MP3 files and other proprietary file types. Uh, so when you're ready here, hit continue. And this next bit is going to take a little bit because it's scanning our hard drive. So when you see this screen, uh, it's going to prompt you to install Ubuntu alongside Windows. We're not going to do that. We're going to manage the partitions by ourselves manually, and that's going to give us a little bit more control. So select something else at the bottom, and then hit continue. Now it's going to scan the disk again, and you're going to see something entirely different here. All right. This is our Windows partition. We can tell by first it's formatted as NTFS and also the size of the drive. This is my free space. What you're going to want to do is right click on the NTFS file system. Hold on a second. I just got to remove this two finger scroll. There we go. Much better. This is the EFI partition. We're going to focus on the Windows partition right now. You're going to need to shrink this and in order to get the free space. So click on this and click Change down at the bottom. And you're going to just reduce the size of this. Uh, Windows does take up quite a bit of space and uh, the applications on it. So I recommend leaving this relatively high. Uh, I've got about 500 gigabytes that I use for my Windows partition, and I find that's comfortable. So once you've uh, done this, hit OK, and you're going to see the disk rescan, and it's going to show you that you've now got free space after your Windows partition. So we now need to set up a few partitions. So click the free space and the plus sign. And the first partition we're going to be creating is a swap area, which acts sort of like RAM, but on the hard disk. So in the size of the swap area, you're going to want to make it about double the amount of RAM that you've got. And when it refreshes here, we've, we see our swap area we just created with the free space after it. So now we're good to create our main partition for the installation of Ubuntu. So make sure you use X4 journaling file system and set the mount point to a forward slash and hit OK. And basically the forward slash just means the entire operating system, uh, the home directories, applications, the configurations, they're all going to be installed to this partition. Now, Linux gives us a little bit more flexibility that we're not going to really go in depth with right now, but you are able to create two different uh, partitions, one for the forward slash, the main partition, and then you can also create another one, set uh, the mount point to forward slash home, and that's going to mean that all your user directories are stored on that partition, and this makes sense for upgrading and installing different versions of Linux because the home directory will always stay intact. You won't need to format it every time you install uh, Linux and you can install Linux over the root partition. So now that we're set up here, we're basically good to go. The device for the bootloader is important. If you're not running an EFI system, you need to leave this to dev slash SDA. And what that means is that the bootloader is going to be written to the very first sectors of the hard disk, which is where non-EFI hard drives store their bootloaders with Windows. So it will replace the Windows partition. Uh, or the Windows bootloader and replace it with Grub, 
which is the Linux bootloader, but it will also give you an option through that installation of the bootloader to boot into Windows. Every time you boot up your computer, you're going to see boot into Linux or boot into Windows. All right. Now, I'm working with an EFI hard disk, and hopefully you are too. Every computer released in the last few years are now EFI. And EFI is great. It's a way where you can man you can better manage dual and tri booting different installations uh, or operating systems on your hard disk. And what this does is, uh, if you've got an EFI partition, as you can notice, mine selected in the area above is SDA2, but the type is EFI, and system says Windows Boot Manager. All right. Where we're using an EFI disk, we are going to install the EFI files for the bootloader on the existing EFI partition, which is SDA2. So when we're already here, you can now click install now. It's going to tell you that it's going to make these changes and they're going to be permanent and you may lose data if you've done something wrong. So please make sure you do this all correctly. It will leave your Windows partition intact because you're not formatting it, you're just shrinking it, and you're creating a couple new partitions. So when you review these changes, hit continue, and it's going to install the operating system now to our hard disk. And the installation procedure is exactly the same as it was in VirtualBox. So you're going to choose your location or your time zone first. So here we're going to select our keyboard layout. I am English US keyboard layout. So I'm just going to leave it and hit continue. Uh, and here we're going to create our user account. So I'm going to name my computer Voltron and username and password. And you do have a few options also to log in automatically or require your password. You can set this however you want. Uh, I like to require my password to log in. So just hit continue, and now you're presented with this beautiful slideshow of everything Ubuntu can do. Not everything, but a few things. Um, and we're going to dive into more of these things in the future. But for right now, I'm going to pause this recording, and I'll be back after it installs, because it does take about 10 to 15 minutes. So when it's done, you should see a prompt like this, and it should tell you that the installation has been a success, and you're now free to either continue testing on the USB drive or restart now. Um, you can do whatever you'd like. Just if you're going to continue testing, uh, the way you reboot is in the top right-hand corner. Select the gear icon and then select shutdown. Hey guys, thanks for joining me. In this video, we're finally going to get to the command line, and I'm really excited about that because this is probably the key aspect to Linux that you're going to need to learn. It's great to have a bit of background knowledge and uh, how to install the system, but those are the, the uh, very small and insignificant in comparison to how much you'll be working with the command line. So. To open up the command line, we use a program called Terminal, and you can access this in the Applications menu by typing Terminal, um, or you can hit Control, Alt, and T on your keyboard, uh, and it will launch Terminal. So here is Terminal, and we're going to talk about uh, just a few commands today. The first one is going to be PWD, and what PWD does is it prints working directory. So if I type it here, uh, it's going to list the current directory that I'm in, which is slash home slash nick. This is my user directory. This is the default location that you'll be in. The second command that we need to talk about is CD or change directory. So this allows us to uh, basically change which working directory we're in. Now, I can type 
user share, for instance. That's going to take me to the user share directory. And I'm going to show you guys here in the file manager what this looks like. If I click computer here, it's going to take me to the root, signified by a forward slash. So when you're changing directory, if the first character after CD is a forward slash, that means it's going to be an absolute path from the beginning of the hard disk or from the root directory. So here I could change directory into sbin or I could cd into home again. And in home we've got a directory called nick. So how to change directory with a relative path is you you just omit the forward slash and this will basically tell it to change directory uh, from whatever directory I'm in to the next level which is Nick and I end up here so again you can change directory into an absolute path by setting the forward slash to the first character and we can see this is where I'm in and then you can change directory with a relative path by not putting the forward slash. Now additionally, uh, another symbol in Linux is a period and a forward slash. And what th these two character combinations mean is in the current directory. So if I remove lib here, if I just change directory into the current directory that I'm in, I will stay in the same directory. Now I can type cd lib with the period and forward slash and that's going to send me into the current directory's next level directory called lib. So I'm going to cd back into home slash nick. Now I could type it out like this uh, and this is about 10 characters but let's say I was really lazy you can use the tilde. And that's basically, that's the key to the left of the number one key on the top of your keyboard. You need to hold shift and press that. It's, it's the key directly under the escape key. This is a tilde, and this basically means home. So it's going to take you to your home directory, which is unique for each user. For instance, my home directory, as we can see up here at the top, is forward slash home, forward slash nick, because this is my username. So we can use this a bit and put a different spin on it. Let's say I'm in user slash share slash applications. Where I am right now is in this directory. We can type pwd to see the directory that we're in. If I want to go directly to home slash nick, I can type cd tilde. But if I want to go to home slash nick slash documents, I can still use the tilde followed by a forward slash followed by documents. And this is going to put me into home slash nick slash documents. Now this is all fun, but what's the point of navigating a file system if you really can't do anything? And so that's our next command that we're going to learn. Um, so I'm going to change directory to home, to my home directory. Let's say you want to go up a level. So remember how changing directory with period forward slash means current directory. If you put two periods and a forward slash, that means one level up. So the parent directory. So right now I'm in home slash Nick. If I type CD period period forward slash and hit enter, it's going to put me into the home directory. I can type PWD and see that I'm in home. So again, cd tilde is going to move you to your home directory 
period forward slash means current directory. So you can type a relative path from that. Forward slash means the root of the directory, and this means that you're going to be giving the cd command a very absolute path. So I can type forward slash user share, as this is a file path directly from the uh, root of the hard disk. And period, period, forward slash means go up one level. So I'm going to change directory into my home directory. And now the next command we're going to use is ls. And what that does is it lists the contents of whatever directory you're in. So here is my home directory. Here's what it looks like in the files and folders in it. If I type pwd to make sure I'm in my home directory, I can type ls, and that's going to list all of the contents of this directory in alphabetical order. Now, ls is a big command. And there's many options that you can throw into it, but we're going to focus on a few. File permissions in Linux are very important. They define who can do what to what file. So for instance, um, the a.out file that you see there is a binary file from a C++ program that I wrote. That belongs to me. That means I can run it. How do we know that belongs to me? We can use the ls command separated by a space, a dash, and the letter L. Now the dash L argument that we're passing it means that we're going to list it in a long way. So we're going to get some more information. The left column is the permissions of a file. Uh, so owner, user, group. We're not going to get into permissions uh, right now, but ls-l does list them. It lists the owner's user account and also the corresponding group. So when you create a, a user in Linux, it also creates a group, at least during the main installation, uh, and the group's name is the same as the username. And it also shows the date modified and stuff. Now, what if we actually wanted to list a directory based on uh, some other things? So if we wanted to list it in reverse order, let's say, we can type ls-r. And it's going to list it in reverse alphabetical order. If we want to uh, define file types when we list, we can type ls-p. And we see that a directory uh, is followed by the forward slash. Now, also there are color codings, so we can tell that uh, that uh, directories are blue, and other files are generally white. But the a dot out is a binary file, and so it's green. We can also sort based on file size. And now, what we've been doing so far is listing contents of the current directory we're in. Now, that's cool because if I wanted to see every file that was in um, applications directory, I would change directory to user share applications. And once there, I would type ls. And this is going to show me all of the files and, uh, and directories within this path. Now, this works, but let's say I didn't want to leave my home directory to list the applications directory. You can actually pass an argument after ls of the path that you want to list, and it will do it. Now, here's a bonus command for, for the terminal. It's clear. 
And what that does is it makes terminal a little less cluttered. So again, if I wanted to list files in home slash documents, I can do that. Let's say I wanted to list them in reverse order. I can do that. So now you see that you can start stringing commands together, uh, or at least the ls command. And if you're ever really lazy and you don't want to type the entire ls, you can just type l. So thanks for watching this video with me. Um, we're going to recap here. We type cd to change into a directory. We type pwd to print the current directory that we're in. And we type ls to list all the contents of that directory. And there's a lot of options for ls. I've shown you a few. If you want uh, more information, you can actually type ls dash dash help. And this is going to provide you with uh, all of the options that you can run with the command, uh, as well as an explanation of what they do. So thanks for watching this video. Uh, in the next video, we're going to be going through some more command line stuff. We're going to be doing command line for a little bit. Hey guys, thanks for joining me again. And in this video, we're going to be talking about administrator privileges in the terminal. So I mentioned briefly in the previous video about file permissions. And we really didn't jump in. And so I've created a file in a location that I don't have access to. The file I've created is um, it's a etc, it's in the etc directory, and it's just called file. So if I change directory into etc and then type L, we can scroll here. It's alphabetical, and so we can see file right here. That's the file I created. Let's say I want to edit it. And we're going to be going into nano a lot in the future. But right now, um, I'm going to be using nano. And uh, in order to edit this file, it's a terminal application for text editing. So I'm going to type nano and then in the current directory, open file. And this is going to open this file that I've written, which is great. I can view it. But what happens when I try to write to it I'm going to hit Control O, which is uh, the command to save this file, and I'm going to type Enter. And it's going to give me an error warning that I don't have permission to do this. And so if I type, if I uh, click Control X, it's going to ask me if I want to save changes, so I'm going to say no because I can't. Well, then how do we edit that file that I've just created? We need to use administrative privileges in order to be able to edit that file. Now, there's two ways to do this. The first one is to type sudo before the command. And what this means is super user do. It's uh, an abbreviation. Uh, super user is a term in Linux that identifies um, your privilege level. So super user do allows you to make uh, changes to files and perform administrative tasks for this one command. So if I type sudo nano file, that will let me edit the file. So now I can type test 343, hit control O, and then enter, and we see a success message, wrote two lines. So I can now exit this and it has been saved. Now, what if I don't want to retype the entire command? So if I type nano file, try to write to it, it will fail because permissions denied. I'm not, I haven't run this specific command as sudo. So I'm going to exit 
Uh, what you actually need to do is type sudo and two exclamation marks. So the two exclamation marks basically mean run the previous command. So by prepending that with the term sudo, it will rerun the previous command as sudo. What if you don't want to, what if you have a lot of things to do and you don't want to write sudo before every single command? So now, what if you have a lot of things to do and you don't want to type sudo in front of every single command? You could actually do this, and that's the su command. And what this means is switch user. So generally, you type switch user, or su, I mean, uh, followed by the name of the user account you want to switch to. What we're going to do is type sudo su. And this is going to change us to the root account. And as you can see, the name prepending the computer's name, so this is the computer name, and this is the name of the current user I'm acting as, which is root. And the root user has 100% control of everything. So now I can type nano file and add a new line. Control O and Control X to close it. Now, when I want to switch back over to my user account, I'll type su space nick. And that's going to get me back into my user account. So basically, if you get a permission error running a command, you might need to run that command as sudo. For instance, if you're editing files in uh, any directory other than your home directory, you're not going to have permission to those files. And we'll go over in the future how to get permission to files. But for right now, for all intents and purposes, these instances is when you would run your command prepended with sudo. If you have a lot of these commands to run and you don't want to type sudo before every command, just type sudo space su. So thank you guys for watching this video. Uh, we're going to be continuing command line in the next video as well. And again, we're going to be doing it for quite a while, so I hope you guys are enjoying this. Hey guys, thanks for joining me again. In this video, we're going to be going over the package manager of Ubuntu, or how to manage the packages that you have installed or that you want to install. So how we do this is through a program called apt-get. So in terminal, if you type apt-get, that is the program that we are going to use to install applications. If you follow this with the term install, this is the action that we want apt-get to perform. And then the file that we want this action performed on is, for this video, going to be Bluefish, which is a text editor that I don't want installed, but for the purpose of this video, I'm going to install it. Now, if you hit enter, you're going to notice it's going to tell you that you do not have permission to use that program. So again, this is where sudo comes into play. So sudo, bang, bang, hit enter. Then it's going to um, show us that, well, for me, for this system, it says these weren't automatically installed and we don't need them. Uh, down here, we see the following extra packages will be installed, and it's going to install Bluefish Data and Bluefish Plugins, which are two different packages that Bluefish needs. And it will also tell us how much will be downloaded and how much space will be used on the disk after the application is installed. So we're going to type Y for yes and hit enter. Now it's going to connect to the repositories of Ubuntu. So while it does that, I'm going to explain what that means. So Ubuntu has repositories set up that have indexes and package files, and it has indexes of those package files. So this allows us to run the command apt-get and install packages from the repositories. Now there are some programs that aren't in the repositories and we'll go over those in a moment. 
for the sake of this specific action, Bluefish is in the repositories, and I knew the name of the package that I wanted to install before I ran the command. So I could just type sudo apt-get install Bluefish, and this installs Bluefish to my computer. And when this completes, I can now hit the super key and type in Bluefish. And it hasn't found it yet. I forgot there is a bug with uh, this version of Ubuntu where the dash isn't always updated. If I type in Bluefish from the terminal, we can see that I've got Bluefish installed. So that's how you install programs. Now, let's say we want to remove a program. We do that in a very similar way. I'm going to type sudo apt-get remove bluefish. So, with this command, uh, we're using the program apt-get. The action we're performing is remove and the action is per, the package that that action is performed on is bluefish. I'm going to type Y for yes. I do want to uninstall this. And it's going to uninstall the package. What if we want to uh, install a program and we're not sure of the exact name of it? So let's say we want to search through the repository and uh, we're looking for something specific. What we'll do is type apt-cache search and then the program we want followed by an asterisk. And this means it's going to find anything that has the word bluefish in it. I can type apt cache search GIMP and it's returning a lot of stuff. Now we can find it in here um, GIMP. Uh, let's say we want to see if we've got something installed. We're going to use apt cache again. We're going to type policy as the action and then GIMP. We see that this is the version we have installed, 2.8.14, and the official repositories contain this version, 2.8.14 which means you can see here we've installed GIMP through the repositories. Now additionally you could go to GIMP's website, I believe it's GIMP.org, and you could download an installer file from there. So if you're on an older version of Ubuntu that doesn't have version 2.8 of GIMP in the repositories, you can actually manually install that package file. Uh, and we're going to go over that in a moment. So if I type apt-cache policy bluefish, which I've just removed, we'll see that we have none installed, but we can install version 2.2 from the official repositories. What if we want to install a package that is not in the repositories? So if I type apt cache search chrome, I'll see a lot of chrome. but I'm not seeing a package called Chrome. I see Chromium Browser. That's the open source version of Chrome. And we can install that by typing sudo apt get install Chromium Browser. But let's say I want the actual Google Chrome. It's not under Chrome. And it's not under Google Chrome either. We're gonna see that it wasn't able to access that package. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up Firefox because that's the browser you're going to have pre-installed on Ubuntu. Uh, you are going to have Firefox. It doesn't come with another browser pre-installed. However, you can install other web browsers. Now, if I wanted to install Midori, which is a web browser, I can check. 
Uh, is there a version that I can install through the repositories? And there is. I don't want to use Midori though, I want to use Chrome. So what we're going to do is go to chrome.google.com and when the page loads it's going to allow us to download Chrome. So I'm going to go to download for personal computers and this is automatically picked up that we're on Linux. So if you click download Chrome, it's going to give you four options. A 32-bit .deb file, a 64-bit .deb file, and then also 32 and 64-bit RPM files. On Linux, you're not going to be using RPM files. That is the package manager for Red Hat and so it, that's a different Linux version altogether uh, with Debian Ubuntu distributions. And in the first or second video, I explained how Ubuntu was forked from Debian. So Ubuntu uses the same package manager as Debian, which is .deb files or apt package manager. So apt package manager works with .deb files. So we're going to download the 64-bit deb file because we're working on a 64-bit system and a 64-bit installation. We're going to type, we're going to click that uh, accept button and I'm going to save the file. Now once the download completes, we can change directory into our home downloads directory. We can use the ls command to see this file. And so how we're going to install it, I mean you could open up the file manager, come into uh, the downloads folder and double click this and it's going to open it up with software center which is Ubuntu's graphical package manager app. But we're not going to do that because we're focusing on command line. So how you install it from command line is by running the following command. So we're going to go sudo dpkg dash i for install and then we're going to give it the file path. Now we could go absolute and type home nick uh, you know downloads. We're not going to do that because that gets really old and boring really quick. We're going to type in the current directory look for Google dash Chrome dash stable underscore current underscore AMD64 dot deb and hit enter. And it's going to unpack this uh, Debian package and it's going to install Chrome. And again, uh, it's not going to pick up the application there, but we can type Chrome, I believe. No? What about Google Chrome? There we go. And then we can launch Chrome because it is installed. Now, what we, uh, what we can do with the uh, package manager. It doesn't only allow us to install and remove programs, it allows us to keep things updated. So let's say that a new package version of one of our applications has been pushed to the repositories. We can actually type sudo apt-get upgrade. And this is going to upgrade any packages that have new versions in the repositories and we have older versions than that on our system. So we're going to hit enter. And uh, a little note on sudo is that when you run it once, um, I believe in that session in the terminal, you don't have to put your password in every time, just the first time. So here we see that uh, we have 16 kilobytes of upgrades to do. So let's go look at that. So it looks like uh, my KDE installation is upgradable. Good stuff. So we're going to type Y and hit enter. Now it's going to upgrade these existing packages.
So we covered a lot in this video. I want to just take uh, a couple minutes here at the end of the video and go over what we learned. So basically the package manager of Ubuntu and Debian and Debian based distributions is aptitude. And we use that through a program called apt-get. Now, when we use apt-get, we can give it specific actions to carry out, like, um, like installing programs and removing them. We can also add repositories, which we're going to go over in the future. But we can add repositories that aren't the official Ubuntu repositories, and that will give us access to more applications. We can use the apt cache program to search through uh, available applications and to check the installed versions against you know um, uh, new versions in the repositories. And we can see programs that we've already got installed by using the policy action in the apt cache program. And we can also use dpkg application to install local .deb files. So that lets us install packages that aren't in the official Ubuntu repositories and aren't in other repositories as well. So we can manually download files, um, make sure the architecture is for your hardware, Make sure if you're on a 64-bit system that you're installing 64-bit applications. And also, we don't use RPM. So RPM installer files are for Fedora and Red Hat and Red Hat variants. So typically with Ubuntu, I mean always with Ubuntu, we're going to use .deb files, or we're going to use the apt-get and apt-cache programs to manage uh, our software. And then the final piece is upgrading the software. So periodically, uh, different package maintainers or developers will release new versions of their software into repositories, whether that is the official Ubuntu repositories or if it's third-party repositories that they manage specifically for their application that you have added to your system. And so using sudo apt-get upgrade allows us to upgrade packages that are available for upgrade. So thanks for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to be going over more command line. Hey guys, thanks for joining me again. Today in this video, we are going to be going over more command line stuff. And it's file permissions and file ownership. So the first thing we need to do in order to discuss this is to have a file that we currently don't have any permissions to. And the easiest way to do that is to type sudo nano file. What this is going to do is as an administrator or as the root user, it's going to use nano to produce a file named file. I'm going to put .txt there so we can keep track of it. And I'm going to type read and control O to save, hit enter and control X. Now if I type ls-l, we see here that file.txt is owned by the user root and that user's group root. Now What we've got here are permissions. And the way these columns work is this is for the owner. The owner can read and write. Groups can only read. And public can only read. So if I want to make myself able to read and write, I've got to change this third column to match that column. And I've actually got to first share it with the group, Nick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a second command here called sudo chown. And this means change ownership of a file. 
And then how we write this is we type the user colon group. So user corresponds to what we're setting this column to. Group corresponds to what we're setting this column to. So I'm going to leave it as root for the, for the user that owns it and share it with the group Nick and then the file that we want to perform this action on. Now if I type lsl, we should see here that file.txt now is uh, under ownership of the NIC group. So we need to change this um, third column to right. So how we do that is use chmod, and we're going to use that as sudo to change the permissions of the file. Now, six means it is readable and writable. Four means it is readable. And seven means it's a directory. We don't use that typically uh, with single files. And we'll go over that more in a moment. So we're going to set, uh, I mean, if I typed out the permissions in numeric values that it currently has, it would look like that. So we can see that four corresponds to read access, six corresponds to read write access. So what we want to do to change the third column here is we're going to type uh, sudo chmod 646 and then the file that we want to perform this action on. Now if I type ls-l we can see that change has been made. So I can now use nano on file.txt and I should be able to write to it and I can't. That's because the columns, uh, I changed the wrong column, we needed to change the second column. So I'm going to type sudo chmod um, 664 on file.txt. What this has done, the first two columns are now read write read write and the third column is just read. So now I can write to that file. So that's neat, but let's say I want to own that file. Let's say that file was created um, under administrative privileges, but I want to own it forever. So I'm going to type sudo chown nick nick and the file that I want to perform that on is that. Let's say I want to switch the permissions back to 644. Uh, I will retain ownership so I'll be able to write to it as the first column has rewrite access for nick and that's me. So I no longer need this group column there as well. So what I'm going to type is sudo chmod 644 file.txt. If I run ls again, I can see that the permissions have been changed back so that only the owner of the file can write to it. Cool. Now I'm going to delete that file because I don't need it. So to delete a single file, all you'll do is type rm and then the file name. And if I list again, we do not have a file.txt. Let's create a directory. Uh, and I'm going to create it as administrator. So sudo mkdir, which means make directory, and I'm going to name it my dir. And we can see here that my directory has been created. And we can see the permissions on this. Uh, it's owned by root root. Now, what this means is it's readable, writable, and executable. This means that anybody else can read and execute it. So I can change directory into my dir. This is executing it. So I've just allowed myself to execute that, and uh, that allows me to go into it. 
Now, let's say I wanted to go back up a directory and use this. Uh, let's create a file actually in that directory. So I'm going to type sudo nano file.txt. Actually, I got to put that in my dir. And the way we do that, again, we specify in the current directory, find my dir and create it in there and hit enter. Now, if I ls my dir, I see that I have a file in there. If I type ls dash l, I can see that the file in there is also owned by the root. Let's make another file. So I'm going to run the previous command. And in, in terminal, you can hit the up key and you can keep hitting it and it's going to go up, up, up uh, from previous commands that you've uh, entered. So I see there's two files in that directory that I want to own. As we can see right now, both files are owned by root because I've created them using the super user account. Now, what we're going to do here is uh, a form of the change ownership binary file or command. And how we're going to do that is type sudo chown and we're going to pass it this argument dash capital R, which means it's recursive. Every file in this directory is going to become under the ownership of Nick. So to give a little bit about this command that we're running, um, because it might look confusing, because there are multiple parts to it, we're running it as sudo because we currently don't have uh, permissions to this directory because it's owned in uh, uh, by the root user and group, and we have no write access, so we can't change it. So we're running this command as sudo. chown stands for change ownership. That's the program that we're running. We're passing it this argument, dash capital R, to make the command recursive. If I didn't have this in this command, If it looked like this, this would change the ownership of the directory to Nick, Nick, but not the files in it. So capital R is, uh, as an argument there, and then the user and the group that we want to assign ownership to, and then the file or directory that we are going to perform that action on. So when I hit enter, and then type lsl, we see now that I've got ownership of this directory. And if I type ls-l on my directory, we can see I've also got ownership on all of the files within that directory. So to recap, we use ch uh, chown to change ownership of a file. We use chmod to change the permissions of the file. Both of these can be recursive by adding dash r to the command. Um, then we define the specifics of the change we're making. So with chmod, it's going to be 755 or 757 or 777. This is just a bad idea if you're running a server. Never make any directories ownership 777. Uh, files are one digit less, so 666 would be full uh, uh, modification ability for anybody uh, on a file. We would never do that. Uh, 664 means the owner of the file and the group of the file have read write access um, and the public has read access and 644 means owner has read write group has read and public has read now if we're using the ch own command it's going to be in the format user group and this is going to change the ownership of whatever file we give it 
to that. And then the last part of each of these two commands is the file or directory that we want to have this effect on. So if I type user share, this is going to give my user all, uh, all the files in this directory are going to become under the ownership of my user and my group. Uh, be careful when you run that because some files need to be owned by root in order to work. Typically, you're not going to be working too much outside of your home directory, but we're going to get there. There are some files you're going to need to change, uh, especially when we set up Apache as the web server and whatnot. So thanks for watching this video. I hope it's been informative. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Let's create some new files. So to create a new file, I'm going to change directory into myder, just because it's going to be quicker to write commands. And touch is going to create files. So, so if you just want to create a file, without open, like in the previous, in one of the previous videos I showed you how to type uh, nano and then the name of the file and if the file didn't exist it would open it and create a new one. Uh, but if you just want to stay in terminal and don't want to go into a text editor, you just want to create files, you'd use touch followed by the file name. So touch and we're going to create main.cpp. So in the previous command, uh, let me clear this there. So in the previous command we learned how to use the asterisk. So if I were to remove this, this would remove everything that has the CPP extension. Let's say I actually wanted to remove everything but leave the directory intact. We would type this. So let's uh, get out of this directory and I'll show you how it looks from the outside. So if I wanted to remove everything but my dir, but leave my dir existing, it, it would be written like this. And if I run that and then run ls on my dir, we see it is empty. It doesn't have anything in it. So now we can remove my dir. Oh, right, sorry. Uh, rm-rf minder. So you need to use the dash rf to remove a directory. And there we're back exactly where we started. So to recap on a few commands here, and I'm just going to type them out. cp is copy. The first argument takes is the file. And the second argument it takes is where you're putting it in what file name. So that's how to copy files. How to remove files, you just type rm and then the file name. Now let's say this is in a directory. You can still remove it, you just uh, type the, the, the position of the file. Then if you want to remove all file.anythings, you do this. If you want to remove all text files, you do this. If you want to remove every file from a directory, you just do this. It's going to remove everything from that directory and leave the directory. If you want to remove the directory as well as everything in it, you would run this command. And this is uh, remove rf and then the directory name. Now, if you want to move a file, it's just like copy, except uh, it doesn't leave a copy where it started. Uh, so, you know, file, name, and then where you're copying it to. Let's say you just want to copy it to the same directory with a different name. You would do this. And we also learned the touch command. So, this you can create files and stay in terminal. So that's that's a neat command. Uh, so thanks for watching. Um, what I want you guys to do before you watch the next video, I want you guys to get used to moving around in terminal. 
So use the commands that we've learned up to this point, excluding the package commands. Uh, just use ls and cd and like uh, move around the file system and go explore a bit. Uh, don't change permissions on any files you're not aware of, and don't change the ownership of them. So really, I'd recommend staying in the home directory at this point. Just create some directories and move around in them, uh, create files, move files, copy files, and uh, get used to using Terminal in this way. Uh, it's going to make future videos a lot easier because I'm not going to go uh, as slowly on them, and so I want you guys to be able to follow. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me again. In this video we're going to be covering a few more utility commands and then we're going to move on to more advanced stuff. So we already know how to use the following commands. Uh, and also switch user. Uh, these are utility commands. I'm not going to I'm not going to throw the repository commands and package uh, installation commands in here. These are the utility commands that we can currently use, and this gives us the ability to move around the file system in the terminal, to print things out, to uh, modify some things in terms of file permissions, but we, we, we have a few more things to do. So, let's start by listing this directory's contents. Uh, so let's look at uh, the a.out file. Let's say I want to move that. Uh, I just want to move it somewhere. So how we do that is we will first create a folder. Um, and so this is the first command we're going to learn here. It's mkdir. And w this is an abbreviation for make directory. Uh, it's going to be followed by the directory that we want to create. So again, we can uh, use an absolute position if I wanted to put it user, bin, and then my directory. This would create an absolutely positioned directory. Uh, we can go one level up or two levels up and then create the directory. Or we can just say in the current directory, create new directory. Then if I run ls again, we can see new directory right here. So let's move a dot out into new directory. So to do this, you're going to type mv, and this is an abbreviation for move, a dot out space new directory slash a dot out. And what this is going to do is it's going to take this file, which is found in the current directory, move it into new directory slash the same name. And we do need to provide the name. And then hit enter. Now if we run ls again, we see that a.out is no longer in the home directory. But if we run ls on the new directory, we can see it's in there. So that's how to move uh, files. Now let's say we want to uh, copy it somewhere else. So I have a directory that I created in a previous video called my dir. Uh, let's rename that. So to rename it, you use the mv command. Then if I run ls again, we're going to see we no longer have a my dir, but we have a my second directory. So let's copy uh, the a.out file from new directory into my second directory. And how we do this is with a command called cp, which is an abbreviation for copy. And the first uh, argument we're going to give it is what file we want to work with. And then the second argument is going to be where we want to copy it to. So uh, new directory slash a dot out. And then my second directory a dot out. And hit enter. Now if we run ls on my second 
directory, we get this. We've got file and file2 from the previous videos, but now we've also got a.out. And if we uh, list the new directory, we also have a.out. So now we've got two copies of that file, which is awesome. Now let's say you want to copy a file while renaming it. This is possible. So let's run copy uh, new directory a.out and we're going to copy it to new directory b.out and hit enter. Now if we run ls on new directory we see we now have two files. And the same thing for the move command. So if you want to move a file and rename it while you, uh, wh when you move it, you have that ability. So as you'll notice in the, the move command, uh, we do need to give it the file name as well. So essentially you are naming it. So to rename it, you would just name it something different. Well, cool. Now we've got, uh, we've got three copies of the exact same file. And I'm going to move it back to my home directory, and then we're going to remove some things. So, uh, let's copy from new directory a.out back into current directory a.out. And the current directory, as we can see here, is our home directory. So, so we're running relative commands in here and uh, they're being run from the home directory. So if I hit enter here and run ls, we can see my a.out file is back where it started. So let's remove a single file and we're going to do that. Uh, let's change into new directory. We're going to remove the b.out file. So rm is uh, an abbreviation of remove and then we're going to give it our file name that we want to remove. Now be very careful when removing files it doesn't prompt you. If you accidentally add a forward slash to the beginning uh, it's I mean you won't have permission you'd have to run it as sudo so I guess it's not that big of a deal. Hit enter. Now ls and we can see the b.l file has been removed. Let's go back up a directory. So let's say we want to remove an entire directory. So we created new directory in this video. Let's remove it. How to do that is uh, using the remove command, but you've got to add dash rf and then the directory. If we run ls again, we see we no longer have a new directory. Interesting. Let's list my second directory there. So that's what we're going to work with. Um, we're going to rename this directory back to my dir just because it's uh, quicker to type out. All right, so we've renamed that directory here. So now what we're going to do is remove, uh, let's remove all the text files from this directory. So we've got two of those. Uh, so we want our a.out file to remain. And how we do this is uh, it's going to be using an asterisk in the command, and that means everything. And you'll see how this works in a moment. So type rm my dir slash anything.txt. And what this will do is it, re it will remove every text file from this directory. Now let's say we had uh, a bunch of files. Let's say main.cpp, main.txt, main. etc. What we would be able to do at that point is type main.star. And so the star means anything, right? So this is going to be main.anything gets removed. But for right now, we're working with two txt files. So star.txt and hit enter. And now run ls on my directory again. And we see that it has removed everything. 
with the TXT extension. Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be discussing the find command and some practical uses for that command. So first off, uh, I've got a directory here uh, named LT. So I'm going to remove everything from that directory. And then I'm going to change directory into there. We've got nothing. So uh, to demonstrate how we're going to use the find command, I'm just going to take a moment here and create a bunch of uh, files with very uncreative names. So I'm going to use touch to do this. And uh, I'm also going to create some text files in here as well. There we go. So if I run ls on this directory, we see I've got like uh, 10, 11 files. And that's not a lot. Um, there are going to be some times that you're going to be working in really large directories. And so you can use the find command to help um, navigate within those directories but for right now we've got uh, basically some files uh, that we can use this find command on so as you can see I've got uh, file types uh, of two different extensions uh, PHP and TXT and you can see that some of the extensions are printed in lowercase some are in uppercase and some are in a combination of the two and this is going to help you understand the different things that the find command can do. So let's say first that I'm just looking for all PHP files. So I'm going to type uh, this. So first we've got the command, which is find. The next parameter is going to be the directory that you're going to be looking in. So we're going to put one single dot because we're going to be searching in this uh, current directory. Uh, the next argument is going to be a flag, um, which is going to be type. And that's going to be followed by an F for file. And then uh, a flag called name. And this is going to be the name of the file we're looking for. So if we just put .php, this isn't going to bring anything because there's no file with that exact name. Uh, so what we need to do is add the wildcard asterisk character. And we hit enter. And it's going to return all. Uh, all files with this exact extension and this is case sensitive so as you'll notice it's only returned files uh, with the lowercase PHP extension uh, which can be useful but let's say that I want to find uh, all PHP files regardless of the case uh, this is essentially the same command so you're going to type find dot type is file and instead of using name you're going to use I name and the I basically just means that it's going to ignore case sensitivity. So if I run this command again, you're now going to see that I'm getting all PHP file extensions, uh, lowercase, uppercase, and a uh, mixed combination of the two cases. So that's pretty neat. Um, we can also do it for uh, different uh, file names, not just extensions. So if I were to run find in the current directory, type F and let's use I name and I'm going to uh, I've got a few files with the word file in them so I'm going to type file and then an asterisk and it's going to return all the different files that I've got so you can use this in a more practical application uh, and this is just an example but let's uh, go find in ETC Type is going to be F, and I name is going to be uh, asterisk.conf. And this is going to find all configuration files, and it is a recursive function. And so you'll notice that uh, there's a directory here, systemd, inside of etc., that has configuration files in it. And so it spits out all configuration files. So this is useful if you're looking for all files of a certain type, but also Here's an interesting thing. I'm just going to clear this out here. So now let's use the find command to find uh, files that that uh, have a certain permission set. And so how we're going to type this command is 
Uh, first, I'm going to type uh, lsl, and we're going to see that all the files in this directory uh, are read, write, read, write, read. And this permission scheme translates to the numerical value of 664. So what we're going to do is type find dot for the current directory, um, type, and so type can take, you don't even need to include this, so if you uh, omit the type flag, uh, it's just going to find files or directories. Uh, if you type dash type F, it's only going to find files, and if you replace the F with a D, it's only going to find directories. Uh, we're only working with files anyway, so I'm going to throw this in there. Uh, and then we're going to use uh, the perm argument, and we're going to 0, 664 because those are the permissions on this file and what it's going to do is it's going to spit back the output which in our case is all of these files. Uh, you can also search based on file size so again uh, we're going to type find with a period for the current directory and we're going to type size and here you can put uh, for instance uh, anything over a hundred kilobytes uh, you can, if you're looking for an exact file size, you can use that, or maybe one megabyte, anything over one megabyte. And so you can see how this command would be useful. Uh, it wouldn't be useful in our case right here because we've got, you know, small files. Uh, maybe if we type find. I'm not sure if this can do this, but anything under a megabyte? Cool. So you can search uh, more than or less than, and then your search parameter. Let's clear this again. You can also use a not operator. So let's say, and this is good because you can get so far using, um, using the find command. Let's say I wanted to find all files that have an iname of dot php which is not case sensitive so it's going to find all of the php files regardless of the case uh, that, that was used in the extension uh, but let's say i want to find all files that are not php let's say i've got a bunch of image files and uh, text files and other you know javascript files let's say and i just wanted to find everything that's not php what i would do is type find in the current directory Type is going to be files again, not, and then the argument I name asterisk.php. And this is going to spit back all the uh, files that don't fit that criteria. And so this is a really useful command. I hope I've explained it uh, well. And there's also one more thing that I want to show you guys. Uh, so to, for this, I'm going to clear out of here and I'm going to change directory into the etc directory and first I'm going to run this command uh, find in the current directory type is going to be file and let's say I name whoa I name is going to be star.conf and so the etc directory uh, we discussed very briefly in one of the previous videos uh, that basically it holds configuration files for uh, applications and so uh, the standard uh, at least what I've noticed with Linux is that configuration files usually have a .conf uh, extension so if we hit enter here we're gonna see that we get a lot of things and that's partly because uh, it's as you can see here in etc slash fonts slash conf dot avail there is a file so this is recursive which is pretty neat but what if you don't want it to be recursive well we can pass an extra argument here so let's uh, type the exact same thing uh, find in the current directory max depth it's going to be one and then uh, let's just follow it with type f and uh, i name asterisk.conf so now you can see that the only things that it returned is that it looked a little confusing uh, the prompt was right uh, right here so uh, everything over this that's from the last command so it was recursive 
but we controlled the depth with this one. So what you can do, you can either you know go one level down, or if you want a max depth of two, you can do that. Uh, and this, these are all ways of uh, modifying the find uh, to really hone in on what you're looking for. And you can pass multiple arguments. So let's only look for configuration files that are over uh, 50k, and I don't know if we're going to find one. No, we're not. Let's uh, remove the max depth so that it will be recursive. And 10k? There we go. So we found uh, a couple. Uh, this file is uh, more than 10 kilobytes. So again, that's how uh, that's how we use the find command, and this is a really powerful tool. Uh, I'm convinced that you guys, uh, you know, if if you're using a graphical file manager, it's you know really not that necessary because you can kind of look at everything and, and see so much more. But if you're working in terminal, I'm confident that that this is going to be a command that you guys are going to be able to you know hit the ground running with. This is you know a really great and powerful tool. So thank you guys for watching. In the next video, we're going to be going over another really awesome command. Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about the grep command and how we can use that to find things in files. So in the previous video, we learned about the find command and how we could use that to find files. And now we're going to be covering uh, how to find things in files. So we do that using the grep command, which you can use like this. Um, so first, I've got a bunch of PHP files here. Let me remove these two files there. So I've got a bunch of PHP files here, and what I've done was I've put uh, some functions in them. So this one has two functions, and the other ones have some other ones as well. And we're going to be using this to demonstrate how to use grep. So you type the command grep, and then what you're looking for, and then what files you're looking for them in. So if I were to type file2.php, this would return the three functions that I have in that file. If I were to just keep adding on files here, uh, it will look through each file, and it will actually return which file they're found in. So that's pretty neat. Uh, two things that I want to talk about regarding grep before we you know, do anything a little more extreme is two flags that it can take. So a flag in a command is a way to pass it more information about what we want to do. You know, we can get really specific. So we're going to run grep using i, dash i, which means ignore the case. So uh, case sensitivity won't be a problem here. And then we're going to look in all files. Oh, I forgot the search string. We're looking for function. And this finds not only the functions that we saw in the previous command, but it also found this function, which has a capital F. If we were to run the grep command without the dash i, on all files here, you'll notice that the only difference between the output is in file 2 here, it found function with a capital F, and it didn't in this result. So that's how you use the dash i. It's pretty standard across Linux. Usually i will be integrated into commands as, uh, you know, uh, ignore case sensitivity. Now the second flag I want to talk to you guys about is really neat. It's dash n. And it can be used in conjunction with other flags. And we're going to type the string that we're looking for and the files we're looking for it in. And what this dash n flag does is it, it gives you the line number where the instances of the string is found and then the rest of that line. So this is pretty cool. This is how you use grep. Let's say that I had a bunch of PHP files and a bunch of JavaScript files and, and other files that have functions in them, but I only wanted to look in all of the PHP files. Well, how I would do that is by using the find command. So in the previous video, we learned that we can look in the current directory for type is f for file or d for directory. And then we can give it what we're looking for. So in this case, we're going to be looking for 
all PHP files. And the iName flag means ignore case sensitivity in uh, the string that we're looking for. So we found uh, PHP files with extensions in both lowercase, uppercase, and a mixed case here. So that's cool, but how do we use find with grep? And this is going to be the big thing that, that I want to show you guys. This is really handy. So what you can do, you can give it a certain uh, search uh, through the find command. So we're going to find type uh, F. The I name is going to be PHP. And then what we can do is we can pass the find command another flag, which is going to be exec. So what this is going to do is it's going to first find all files that match this criteria, and then it's going to execute the next command on it. So we're going to use grep function, and I'm going to uh, pass the dash i and dash n flags here. And then we need to add two curly braces and a plus sign to end the exec flag. So everything in here is going to be executed within this flag. So if I hit enter, it's going to look through all PHP files and it's going to find case sensitive or case insensitive functions with line numbers. So that's really cool. Uh, we can use this to find type file uh, size. We're going to say less than 10 kilobytes. And we can group search parameters here. So I just passed a flag uh, of size, and the value of that flag is under 10 kilobytes. But I'm also going to pass it dash i name, which is going to be .php. So this is going to find all .php files that are less than 10 kilobytes. And then I can exec grep. in here. And right now that looks the same because I'm pretty sure all my files are less than 10 kilobytes. They don't have much in it. Um, but but you can kind of see how this works. So this is a really powerful tool and you guys can use grep and find together to search through a very specific set of files for very specific strings and instances. One final thing that I want to show you guys in this video is how to redirect the output of a command. So how we do that is simply we write a command. Uh, for this instance, it's going to be ls. And then we're going to use the right arrow. And this is the key just to the left of the question mark key on most keyboards. Um, and then we're going to tell it what file we want to put it into. So rather than outputting the result of ls, it's going to put the result into out file. And so we can type nano out file .txt and we can see the output of that command, which is pretty neat. Now I'm going to use the find command to find all files with a size of less than 10 kilobytes. And I'm going to use exec grep dash i dash n. We're going to look for sandwich. Then we're going to end the exec flag here. And then we're going to redirect the output to f.text. Oh, oops. Let's, uh, forgot this, iname. We're only looking in PHP files here. There. Now if we open up f.text, we see these two sandwich functions that I found. But that didn't print it out on the screen, so the final command that I'm going to share with you guys in this video is TEE. -E. And what this does, if I type the previous command out again, let's look for function this time. And we're going to end this. We can actually pipe this across to TEE. 
and make an out file.txt. So before I run this, I want to break this command down. We're using find to find all files less than 10 kilobytes in size and with a .php extension. We're then going to execute grep, uh, ignoring case sensitivity and numbering lines. We're going to search for function in these files and then we're going to pipe it over to t and the second argument of this t command is the out file that we want to write the results to and what this command will do is it will return the results on the screen but it's also going to put them into of.txt so this is going to be useful if you want to copy down the results of a command while seeing them in real time so that was a pretty big video i hope you guys found it informative and i hope i explained it well um, in the next video, we're going to be going over processes and what they are and how to manage them. Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about processes, what they are, and how you can manage them. So if you've ever opened up uh, the task manager in Windows, you would see a list of running applications or processes. The same thing is true for Linux. Basically, a process is just an application that is running. And so we can get an idea of, uh, of what kind of processes run on a Linux machine by using the command top. So if we run this, it'll show the top of the list of, uh, of running applications. It's real time. So if we start new applications, it's going to see these processes in here. So I don't want to go through every single column here, but what I do want to mention are the most important things. Uh, the PID is the process ID, and you can use this to manage that process. Uh, the user is who the application is running as, and you can see how long an application has been open and also the command that's associated with the process. And as always, you can hit Control C to escape that. So what we're going to do to see the entire list is use a command called ps aux. And this is going to, this is not real time, so this captures it at the time that you run that command. But you can see the list is quite a bit larger, and we can go through and look uh, for applications that we want to see. Uh, but this can get a little uh, you know, convoluted just because of how large this list can be. So I'm going to run Theory Browser here. And when it opens, this is now a process that is running. So I can find any Leary Browser processes by typing ps space aux and then we can pipe that over to the command grep and we can look for Leary browser and this is going to search for all processes that have Leary browser anywhere in it so the name of the command or the file path of the command uh, it doesn't matter it's going to find it based on that name now that's pretty neat it gives us uh, a few things it gives us the process ID and the time running and the command and stuff like that. And it also gives the time uh, that it was run. So we could use this process ID to manage uh, whether this app is running or not, but let's say we've got a few instances running. So now I have three processes for the Leary browser. So what happens when I run the previous command? It's uh, messy. Uh, you could read through this, and uh, if you want to, but if you're just if you just want to have a quick look at it, this is not the command. If you want to get the process IDs of an application, you can use the pgrep command and type in Leary Browser, and this is going to return three process IDs because we've got three processes running. The order of these process IDs is chronological. So the top one here, 6186, that's the first window I launched, which is this one. And I'm going to type first right here. This would be the second one, which would be this one. So this is 
second window, and then the third one we're going to put over here. And we're going to do that so that we can, uh, I can show you how you can identify processes based on chronological order if you know the order in which uh, certain things were opened. I did because it's, uh, I only ran three, three instances of it and the way that they opened, they told me which ones were on top and so I could see uh, the order of them. So let's say I wanted to close the second window. I can use a command called kill. So I'll type kill and then dash nine and then the process ID. So in this case, it's gonna be the second one, which is 6300. So if I type 6300 and hit enter, it kills that instance. So if I run pgrep on Leary browser again, it's now just gonna show me the other two. Now you can kill apps uh, like this. Uh, six three, or sorry, six one eight six, and then another process ID six three five eight. We can run that, and it's going to kill all those processes. Now that's pretty neat, but let's say that you've got a few instances running, and you don't want to type the process IDs for each one. If I type pgrep Larry browser. This is going to return four process IDs. Now in the pgrep command, uh, the application is pgrep and then the second parameter that it takes is the command that's run. So it's the same when we run top, we'll see under command Leary browser right here. So we can we can see that's the command and if I was running it from uh, terminal uh, it would be uh, slash opt slash Leary uh, Leary browser something like that and then the resulting command would be Leary dash browser that's the actual binary file that's running so what we can do rather than uh, closing them by process ID which we can get running this we can close them all at once by using the kill all command. And so how to do that is basically type kill all and then the process name, which is Leary Browser. That's going to kill all of those processes. So that's uh, basically how to uh, manage and monitor processes on a Linux machine. I hope I explained it well. Uh, in the next video, we're going to be discussing services. Hey guys, welcome back. In the last video we discussed processes, and in this video we're going to discuss services, which are a special type of Linux process. For the sake of this video, I've downloaded and installed uh, Elasticsearch from Elastic.co. I've tried different versions of their software, and I find that 1.7.3 works best for me. Let me just check and make sure I'm telling you guys the right thing. Yeah, 1.7.3 has worked the best for me on all Debian derivatives that I've tried it on. So if you have trouble with other versions, try installing this. They offer .dev and .rpm uh, for, uh, installers. We're not going into depth on Elasticsearch, but we're going to use this as an example for a service. And we're going to see services more in depth in the future as well when we install Apache uh, web server on the machine and you know use that. So we start a service by typing sudo service and then the service name and then the action we want to perform on it which is start. And we get no output but it did start and we can confirm that by going to Firefox here and going to the web interface of Elasticsearch, which is located uh, on port 9200 at localhost. And we see here that we are connected to Elasticsearch. So we can also stop the service in a similar way. And if we come back here, 
we'll see that it's unable to connect because we're no longer running that service. So a service is like a process, except you start it up and it kind of waits in the background until you need to use it, or it uh, can perform various tasks in the background. So they're helpful to have, and uh, they're lighter on the system when you're not using them. So let's start up that service again. Confirm that it's open. There it goes. Takes a minute to load up. And let's say that I don't want to run it on port 9200. I want to run it on port 1150. So how we do that, we need to edit a configuration file. And the Elasticsearch configuration file has a .yml extension. So I'm going to use find here to look in etc and uh, the type that we're going to be looking for is a file and the i name is going to be elasticsearch asterisk and here it is right here so i'm going to sudo nano etc elasticsearch elasticsearch.yml and in this file, we're not going to go over the file too much, but uh, I'm just going to find the part that configures what port it runs on, which is down near the bottom. There we go. So that's the IP address, and then the port here. There we go. So the default is 9200. I'm going to change it to 1150. Then I'm going to save the file and exit. Now if I refresh this, it's still going to work on port 9200. And it's not going to work on port 1150. And the reason for this is that it's still using the old configuration file until the service is reloaded or restarted. So rather than typing, uh, you know, Elasticsearch stop and then Elasticsearch start, we can use one command, and that is sudo service Elasticsearch reload. Oh, restart, sorry. And it's going to restart the service. So now if we come back here, give it a moment, and then refresh we're going to see that now we're connected on port 1150. And if we were to go back to port 9200, it would no longer work. And this is because the restart function has updated the configuration file that it's running with. So that's basically how you use a service. And we went through the commands that I learned when I was learning Linux, and uh, we don't use those anymore. So Ubuntu has moved to using uh, upstart and system control. So nowadays, how we would do this, let's stop the service. It's kind of in the same way. We're going to use a different program, though. So I'm going to type sudo systemctl start Elasticsearch. I'm going to change the port here to 1150. So essentially, system control does the exact same thing that the service command does. It just does it a bit differently. And that's probably going to become the standard way to do it in the future. So I'd recommend, uh, you know, it's similar uh, to stop the service. The only difference between using service and system control is that in system control, the action is before the program or before the service name. In service, you type service, service name, and then action. So that's the only really important difference between the two. I would use system control. Uh, get used to using that because I'm pretty sure that's what's going to become standard. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to be going over scheduled tasks. Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be discussing
cron tabs or cron jobs. And this is basically a way to schedule tasks to uh, be run at certain times. So let's uh, get right to it. How you're going to get into the interface for building cron tabs is typing cron tab dash e. And this is going to open a cron tab file that's going to be saved to the etc directory. And I'm going to erase this. So basically, um, you can see on this line right here the structure of the cron tab. So this is going to be minutes, 0 to 59. This is going to be hours, 0 to 23. This is going to be day of month, so 1 to 31. Uh, month number, which is going to be 1 to 12. And then day of week, which is going to be 0 to 6. And then the command that you want to perform at that time. So I'm going to run a command on the 15th minute, the 14th hour, regardless of the day of the month, regardless of the month, and regardless of the day of the week. And the command that I'm going to do is uh, ls, and I'm going to output the command results to home nick lt cronres.txt. And I think if I change this to 12 and then save and exit it, we'll be able to see this happen right away. So let's go into this directory here, unmaximize it. So it's now 212, and we're looking for cronres. So this process just ran, and it returned a list uh, of my uh, home directory and it put it into this file. So as you can see if we go back in there the reason it did that at this exact time is because on the 12th minute of the 14th hour on every day of the month every month of the year and every day of the week then this is performed. Right? So if I wanted this to run at 5 a.m. on uh, Sundays, I would do this. And at 5 a.m. every Sunday, it would log this, uh, this ls command to cronres.txt. Well, that's cool, but what practical applications does it have? Uh, well, one of them actually you can see in the example here. Uh, you can actually keep a backup updated. Uh, this is going to run at 5 a.m. every week on Sunday, or Monday. And it's going to basically do this. It's going to create a, a, a tar archive here. So it's going to store it in var slash backups uh, at home.tgz. And the contents of it is going to be the entire home directory. So it's going to make an entire backup once a week of all your files. So that, that's pretty useful. I want to give you guys one more example of how cron tabs can be used. So I'm going to exit out of here. I'm going to hit no. And what I'm going to do now is so when we just did that, we set up the reason why it output my home directory for the ls command into this file is because we created that cron tab as our user. And so if we wanted to run uh, a command uh, you know, in a cron tab that required elevated privileges, in order to do that, we actually type sudo cron tab dash e. And this is going to open the cron tab file for the root user. So if we scroll down, uh, perfect. So let's set up a command. So I'm going to run this at uh, 0, 7 a.m. Uh, every day of the month, every month, and on Monday. So Monday morning at 7 a.m. this is going to run. Get upgrade dash y. So the dash y flag in the app get upgrade basically means say yes to everything. So this command is going to keep my system updated every week at 7 a.m. on Monday. 
So this, this is great for scheduling tasks. If you need certain things to run at certain times or so frequently, you can do that using CronTab. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm really excited because uh, in the next module we're going to get to talking about uh, developer things. And so uh, we're going to go over different development environments and uh, technologies and stuff. So that's really exciting. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, welcome back. So in this video we're going to go over integrated development environments or IDEs as they're otherwise called. So there's a difference between a code editor and an IDE. A code editor is good for quickly editing single files or even multiple files, and they usually provide decent syntax highlighting, smart indentation, and sometimes code completion, which is a really handy tool to have. However, if you're working in a large project or need a more complete set of tools for development, you're going to want to use an integrated development environment. IDEs offer the same code features as code editors, but also more advanced features like version control support, tool chains, and ways to run the application from right in the IDE. Depending on your choice of programming language or development tools, you'll need to choose an IDE which supports those technologies. Some IDEs support multiple languages, while others choose to support only one language or select few and optimize the IDE for the chosen languages. For instance, Eclipse is a widely used IDE, provides version control support, uh, support for many different languages from C to C++ to PHP and Java. Like many IDEs, Eclipse requires Java to be installed in order to use the IDE. To install the Java runtime in Ubuntu, open up terminal and type sudo apt-get install openjdk-8-jre. Or if openjdk8 isn't available in your system's repositories, you can install openjdk7. Then extract the Eclipse archive you downloaded and run the eclipse-inst file to launch a graphical installer. CodeBlocks is another popular IDE that supports C, C++, and Fortran. Unlike Eclipse, CodeBlocks was written in C++ instead of Java, and so it doesn't require any special runtimes in order to use it. Now Qt, or Qt, is a framework for cross-platform GUI applications and the development installation includes its own IDE called Qt Creator. Qt Creator supports C++ and QML as languages, version control, project and build management, and includes its own graphical GUI builder called Qt Designer. Qt Creator is the smartest IDE I've used, in my opinion, and can be very powerful when used correctly. Now, for anything other than C++ and QML, I use a JetBrains IDE. So JetBrains is a company that provides IDEs for a variety of languages. No matter which of their IDEs you install, they all operate essentially the same way, just for different technologies. They include great code completion and build management, as well as version control, a comprehensive settings component, plugin support, and when you write Python code, it even lets you know if you violate any of the PEP guidelines, which is the style guide for Python code to keep things clean and readable. So once you download Eclipse, for instance, you're going to get a compressed archive, and you can right-click and extract it, and it's going to result in a directory like this called Eclipse Installer. So just double-click that and head into that directory. And once in that directory, uh, right-click and click Open in Terminal. And now you need to make sure that Java is installed. So I have had limited success with OpenJDK 8 with Eclipse. Uh, so I just installed OpenJDK 7, and let's see how that works. So just to recap, to install OpenJDK, type sudo apt-get install OpenJDK 7-jre, or 8 uh, for the version number. 
To confirm that you've got Java already installed, you just type uh, Java dash version, and it should tell you uh, what type of uh, Java you've got installed. Now, to run the installer, we're going to target the current directory and run Eclipse dash inst. And it's going to launch the Eclipse installer. Now, once the installer comes up, you're going to see that we have a list of IDEs that we can install. And I downloaded the complete package, so it gives me every possible option here. I'm just going to install the Eclipse IDE for Java. Just leave it here and hit install. It's going to install Eclipse to our home directory. Uh, the Eclipse directory is set up and then any IDEs that you install are put into that uh, directory. So it's asking, do I trust these certificates? And I'm going to select all and hit OK because uh, you know I'm, I'm confident that this is the actual application. I think it is. Uh, now when it's done, it's going to present you with a launch button. So let's just click that and dive into Eclipse and uh, have a quick look around. Now, I don't use Eclipse for development, but if you do, if, you, if this is something that you use on Windows or OS X and you feel comfortable using Eclipse, then you're going to probably want to use this on Linux. Uh, it's cross-platform, so everything should be the same. So this is Eclipse. It's uh, the the main window here. I'm going to create a new Java project and I'm just going to call it uh, Untitled. I'm not really feeling too creative at this point. A project layout, okay, yeah. yeah this, okay, so this all looks good. So I'm going to hit Next and Finish. All right, so on the left-hand side here, you have a project explorer, uh, which is basically just uh, a list of projects used in your Eclipse workspace. And this is my Java project that I just created. These files opened are from other projects uh, using Eclipse. Uh, I did try it out. And so you can just, uh, you know, get started right away in Eclipse. Now, I'm going to look at uh, a JetBrains IDE as well. Actually, let me just close this. There. So the same thing goes for PyCharm or any other JetBrains IDE that you download. You're going to get a compressed archive file and you're going to extract it and you're going to get a directory as a result. Uh, this is PyCharm and then the version number. So go into the IDEs directory and then into the bin directory and open this in terminal. Now this is PyCharm, so I'm going to run the PyCharm.sh file. If it was WebStorm, there would be a file here called WebStorm.sh and it's pretty self-explanatory. So adapt this to whatever IDE you've downloaded and are using, if any. So to get started, I'm going to run sh in the current directory PyCharm.sh. And we wait. Now the first time you launch PyCharm in this way, you're going to be prompted to create desktop file and MIME type associations. So a desktop file is basically uh, a launcher in Linux, and this allows you to launch it through um, the, the dashboard overview or whatever you're using. If you have a, um, a menu uh, to launch apps from, it's going to create entries in there. 
So now getting started with PyCharm, uh, you, w every time you launch it, you're going to see a list of projects on the left-hand side. And I'm just going to create a new project, which is going to be pure Python. And I'm going to name it uh, Pi. And it's going to scan all files in the project, which right now there shouldn't be many. There should just be one uh, Python file, I believe. So again, on the left-hand side, you've got your Project Explorer. It uh, actually didn't create a file. So let's go ahead and create... Uh, locked up here. There we go. So you can right-click on a directory and go to New and create a new file within that directory. And I'm going to call this main. That should be good right there. And it's going to be really simple. It's just going to... Uh, what's this here? Yes, let's accept that. Just print hello world. Now the great thing about having an IDE is uh, if I were just using a text editor for this, I would code it all in the text editor. Then I'd go open up a uh, command line and then I'd navigate to my main file and I'd run it through the command. And the great thing about uh, an IDE is that you can actually run it from the IDE itself. And as you can see, here's the output of the application and it tells you what exit code it uh, exits with. And an IDE is very uh, full featured in this way that basically uh, for most of the stuff you need to do while developing, it can be done from right within the IDE. And so that was a few of the options that you have for IDEs on Linux. There are a, a few, so explore that if you want to. And uh, in the next video, we're going to be talking about Git. Uh, it's going to be mostly command line, but I am going to come back to PyCharm in the next video. Hey guys, in this video, we're going to be discussing Git and why you should be using version control for your projects. So first thing I need to do is actually manually create the .desktop file for PyCharm because it did not do it, I guess. So. Uh, in the bin directory, I'm just going to open a terminal and run pycharm.sh. And when it starts, I'm going to cancel. It's going to automatically load the last project that I was working in, which is not what we want right now. Uh, you're going to see this configure link in the bottom. Just right or left click that and click create desktop entry here. Not sure why that's giving me that error here. It will locate suitable startup script. Well, that's odd because this is the startup script. Let's see if we can make that executable. Let's see if that fixes it. There we go. So if you guys encounter that, just make sure you right click here, go to properties, permissions, and allow executing files program. You can also do uh, this with chmod uh, command. So let's just confirm good stuff. So now I'm gonna launch PyCharm and kind of throw that in the background because we're going to get more into Git at this point. So I'm just going to close this actually. So now let's talk about Git. 
Git is a great tool if you work in a team, if you're working on large projects, or if you're working on open source projects. Uh, Git allows multiple people to work in the same files or the same project at the same time, and it's pretty smart at letting you control, you know, if there's merge conflicts, what exactly to do. And a merge conflict is basically where the same block of code is edited or, or modified by more than one person and sent uh, up to the server there's going to be merge conflicts and you can sort those out and we're going to go through that so first thing we need to do is install git so again terminal sudo apt git install git and git dash extras And the reason we're adding git extras as well as git is that uh, git extras gives us a little more control and we're going to go over some of the things in the git extras package as well in terms of uh, what certain commands do in git. All right, so once the installation of git is completed, uh, I'm going to actually go into the PyCharm directory for the project I just created. So I'm going to, uh, I think it put it into PyCharm projects. So let's go in here. And I named it Py. So I'm going to change the directory into Py and we see our files here. So now what I'm going to do is initialize a Git repository here. So I'm going to type Git init and it's an empty repository at this point, has no information, it doesn't know where it's supposed to sync up to. So what we need to do at this point is uh, go into our web browser and get over to uh, github.com and we'll create a repository for this project. So on GitHub, if you don't have an account, just sign up. Uh, if you do, sign in. And when you're signed in, in the top right, you've got this little plus sign. Uh, you're going to click that and click New Repository. And here you're going to give it a name. So I'm just going to name it the same as my project. Uh, actually, I'm going to name it Python-Py example. And I'm going to initialize the repository with a readme so that we can automatically uh, pull right, right from the get-go. So here is the repository and here is the URL for the repository. So just click in here, control C to copy, come back over to the terminal and we're gonna run git remote add origin and then paste the, what we just copied from the GitHub page. So this is basically going to tell our local repository where its uh, remote origin is, and that's the repository that you see in the background in Chrome. So I'm going to hit enter here, and we if, if you don't get a confirmation, that means it uh, all worked well. Uh, if you get an error, just uh, try and follow the error message as close as you can and see if... Uh, see if you can get added. Uh, the git URL to add an origin always ends in .git, so pay attention to that as well. Now that we've got git installed and our git repository set up here, we also need to configure our user account. And so how we're going to do that is through the git config. So run git space config, two dashes, and the keyword global, and user.name, and in the quotations here, we're going to type our name. And then git config global user dot email is going to be this. So now our user is set up. We can pull from this repository and push to it. So let's do a pull. Let's uh, run git pull. And you're going to see that it's going to give us an error because it doesn't know exactly which branch is uh, the upstream. And that's basically which branch uh, you should always pull and push from. So you have two options. You can either run git pull origin 
and then the branch name, which in this case is master. This will work, uh, but also you can set the upstream branch. So I'm going to do that. So run git branch dash dash set upstream two equals, and here we're going to uh, type origin dash the branch name. So in this case, it is master. And that's not going to work. Let's do a poll. Let's do a manual poll first. So git pull origin master. And if I run ls, we now see that we've got the readme in here. So I'm going to try setting the upstream again. There. So you do need to do a pull first. And that basically tells your machine what repository or what branches the repository has. And then you can set the upstream to one of those branches. But the repository on your local machine has to be aware of the branches first. So now uh, we've got a repository set up. We've got a file that we can edit. And I'm going to do that. So I'm going to come over to PyCharm here and open up the project. Dismiss that for now. We've got a readme file. So I'm just going to write uh, a quick description here. There. So I'm going to control S to save that. And come back over here. I'm going to clear this so it looks a bit cleaner. And now what we're going to do is push this change to the server. And how we do that is we first need to uh, add all the files to uh, the tracker. And then secondly, we need to commit our changes. And then we need to push. So to add the file, you can either run git add and then the file name. Or if you want to add all changed files, you can run git add dash capital A. Now that we've got the files added, we need to commit the files. And we're going to do that with git commit dash M and then our commit message, which basically is a headline for these changes we've made. So it should, uh, it should it should describe the changes that we've made and uh, be less than, say, 140 characters. Because this is going to show uh, right here. And if it gets too long, you know, it might uh, not be as convenient as it should be. So I'm just going to name this one updated readme added main.py and then hit enter. Now I'm going to uh, uh, let's just push it. So git push. Now if I hadn't set the upstream to origin master, I would have to type git push origin master here. But I have the upstream set, so I'm just going to type git push and then enter the username and the password. And this commit has been successfully pushed to the remote repository. So if I come back to this page and refresh, we're going to see uh, the change to the readme file has succeeded. The main.py file has been added. And we've also got this directory right here, which is for the PyCharm IDE. This, uh, these files provide information to PyCharm about uh, say which files were, are, are currently opened, uh, stuff like that. And so if I close PyCharm and reopen it, it knows what files to open 
from my last session. All right. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to remove the dot idea directory. And this is done not through the typical rm command, which you would expect. It's done through git rm r and then the directory. So it's removed all of these files now. And if I change, well, actually, it's not going to be there. If I go back to PyCharm, it's probably going to tell me that something has changed. It needs to be, uh, no, no notification yet. All right. Let's just do this. Let's run git add a git commit remove idea directory and git push. Now if we go back here and refresh, the idea directory is still here because it's got that in it now. So we're going to close PyCharm entirely. Let's run the uh, remove again. Let's remove it with dash F because it's been modified. Then let's get push again. So now if I refresh, I should see that directory gone, and I do. So how do you get uh, Git to completely ignore that directory? Because it's going to be automatically created every time I launch uh, PyCharm or whatever JetBrains IDE you're working in. And I'm not sure if it does it for other uh, IDEs, if it creates a little hidden directory there that you don't necessarily want to be included in the repository. But if it does... Uh, get the name of that directory and do this. So in the main repository directory, I'm going to run git ignore. I think that's actually using a hyphen. And I'm going to ignore that directory and everything in that directory. So if I typed nano Hit ignore. I see this, which is good. So I'm going to exit out of there. And I'm going to type git ignore and just the directory name. There. So now if I open up PyCharm. Let's make some modifications to the main.py file, and then we're going to commit those changes and send them up to the repository. And we should we should uh, be able to see that the idea directory is uh, excluded. So I'm going to open up main.py here. Let's def Find a main function takes message, let's print message, and then we are going to just call main hello people. Hit save. We can uh, run this in the IDE if we want to make sure it works before we commit it. So now let's go back over here. Let's run git add a git commit um, changed main.py and then git push. There we go. So I'm going to refresh this, and 
we've got the main.py file is the newest version we can see there. We don't have the uh, .idea directory because we've ignored it. And this is our git ignore file. So that's cool. This is how you would use git um, in terminal. Let's do, let's do this. I'm going to change directory out of here. I'm going to create a new directory called pi2 cd into pi2 git init git remote add origin and I'm going to add the same one. Git pull Oh, I need to uh, do the whole origin master again. And so now we have two directories that has this project in it. If I go into PyCharm projects and go into Py2, I'm going to make changes to this file. I'm just going to add a comment. Save that. Now I'm going to git add a and git push. Sorry, git push origin master. All right. Now I'm going to change back to my Py directory. And what we're doing right now is we are creating a merge conflict. So if I refresh this page, I'm going to see the most recent. I should. Now what happened there? OK, you guys, I forgot to commit the changes before pushing. That's really silly. So let's go back into the Py2 directory. And I'm going to git commit. Uh, made some changes. And then git push to origin master. All right, so now if I refresh this page here, we're going to see the comment in here, which is cool. But this came from our Py2 directory. If we go back into our Py directory, we're going to see that we don't have that version of this file. So this directory now is behind the actual master branch. Now we would normally uh, run git pull uh, at the beginning of each day, if you, if you do this professionally, you run git pull at the beginning of the day and maybe even uh, throughout the day um, and make frequent commits. But let's say you forgot to do that and now we have a merge conflict. If I were to pull right now in this directory, everything would work great because I haven't made changes. So let's add a different comment here. And PyCharm just bricked up on me. So I'm going to close that. Wow. For right now, I'm just going to edit this in Gedit, I guess. Adding the second comment to this file. Going to save. Now in the Py directory, so go back to the main directory we're working in, I'm going to git add a, git commit. I'm going to try to push my changes to the server uh, wi without being aware of the fact that my local repository is actually behind uh, the, the remote repository. 
So this is what you would do. You'd make your changes, you'd add the file, you'd commit with uh, adding new comment, and then try to push. And now we see that we get an error message we're, uh, because we're behind. And so it says fetch first. So let's run git fetch origin master. And if we open up this file, merge conflict. Uh, fix conflicts and then commit the result. So now we've got this uh, because we, we told it to uh, merge and this is what happens. Um, the head is this and this is, uh, is what the remote server contains. So we see that it's added some special characters and it kind of tells us what is coming from what. So if you have a huge file, you can always see your changes versus the changes coming from the server. And now you can do some fancy little stuff like uh, let's just uh, keep both comments in here because they're both useful comments and then save this file. Now we can git uh, add the file, git commit, and we're going to say merged uh, conflicts resolved and now we're going to get push and it's going to succeed because we've taken care of the conflicts So now if I go back over to this repository and refresh, I'm going to see that both of those are in there. And uh, th that's all we really need to worry about at that point. So, so we just learned how to handle merge uh, conflicts, which is a very useful skill to have. PyCharm is still bricked up on me entirely, and I'm not sure why. Let's launch WebStorm. So I'm going to show you guys something else here. Uh, just a quick little demonstration. Actually, I'd like to do this in PyCharm. Here. It doesn't... Uh, kill it by the term PyCharm, I'm going to have to kill all Java processes. So, pseudo kill all Java. Alright, now I'm going to run PyCharm again. I have noticed that PyCharm sometimes uh, bricks up and I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it's just an incompatibility with my system. Uh, the other JetBrains uh, IDEs work fantastically. Uh, native file watcher is not executable. Maybe that's the whole issue there. Not sure. Uh, so what I'm going to do is add that, and I'm going to initialize uh, version control here right in my IDE. So what I'm going to do is uh, let's go to view tool windows version control and we can see that I've got one file changed and so JetBrains IDEs are really smart they kind of just plug right into version control so if I change files let's say I uh, make a change here I'll see that in uh, the default uh, local changes to uh, these are added here. These are all the files that have changed. So if I right click, go to commit changes, uh, the commit message is going to be newest commit. 
and hover over this button. You can either commit and continue working to make more commits, or you can commit and push all in one. I'm going to commit and push. Uh, it's going to Origin Master, and uh, it's pushing it, and it's going to ask for my password again once in uh, this IDE, I think. No? No, I guess it doesn't. All good. Uh, let me find that repository. I accidentally went back. Here we go. And we can see newest commit here, which I just pushed from the IDE. And so IDEs make, um, make version control a lot different. I'm going to create a new branch and call it uh, version 0 0.1. Hit OK. Now if I make changes in here, no longer need comments, and it bricked up again. Cool. All right. Basically, that's how you work in branches, though. So if I were to open uh, this file with uh, gedit and edit this, no longer need uh, comments here because it's self-explanatory. Let's uh, create another function. And uh, let's just have this print out new function and we're not going to call it or anything I'm just going to save this and that uh, is not what I want this one is all right so now if I go get branch okay get add a get commit new branch, git push origin uh, v01. There we go. So now if I come back here, we'll see two branches. And so this makes sense if, uh, if you got multiple people working on different type of features and it's better if they work alone in a separate branch so they don't have to worry about the changes everyone else is making to other areas of the project that don't necessarily impact them. Each person can have a different branch so you might have a branch for a specific new feature or you know uh, what have you but branches are pretty uh, simple. So you can also merge branches back into master. So now we're on uh, v01 branch here and so we can switch over to this branch and we can see that it looks a bit different because this file was changed with that commit. So how do you get those commits over to the master branch? You need to check out uh, master branch um, so currently we're on v01 because that's the branch we're working in. So run git checkout master and then git push oh. there. Uh, you need to merge uh, the branches together first and then run git push origin master and if we refresh here we now see that the master branch has this new commit so that's how to use git in command line uh, Basically, it's really simple and it's really great if you have large projects or, again, if you have a team of a lot of people working on the same projects. 
So thanks for watching this video. I hope you guys found it informative and useful. Hey guys, in this video we're going to be going over some Meteor JS stuff, uh, but first I just need to correct something from my last video. I've been working in JavaScript quite a bit lately, and so it's natural for me when I make comments to use the two leading slashes. And this is the same in a lot of languages. Uh, however, it's not how you make comments in Python. And so I just need to correct this so that you guys uh, know that I was doing it wrong in the entire last video. Uh, so in Python, we've got this comment here, and the actual uh, way that you write comments in Python is by using a hashtag sign. And it turns it blue in gedit so you know it's, uh, it's commented out. Hey guys, I want to touch briefly on Meteor.js today in this video and a little bit about how to use it. So first thing you're going to do is uh, in the address bar just uh, type install Meteor. It's going to give us the location of the Meteor installer to download. And it's right here. If you're on OS X or Linux, just copy this command here. Open up Terminal. Clear that out. And then paste it in here. And if you get this error, it means you don't have curl installed, so you need to install it. So sudo apt get install curl. And once curl is set up, you can run the previous command again. And it's going to download Meteor and install it. I already have Meteor installed here, I guess. And so it's removing my existing Meteor installation. And it's going to download a new one. So when Meteor is done installing, it uh, gives you a little notice here how to get started. Uh, so let's just create an app. Do I have a projects directory already? I do. So I'm going to change directory into projects. And I'm going to type meteor create to do. And it's going to create a project and a project directory in my current directory called to do. So I'm going to change directory. And then if I list uh, the directory, Meteor has created three files to get me started. So I could type Meteor and it's going to launch uh, the, the program on port 3000. There we go. So once you get this message, it means the app has been launched. So you can go to localhost on port 3000 and this is our Meteor app. It's got an event handler here for the click me button which counts the times it's been pressed. But that doesn't really look too great so I'm going to close this here and how you add packages to Meteor is you type Meteor add and then the package name. So you can browse Meteor packages by uh, going to atmosphere.js.com and uh, if I were looking for say bootstrap uh, I would there's a lot here However, the official bootstrap uh, module or package is at TWBS, which stands for Twitter Bootstrap, and then Bootstrap. So I'm going to add my, that to my project uh, like this. And let me go into the file manager here into projects and to do. And you're going to see the three files that I created for us, but if you hit Control H, you're going to also see a hidden directory uh, titled Meteor. And this is where it stores the packages that we, uh, that we add and, uh, and some internal Meteor stuff as well. So we're not going to get too into that. Uh, these are the files that you'll be working in 
with Meteor. So you can open, uh, for instance, the HTML file with uh, gedit. There we go. And you'll see this is the uh, markup. So Meteor works with templates a lot. This isn't uh, an in-depth tutorial, but more just how to get started. Uh, Meteor has a pretty awesome tutorial on their website. Just go to meteor.com and you can access the documentation, uh, reference points, and uh, the tutorial to get you started. So that's a basic usage of Meteor in the command line. Uh, typically it's just Meteor create and then the app name and once you're in the apps directory you just run Meteor to run the application and you can use Meteor add or Meteor remove if you want to remove a package. Uh, add to add a package and then the package name. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you guys found it informative and a good place to start with Meteor. Uh, a selling point for Meteor is the fact that uh, real-time interactions are built into its core, so you no longer have to fake it with uh, JavaScript, Ajax calls to uh, PHP scripts. Uh, everything's done in JavaScript. It's all real-time, so it's awesome to work with, uh, and it, it makes things easy as well. So. So check that out if you're into uh, web application development at all. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Hey guys, welcome back. I'm going to do this video. I wasn't going to, but I decided to do it as this is a module for developers. And I think the information you'll find in this video is going to be really helpful for you. And so it's going to be a more in-depth look at Meteor and how to use it in your next project. So it's a tutorial of some sort. And so I'm going to be showing you guys how to use Meteor with React and Flow Router. And I find that there's not too much information out there on this combination of tools. And so it makes sense to give you guys that information. If you are following along this course anyway, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's quite reasonable to assume that some of you at least are going to need this information and even if you didn't know you needed it, maybe you can go ahead and use Meteor in your next project. So in the last video, we created a project through Terminal uh, for Meteor. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up my Terminal and I'm going to change directory into projects and into to do. And so Meteor automatically creates a few files for you first. So let's go ahead and open this up in WebStorm. I'm going to click open and down into projects and into to do, hit OK. Now WebStorm is going to open up the uh, project and we've got the project view in the left hand side. So the first thing we're going to do is delete these files because we don't need them. Now we're going to start creating some directories because in Meteor projects can get fairly large because you're going to be working with a lot of files and so organization is a huge uh, benefit here. So uh, let's right click and create a directory called client. I'm going to create another directory called lib and one more for server. Now the client directory is going to contain everything that's going to be available to the client. So this is where your templates and stuff are going to go. So in client, I'm going to create a new directory called components. And this is where we're going to store the React components. Now in lib, what I'm going to do is uh, create a file called router.jsx. And in the router file, we're going to be defining routes for flow router. So before we get to that, we actually need to add some packages to the project. 
So in uh, the directory here in terminal, just type meteor add react and then Kadira colon uh, react layout and Kadira colon flow dash router and hit enter. There we go. So we've got everything uh, added in here. I was having an issue with JetBrains IDEs and basically it was a conflict with OpenJDK. And so in order to resolve those, I've installed Oracle Java. And basically what was happening was when you start typing something, this auto suggestion box pops up and that was causing the program to hang. And so to resolve that, uh, what I had to do was add a repository to my system and I'm just going to search web update Java and you're going to go to the launchpad.net page and in here uh, just copy this uh, archive URL there and in terminal you can run sudo add apt repository and then the repository name and you can actually start connecting multiple commands together so sudo apt get update and the way you connect commands together is by using two ampersands between the commands and that basically says run command one and when that's done if it's successful run command two and if that's done run the next command which is going to be sudo apt get install oracle dash java 8 dash installer and so you're going to run that and that should resolve the issues uh, with JetBrains IDEs if you're having the same ones as I was uh, so let's get back to in here so let's start making some routes so the first thing we need to do is set up the router to be able to actually um, route to you know certain files and uh, routes. So to do this we're going to create the first route which we're going to type flow router dot route. This is the path that we're creating the route for and then you pass as the second parameter an object and that with a semicolon and you can name the route so this is going to be named home then put a comma and the action function can take params as uh, its argument Then we open that up and I'm going to reference here a function that we haven't yet uh, actually created but we're about to so the function name is going to be render view and then in here I'm going to create the object. So this is going to be uh, home. And this is uh, the React component that we're going to create. So basically, we have a function here that we need to create called render view, and we pass that a component. So uh, here we're going to create it uh, function render view and we're going to reference that object here as component and then we open it up and basically all you have to do is type uh, react dot sorry react layout dot render main layout and we're going to pass it a few parameters so header is going to be a header component that we need to create. Content is going to be the component we're passing into it. And then footer is going to be a footer component that we need to create. And then hit save. And this is all we need to do. Uh, this bit of code is going to render a header, a component, and a footer. So let's get started with the uh, with the main layout.
So we're telling it here to render this uh, React component and pass it these as parameters so we can actually reference uh, the these components uh, inside the main layout component uh, by typing this dot props dot header content and footer and we'll see this in action here in just a moment so in client I'm going to in components I'm going to create a new react class called main layout dot JSX and here basically we're going to get started with how to create react components so the first thing you need to do is name the component mine's going to be called main layout and we say that's equal to react dot create class and we open that up with brackets and curly brackets So uh, all we really need here is the render function, and that's all we're going to do at this point. So uh, type in render, and then in the render function, you're going to put return, and you're going to open up just regular brackets. And this is a bit odd, I know, um, but this is how it's done. So here we can actually print HTML, and it's going to uh, it's going to render what we tell it to. So we always need to wrap um, all elements under a parent container. So I wouldn't be able to say return two divs like this, two siblings. Uh, it wouldn't work. So we do need to wrap it. So here uh, we're going to to reference the uh, props that came in, and so. As an example, um, I'm going to add another prop here called log this, and it's just going to be a string. Um, this is a property, and I'm going to save that. So in the render function, you can access that uh, by typing console log, and then this dot props dot log this. And save that. And I'm going to go to the app here and I'm going to refresh it. And you're going to see two things happening. The first is that home is not defined. And that's because we haven't created the component yet, so we still need to do a bit of work in order for this to work. So in components, let's create a new file. Let's call this header.jsx. And I'm going to open it up by typing header equals react create class. Open that up as usual. And in the render function here, I'm just going to return a bit of bootstrap. Uh, so div class, uh, actually I'm just going to wrap that in a div first. Uh, so in this render function, you can't just type uh, div class equals, you know, whatever, because class is used in JavaScript. So we actually need to type class name. And then we can give it a class. So I'm just going to call it navbar, navbar default, and close that. And I'm just going to div class name equals container. Put a bootstrap container in there. And then div class name equals navbar brand actually this should be an a element and it's just gonna say uh, my site name like that so if we save that the header is now created so I'm now going to create the footer 
And the same thing would go for the footer, but I'm not going to put anything in here. I'm just going to have it return uh, a div. So footer equals react.createClass. We're going to open that up. I'm going to open the render function and return div like that. So now we need to create the home component. Uh, and the reason why is we've referenced home, header, and footer. We've got footer and header created. We still need this component, which we're passing in as home. So we need to create the home component. So I'm going to create a new directory here to keep things organized. And I'm going to call it home. And in that directory, I'm going to create a file called home.jsx. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to name the component home uh, react.createClass. Right now, I'm just going to render a uh, return div, actually h1. And it's going to say, hello world, and hit save. So if we come back here and refresh this page, we're going to start to see it take shape because we've created all the components that we're referencing. And so the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that it ran, it, let me open this up. So in the, where was it, uh, the main layout, I console log this dot props dot log this, which I passed into this class as a property. So that's basically what's happening. We're passing in components to the main layout components. So I would reference header, content, and footer in the very same way. Uh, except what we could do is if you want to render the content of a property, you put it in single curly brackets. So it's like Blaze, except you're not using uh, two uh, curly brackets, you're just using one and you just type it. So let's type this dot props dot header uh, this dot props dot uh, home or content rather. We're, we're referencing that here. Uh, we're setting it the property as content so we're going to reference it like that. And then the footer as well. So this dot props dot footer. We're going to save this and this is our main layout. So the header, uh, if I for instance made a route called uh, flow router dot route at slash page then opened up curly brackets here Let's name it uh, page, and the action is going to be render view, and let's say I had a component named this page. I would do that, and it would render that component into the main layout with the header, that component, and then the footer, and we're also passing this just to, to, uh, as a proof of concept, but I'm not going to do that. So now we've got this, but Bootstrap does not appear to be working, and I think maybe maybe I've forgotten to add Bootstrap here. I don't think it got uh, added. Maybe uh, in the last video, I know I added it. Maybe I canceled out of it uh, for some reason. So let's go ahead and get that added. So control C here. Meteor add TWBS colon uh, bootstrap and hit enter. All right. So now I'm going to run Meteor again. And the page refreshes automatically because it's Meteor. What we're going to do next is get into the, uh, the programming of this. So I'm going to close these because I no longer need them. 
And in server, I'm going to create a new directory called uh, collections. And in here, I'm going to create a new file. Uh, and I'm going to call this collection uh, posts. And so posts equals new manga new Mongo collection posts. And then I'm going to write posts dot allow insert uh, function return true update function return true and remove function oh, function return true. And this is going to allow us to insert, update, and remove from that collection. So uh, the posts are going to, uh, let's create a way to put the posts in first. So in the home page, uh, let's, actually I'm going to create a new component here called uh, insert post.jsx. So insert post is going to be the name. Uh, it's going to be equal to react.create class. And I'm going to basically render uh, some HTML uh, to put a post in to the database. And so I'm going to form, actually I don't need that. Uh, let's just use a text area. Uh, placeholder is going to be type a post. Name is going to be, actually let's just give it a class name. And we're going to put uh, form control and an ID of uh, post body. There. XML tag has empty body. All right. And then a button. So button class name. It's going to be button, button dot info, and it's going to say save post. So let's save that, and in the home component, let's render that. So let's just uh, insert post. There. Oh, right, I, I have to wrap it here. There. All right. Let's indent this so that it doesn't look too bad. And if we refresh this, we're going to see that our new component has been rendered. But if we uh, type stuff, it doesn't do anything right now. So let's have an insert to that collection over here. And how we do that is we're going to create a new uh, function here called insert to collection. And it's going to take event. And so once you start getting more functions in React components, uh, you need to separate them with a comma. And what we're going to do is we need to say on click 
and in curly braces type this and then the function name. So this is going to be insert to collection. And we're not passing anything to it, so you can leave out the, uh, the brackets here at the end. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, event, prevent, default. And then we're going to get the post body. So uh, content, actually I need to var content equals, then we can just use straight up uh, jQuery here to get post body. I'm going to console log content, make sure we're getting it. Oh, didn't mean to uh, copy that. There. So let's save that, come back here, refresh this. There we go. And so we are getting that content into that function. So from this point, it's uh, basically regular Meteor stuff. You're going to type posts, insert, and then, um, you know, content, content. So save that and refresh. And actually, to be able to... Uh, I am going to wrap this in a form element uh, just because it's there. So that we can hit enter in the text area and it will also submit it. So on submit, we're going to call this dot insert to collection. So we can actually just change this to type equals submit and remove this part here. And this button will also function as a means to insert into the collection. So if I come back here and refresh, let's make sure that gets into the collection. So this is a post to insert to the Collection. I'm going to hit enter. Oh, right, it's a text area, never mind. <laughs> and I'm going to save that, and it logs it out. And if I want to make sure that it uh, inserted successfully, I'm just going to, in the console log here, I'm going to uh, find and uh, let's just do that, fetch. And it did put it into the database with content there as the uh, as the key. So uh, let's actually extend that a bit further by adding date added. It's going to be new date. And if you want to be able to read it easier, you can do this. That's what I usually do. And it's going to uh, make it easier if you get like huge objects that you're putting into the collection. So I'm going to delete that console log now. We do not need that. So now we've got this working. Uh, it's a component to insert posts. But how can we get them out of the database? So over in our home component, I'm going to do a couple things. The first is going to be I'm going to add a property called mixins. Uh, put a colon and then uh, this. I'm going to type meteor react or react meteor data. So now we can create a new function and it's going to connect uh, meteor data to the, the component. And the function name is going to be get meteor data. We open it up, we do this. So uh, right now I'm going to just get all the posts and so I'm going to uh, variable posts equals posts 
find fetch. And then in here, we're going to return certain things to the render function. So I'm going to just type return and then open up curly brackets here. I'm going to return posts as posts. I'm going to save this. And now what we can do is we can access that from the render function by, for instance, uh, let's create a variable here called all posts and is equal to this dot data dot posts. I'm going to console log all posts. I'm going to save that. I'm going to refresh this page. And it's going to log all the posts which right now this is the only one we have. So uh, that's awesome. How do we get it into here? Uh, well, let's, uh, let's actually go back to insert post here. I'm going to create an input field. Uh, class name is going to be form control. The ID is going to be user. And the placeholder is just going to say user name. Let's end that. Let's put a line break there. I'm also going to put a line break down here. I'm going to also handle this. So uh, var user equals, and then just straight up jQuery from here, uh, the ID of user dot val. I'm going to insert that to the collection as well. So user equals user, and then a comma. So we now have three fields that will get entered into the collection. I'm going to remove uh, the current one that we've got because it doesn't have this uh, necessary information in it uh, to render it. So I'm just going to type posts, uh, find, fetch. I'm going to get that ID. I'm going to say posts remove ID that and enter. Now if I run posts find fetch it finds nothing because we've just removed it. So uh, let's create a component to uh, render the post. So uh, in the home directory under components I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call it post dot or just single post dot jsx. So as usual uh, post equals react dot create class. Open it up here. And uh, what we're going to do at this point is something a little different because the, each post that's rendered needs to be uh, rendered with this single post. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass the uh, post ID as a, as a property to this function. So let's just uh, type render and uh, let post ID equals and then the post ID. This props post ID. Now something I like to do if we're passing multiple properties and they're always passed in as this props and then the name of it, what you can do is you can actually uh, do this. So just wrap your variables in uh, these curly brackets. And uh, let's say I also had a post image and whatnot. And this would say basically uh, each one of these is equal to this dot props dot whatever it is. So it's uh, really useful when you're using multiple ones. 
and right now I'm just going to console log uh, post ID and then the post ID and return div. Well, there. So what we're going to do is we need to map the posts. Actually, let's uh, get to that after. Let's uh, add a couple tasks in here so that we can actually pull them out and you know see what we're working with. So username Nick, this is my first post. Hit save. And uh, I should set it to automatically reset these to, uh, to default empty when uh, we save it. Uh, this is another post. And then something you'll really enjoy. So now I've got three posts. And I want to pull them out down here. So now to render posts, we need to create uh, a couple methods here in the home file. So one of them is going to be called uh, get posts, and we're going to pass it an ID. And the other one is going to be called render posts. So what we're going to do is the get post is just going to return uh, all of the posts. Actually, I don't need to pass it an ID. Uh, so get posts, let's just do return posts find fetch. And then from here in render posts, we need to return this get posts. And then we're going to type map. And we're going to call it post here. And put a little fancy arrow to an object. We can end that with a semicolon. And we're going to return the post component with the post being sent as an attribute or a property. So uh, let's end that with a semicolon as well. And what we need to do is in here in the main body I'm going to put uh, a line break there and then I'm going to call this render posts. So let me have a quick look over here, make sure it's all good. It looks all good. So let's go back here and what we need to do is in post, ah, see there we go. Uh, in posts, I'm just returning this. So uh, let's do class name is uh, card and then in here Let's go with uh, an H3 tag and uh, here, see this property? That's what I'm expecting to get. And so uh, the post is the only property that I'm setting over here. So I'm going to, in curly brackets here, I'm going to put post uh, user. And then in a paragraph tag, I'm going to put post content save. And so to recap, what we're doing is uh, we are mapping the results of this function um, to basically this. And this is uh, a new way we can actually pass, uh, pass each item from these results over as post to this little block here, which returns the component uh, and we pass the post through 
with the property name of post. So in the post uh, component, we can reference the entire post as this from this props. So if I go back here and refresh, I've got three there, and this is not working. What have I done wrong? So I'm going to pass the ID along as uh, a key property here. So post dot underscore ID. And the reason why it wasn't rendering the posts is because I forgot to add the uh, brackets here so that it runs this function. So if I save that, go back here and refresh, I'm going to see this. Now I'm going to, let's say, uh, add a few of these here. And the great thing about React is when something changes, it scans the document, and you'll see over here uh, React IDs, and it performs a diff of the current content versus the new content and only rewrites the portions that need to get rewritten. Uh, so it's a lot faster, and that's why it's better to scale using React than Blaze. Uh, second post of mine, which will be a bit longer. So I'm going to style this up a bit and I'll be right back. All right guys, so this is getting closer to done. Uh, we now have a working way to insert posts and also view the posts here. One thing you'll notice is that we've got posts by two different people. So how uh, Meteor should handle this and React and Flow Router, we're going to modify our home component a little bit to be able to use a different route. So I'm going to go into my router file here, Flow Router, and uh, let's name the route Posts by and then uh, user. So the colon here basically means that what follows is going to be the name of a variable and we can use that variable by accessing params. So what I'm going to do is name the route uh, posts and the action, and we're going to pass params to the action, is going to be render view. I'm going to reuse the home component here, but I'm also going to pass it in with uh, user uh, property, and that's going to be equal to uh, params.user. And so now I'm going to close this component and end that with a semicolon. I actually need to, uh, there, that got a little displaced there. Silly issue. Uh, when we create new routes, we need to type flow router dot route. All right. So what we need to do now is uh, we need to make this a conditional if, uh, if we're on, basically, in the router, we're passing a user property here, but we're not here. So we can use this to identify if uh, if we're on this route. So what I'm going to do is here in the git posts uh, method, I'm going to say if uh, this dot props dot user, we're going to return posts find where the user is equal to this dot props dot user. I'm going to fetch those. Else, we're just going to return all the posts. So if I go back here and refresh this,
I'm going to see when I view posts by Nick that these are the only results I get. And when I view posts by Pete, uh, these are the only posts I get. And still accessing the home page, I will get all of the posts. And so you can see how you can really reuse components here to, uh, to be able to uh, serve conditional data. Now, that's basically all Meteor is. It's very simple and straightforward. Uh, using with React and Flow Router, I really recommend it. Uh, it's much faster. The develop, I mean, it's basically quicker to do everything. It's quicker to develop, it's quicker to browse, and it's, it makes your app faster in general. So I hope you guys found this video informative. I know it's a bit longer than the other ones, and so hopefully, uh, you know, the next few videos will be shorter. I think they will. And I'm actually going to provide this code to you guys uh, through GitHub. So right now uh, we're going to be combining a bit of what we've been doing. So I'm going to go to github.com. I'm going to create a new repository here. And I'm going to call it Meteor React Tutorial. And let's initialize it with a readme file and then uh, you know all the usual stuff so from right in the directory here type git init git remote add origin oh, I need to paste that URL here I'm gonna close webstorm so that we can get rid of the dot idea directory okay so we can just use uh, the regular rm uh, rf idea there and then we're going to run uh, git ignore idea forward slash git add a git commit m uh, the message is going to be uh, example meteor react stuff and git push origin master there we go if I refresh this we should see yeah so here is the entire uh, meteor project that we just created uh, you can find it at github.com slash nickgermain slash meteor dash react dash tutorial. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you guys found it informative, uh, if a bit long. Hopefully the next uh, set of videos should be a bit shorter. Hey guys, thanks for joining me again. In this video we're going to be discussing Apache 2, uh, but we're more going to focus on Apache 2 PHP and MySQL. So we are in essence going to configure and set up a uh, LAMP stack through this video and the next video. This video is going to be more of a beginner's point to, to actually install everything necessary and get a basic configuration set up. And in the next video we're going to be going through more advanced uh, configurations that you might want to do. So pull up terminal and install the necessary packages. So sudo apt get install patchy2 php5 mysql server uh, php5 common and that should do it for now. So hit yes. Uh, it is going to download about 40 megabytes of data so this may take a little bit of time depending on your connection. So Apache is the server that runs uh, quite a bit of the internet and it basically allows you to host websites and stuff. So if I were uh, working with my server through SSH or something, uh, I would be doing this to install Apache and whatnot on it to be able to get it to actually serve web pages and uh, content.
So that's why you would uh, use Apache. Now you might just be uh, you might just be playing around, uh, you know, with uh, creating websites, and you find you need to. Uh, I found actually recently that uh, you can't use less.js um, without you know going through the server and the domain and stuff. If you just load it up, if you create a basic HTML file that uses less and the less JS file uh, you can't just open it at like file colon slash 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 and then the the file path you're actually gonna have to set up Apache and serve it as a web page on localhost so with MySQL which is another uh, SQL server that this is more commonly used with PHP and uh, it's it, for good reason I mean it's good uh, it's just not not my preference. I really like MongoDB, and uh, MySQL is more compatible with PHP from what I understand. And so you might use this if you are hosting a WordPress blog or if you're doing uh, PHP MySQL development or if you're maintaining something. So the MySQL service needs a uh, root password. So the username is root, and the password is going to be whatever you set it to. Uh, so I'm going to set it to this. You're going to have to retype it. And I think that's the only uh, user interaction that this is going to require. Should just return me to the prompt in a moment, and then we'll get to uh, how to start uh, Apache and, and PHP and whatnot. All right, so now that we've got all that installed and uh, set up and everything, what you're going to do is start the Apache 2 service. And so just type sudo system control start Apache 2 and right now we should just be able to go to localhost uh, on no port and we'll see the default Apache 2 directory or web page so the first thing we're gonna do and you're gonna see why let me open up file manager here I'm going to show you where Apache 2 serves the files from default. So we're going to go to other locations, computer, var, so from the root directory it's going to be var, www, html. This file is the page we see right here. We see that root owns it, and so if we were to edit the file and save it, we wouldn't be able to. We'd have to run everything as sudo or root, and that's bad, so we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, make a few configuration changes. The first one, let's go with sudo chone nick nick uh, var www. Actually, we need to do that recursively. There we go. Now let's have a look. Make sure this went through. Good stuff. Now the second change we need to make is within the configuration file of Apache itself. So let's uh, change directory into etc Apache 2 and we're looking for apache2.conf so run sudo nano apache2.conf and that's actually the wrong thing so we're going to come back to this file later we actually need envvars so uh, let's go sudo nano envvars what we're going to do is change the run user to our user and the run group to our group Control O, Control X. Now you actually need to restart the server. So if I were to refresh here, um, if we had uh, any major changes in configuration, they wouldn't take effect until we restart. And we'll learn that in the next video when we actually set up virtual hosts and whatnot. Uh, you'll see they won't work until we restart it. So sudo system control restart Apache 2. It's going to restart this. Now, basically, what we've got right now is the ability 
to edit this file. So the first thing I'm going to do is delete this file. Now I'm going to create a new file. So let's go, let's just open gedit here for, actually, let's uh, use nano. So uh, var www.html, and we're going to, since we actually have write access in here, we no longer need to use sudo. So uh, just nano index.php. And just to confirm that PHP is working, we're just going to uh, do this, control O, X, and then refresh. Why is that not working? Let's try this. There we go. I got, uh, I, I, I forget sometimes with uh, PHP how the info command is written. I think it's uh, PHP. I think it's just this actually. Yeah, so if I refresh, yeah, okay, so there's no underscore. For some reason, I keep thinking there's an underscore in it. So every time I do this, I always try once, fail once, and the second time I get it. So this is the uh, output of a configuration check, I guess, for PHP and the server itself. It'll give you all sorts of information about, um, about PHP and the server and the environment and whatnot. So that's uh, how to set up PHP. Uh, MySQL and uh, and Apache. It's uh, it. I don't know. Like people think it's this huge thing to be able to configure a server, and really, it's that simple. Uh, you just install a few packages, uh, start the service, and you're good to go. Um, so yeah, in the next video, we're going to be going over some uh, some MySQL stuff, uh, advanced Apache two configuration stuff, and uh, that's about it. So thanks for watching this. I hope you guys managed to get your own uh, web server set up uh, with this video. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, I wanted to take a brief moment here and touch briefly on the hosts file on a Linux system and what that is and what it does. Uh, because we're going to be using it in the next video and uh, you know for the next few videos we're going to have to configure some things in our hosts file. So to put it simply, and I'm not going to get too much into networking right now as that's what we're going to be doing uh, later on in this course. So for right now basically when I type in google.com what my computer does is first it checks if there's any uh, specified routes in my system that tells it where google.com is. If not, then it goes out to the internet and looks for stuff. So what we're going to be doing with the hosts file is intercepting uh, requested domains from our machine. So let's go ahead and open up terminal and I'm going to show you guys what I mean. So we're going to cd into the etc directory here. And I'm going to type sudo nano hosts. So there's a hosts file in the etc directory, and we need to go in there and edit it. Now, we've already set this route up for the next video. It's app.localhost, and that's what we're going to be using to deploy our Meteor application. But right now, I want to show you guys how this works. So the first uh, element in the line is an IP address. That's the IP address for, for our case. It's going to be our local machine. And so the local IP address for this machine, for any machine, for your machine, is going to be 127.0.0.1. And that's going to tell whatever we type in next uh, to go to localhost and then Apache is going to pick it up from there and it's going to do stuff with it. So I'm going to type google.com in here and I'm going to save this and now when I try to go to google.com it's going to go to my Apache uh, default page which is stored at www or var slash www slash html and the main file in there. Now what I could do from this point would be to configure a virtual host to handle google.com 
uh, as its own virtual host and in order to serve up a specified web page from my local machine. Uh, we're not going to get to that right now. We will in a few videos from now. Uh, now I'm going to remove this because I don't want Google to always be redirected to my local machine. What I'm going to do is create uh, a subdomain of localhost and so it's going to be subdomain.localhost. I'm going to save the file here. Now if I go to HTTP subdomain dot localhost it's also going to redirect to the main HTML directory. So this is going to be necessary for the next few videos. We are going to be uh, redirecting certain localhost addresses uh, and subdomains to our local machine and then we're going to get Apache to intercept them and to serve up content based on that. So I hope you guys found this video informative. Uh, in the next video we're going to be installing our Meteor application. Hey guys, welcome back. So my desktop looks a bit different because I accidentally destroyed my Ubuntu partition. Well, it wasn't an accident. I guess it was a mistake. I was uh, reformatting a partition to put something else onto it, and I didn't think that the partition I was reformatting was the one that had Ubuntu on it. I thought Ubuntu was on a different partition, and so I completely lost uh, the entire installation. And so I've installed Zorin OS 11, which is based on Ubuntu 15.10, so it's the same version that we were using when we started, and that means that everything's going to be the same. Uh, the only thing is it's going to look a bit different. So in this video we're going to be going over how to deploy our Meteor app to an Apache 2 server. And so the first thing we need to do is uh, open up terminal here. So control alt T and then change directory into the projects directory. And then what we need to do is we need to build the Meteor app. So you're going to issue the command Meteor build and then where it builds to. So this is going to be one di directory up into do app. Alright guys, so that took a little longer than I expected. It does take a bit of time because it's compiling the entire project into, uh, in, into its final form. So what you're going to see is that if you change directory up one level that we've now got a to do app directory. So I'm going to change directories again into there. And we've got a resulting tar.gz file. So what we need to do is copy this to our uh, Apache uh, HTML directory. So just type cp to do dot tar dot gz and then where we're putting it, which is here. Now if you change directory to there, you'll see that you've got to do dot tar gz dot there. So what we need to do is extract this. So you're going to run the tar command like this. Tar and then the first uh, parameter is going to be dash xvf and then the file. So tar dot or sorry to do dot tar dot gz is going to extract it. So when you run ls again you should see a bundle directory. So we're going to go into there. Now what we need to do next is to install Node.js. Uh, you won't be able to install from the repositories as the version that's included in the repositories is node uh, 0.10.25 and the version that we actually need is 0.10.29 or higher. So what we're going to do is go add a specific package. Uh, this is the URL. I will include it in, the, uh, in, in this lecture. Uh, what you're going to do is just uh, if you go to the PPA here, uh, you'll see Trusty, Utopic, Vivid, and Wiley. And we're on version Wiley, so it's grayed out. But if you're not yet, just click whichever one makes sense for you according to your system. And then scroll down a bit here. 
and click on uh, the most recent uh, package. It's going to take you to this page, which I was on before, and then click 64-bit uh, dev package to download it and click keep. Uh, now you're going to open this and it should open up the software center. Uh, we're going to be manually in installing this. I've already got it installed and so it's not going to let me, well it would let me reinstall it if I wanted to. I'm not going to do that. Uh, basically once it opens up it's going to prompt you that uh, uh, an older version is included in your system's repositories and it's recommended that you use that version instead and only install this if uh, you, you know what it is basically. Uh, you can just disregard that. Uh, this is the package we need so you're going to see an install button here on the right. Just click that and let it install. Uh, once it's done you can close this program here come back to terminal and from the bundle directory you actually if you run the ls command this is what the structure of the directory looks like the main.js file is going to be of interest here in a few minutes but for right now just change directory into programs slash server and run sudo npm install and what this is going to do is it's going to reinstall node.js fibers for our meteor application so now uh, the app is ready to go, but we've got to configure a few other things. So the first thing we need to make sure is running is Mongo. So just type sudo system control start mongodb. And we can confirm that it's running by going to localhost at port 27017. And we'll get this message, and that basically means uh, that it's working and, and running. So what we need to do is create our user for our database that our app is going to use. So our application is going to use a database we'll create called app. So what we need to do is connect to the Mongo shell to create a user for that. So just type Mongo. It's going to take you in and it's going to automatically connect you to a test database. We need to be using our database. So type use and the name of our database. And now we're going to create our user. So to do that, type db.createUser. Uh, that's a capital U in user. Open up brackets and inside that some curly brackets and then type name and in quotations your username, comma, pwd, and then the password you're going to use and then roles and in here you need to open up uh, square brackets and inside that some curly brackets type roll and in here type read write as the value uh, the w in write is capitalized and then db and then the name of the db uh, so it should look like this um, Make sure your syntax is correct. Uh, it's very easy to miss commas or uh, brackets when you're working in the Mongo shell. When you're ready, just hit enter. And it should create a user and it should tell you that it successfully created the user. For me, it gives me an error because I've already got that user created. So now we can exit it here and we're back into our shell. So now we need to configure Apache. Actually, first, let me, uh, we need to do one more thing with Mongo. So type sudo nano forward slash etc. And it's going to be mongodb.conf. We've got to turn authorization or authentication on here. So just come down to this line that says auth equals true and just remove the hash symbol. Control O to save, Control X. To exit. Now we're going to restart MongoDB. So system control restart MongoDB. Good stuff. Now we've got to configure Apache and this is going to be the uh, the point of the video I guess uh, is this is uh, an advanced configuration of what you can do with, uh, with Apache and it's not going to be all-encompassing. You may need to use uh, some different modules or uh, you, you know with Apache than what you need with Meteor. If you're 
deploying a Meteor app, this should work flawlessly for you, but this gives you an idea of the fact that there are different modules that you can enable and disable in Apache if you need them. So we need to enable three modules for Apache to handle the proxy because we're going to be running our app on port 58080, but we don't want users to have to, uh, you know, remember the port number and we definitely don't want the port number visible in the URL and so this is what we need to configure for Apache. So to do this type sudo a2 nmod proxy and then sudo a2 nmod proxy underscore HTML And then sudo a to n mod proxy underscore http. Now, once you've got this done, we actually need to create the virtual host. And so, what a virtual host is is let's say you want to run, um, you know, six different websites in their own directories at six different domain names. So let's say you have six domain names pointing to this, or actually let's say you've got one domain name pointing to the server, but you want to use subdomains, which is uh, the portion before the domain. So you could have like app.yourdomain.com, app2.yourdomain.com, and here's how you would set up those. So what we need to do is uh, go into etc slash Apache2, and here you can see that we've got a sites available directory and we're going to create a file in there. So just type sudo nano uh, sites available and I'm just going to call it app.conf. And we've got a blank file here and we need to create the virtual host. So I'm going to uh, explain what I'm doing as I'm doing it. So we're going to open up the element which is virtual host in its camel case, we're going to specify the port that it's listening on, which by default for Apache is port 80. That's the default port for web traffic, and that's what you should be using. And then we close off that element. Now, the first thing we're going to do is assign a server name, and this basically tells the virtual host uh, what, uh, what name it should be listening to. So it's listening on port 80. And now we're going to tell it that this configuration is for the domain app.localhost. And then we need to type proxy requests space off. We'll jump down a few lines and we're going to configure the proxy. So it's kind of like HTML, you're opening elements and typing things in. Uh, so we're going to type order, deny, comma, allow, no space between deny, comma, and allow, and then allow from all. And then the final bit in here, we need to actually configure the proxy and, and tell it what it's listening for on which ports and, and whatnot. So to do this, open up a location element and the location is going to be a forward slash. This means it's the root uh, of this domain. So we should be able to access app.localhost um, and it should work great. So we need two lines in here. Uh, the first is going to be proxy pass and then what it's passing this to which is going to be localhost at port 58080 and a forward slash. And then proxy pass reverse, it's going to be the exact same thing. And then hit control O to save. We're done with this. Apache's all configured to translate localhost at port 58080 to the URL app.localhost. So save it and exit. So now that we've got the, the virtual host configured, we can actually add this site uh, or enable it. And to do that, you just type sudo a2n site. 
and then the name of the site. In this case, it's app because uh, it's everything that's uh, prefixed from the extension. So, so everything before the dot .conf. So I'm going to type app. So now that we've got all the modules enabled, uh, the virtual host configured and enabled, now we can restart the Apache 2 service. So system control, restart, uh, Apache 2. Now we're going to get back over to our HTML directory. So cd to var www.html bundle. And what we're going to do is, um, in order to run the Meteor application, we need to set uh, a few environment variables. And you can do this from terminal. Uh, you can just type export and then the name of the variable. So let's just create a variable called myVar equals and then the value. So if you're using digits uh, or characters, you don't have to put quotes, but if you're putting a string, uh, so spaces in there, you've got to put them in quotes. So this is a variable and I've just created that variable and then I would be able to echo that out in the shell by typing that. So rather than set the variables like this though, because the downside is that as soon as I close this terminal, uh, all those environment variables are lost. And so if I need to restart my app, say in a week or so, I don't want to have to retype all the variables. So what we're going to do is create a shell script to do this for us. So type in uh, nano and then in documents. So in my home directory in documents, I'm going to create env.sh. So the first thing we need is the crunch bang. And we need to tell it uh, what, what type of file it is. So user bin sh, this is going to tell it to run with bash. And then we can just start creating our variables. So we need three. The first one we're going to configure is port. And we're going to set that to 58080. So that's the port that this Meteor application will run on. The next one is the root URL. So we need to set this uh, as to what the URL is going to be that the app is running at. So in this case, it's app.localhost. And then one more, we need to add a Mongo URL. And this is going to be a URL using the MongoDB protocol. And so the way we type that is uh, MongoDB colon slash slash, the name of the user account of MongoDB, and then the password of that MongoDB user account. And then we put an at symbol. So the, so the first two bits of information is the username and the password, and then the host name another colon and we're going to specify the port here and then a forward slash and the name of the database which in our case is app and this is literally all we need so what i'm going to do is hit control o to save and control x now what you're going to have to do so let's say i need to restart the app in a week i won't need to uh, retype all those variables and the values for them, I'll just have to rerun the script. So how we run the script is uh, normally you would run a shell script by typing sh and then the location of the script. But in order for the, the variables that we're exporting in that script to be integrated into the environment that we're working in, we're going to use the source command. So just type source and then the location of the script. And then you should be able to echo uh, for instance, port, and it should print out the port, and it does. So what we can do at this point is run the application, and we should be good to go. So to do that, just type node.js space main.js. And I'm getting an error because I might have this uh, running already, so I'm going to kill all uh, node. Uh, Node.js actually. I'm going to try that again. So Node.js main. And no errors. So I should be able to go to the localhost port 58080 
and I should reach the to-do app, and I do. But aside from that, I should also be able to go to app.localhost, and that works as well. Now, this will work, but as soon as I exit out of here, you're going to see that the app is unavailable. And that's because when you exit out of a Node.js uh, shell um, instance, basically it stops the app. So in order to run this outside of, uh, of this instance of Node.js, you need to install an NPM application called Forever. So to do that, type sudo npm install dash g and the dash g uh, on the npm install basically all it is is it tells it that we're going to globally install the following application uh, normally if i didn't include that dash g that would just install forever to the current node instance which is our meteor application and i wouldn't be able to use it elsewhere in the future if i needed to unless i installed it there as well so I'm going to put the dash G so that it's globally installed. I can use it anywhere. And then just type forever. And it's going to, you know, check through the, the package list of NPM. And it should install it. And when it does, you should see an output like this. So uh, now that we've got forever installed, what you can do is type forever start main.js and we get this notification here it says it's processing the file main.js which means we should be able to access the app and you'll notice that we're outside of that instance in terminal so if I were to close this terminal completely the app would still function as normal and so that was an example of how you would uh, deploy a Meteor application using Apache 2 and uh, the proxy pass module in Apache 2 in order to serve the uh, application through Apache and do some internal uh, translations between the ports and, and the address and whatnot. Uh, and, and again, th this was a look at uh, how much more advanced Apache 2 can get. Uh, there are some other things uh, that I'll touch on right quick. So uh, if you are, for instance, using WordPress and you want to enable uh, like pretty URLs, I, I, they call them permalinks. If you want to enable permalinks, you'll have to have uh, a mod rewrite module enabled. And so how you would do that is uh, sudo a to n mod rewrite. And it's now enabled, and to activate the new configuration, you just need to reload the Apache 2 service uh, using system control. It's, it says service Apache 2 restart, but as I covered a, a few videos ago, we're using system control, and uh, I, I would recommend using system control for that. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. Thanks for watching. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me again. In this video we're going to be going over installing and configuring PHP MyAdmin. So first, what is PHP MyAdmin? Uh, well, it's easily explained as a graphical interface for uh, interacting with MySQL databases uh, that you can access in your browser. So the way to install it, it is in the official repositories of Ubuntu and should be in all Ubuntu derivatives. So just open up your terminal and type in uh, sudo apt get install php my admin so we're going to set uh, a mysql uh, admin password uh, you guys I, I have had this package installed already so you guys may get uh, another prompt asking for a password i would just use the same one creating a configuration file there so uh, we're going to now edit uh, the Apache 2 configuration file and I believe that is uh, just apache2.conf and it is okay so sudo nano 
uh, etc apache2 apache2.conf. And in here, just go to the bottom of the file. And write include etc slash php myadmin slash apache two dot conf and then control O to save, control uh, X to exit, and then restart Apache two. I got the uh, path wrong, I believe. One sec. Is there a PHP? Okay, so let's uh, ls uh, etc php my admin apache conf. Uh, let's make sure I included the correct file. Uh, so in here, at the very bottom, it was etc slash php my admin slash Apache. I don't think it was Apache 2. I think it was just Apache. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was. Okay, that was the problem. Uh, it, I included the wrong file. So uh, once you include the correct file, uh, restart Apache 2. And if we open up a web browser, we should be able to now access and log into the administrative uh, panel. So localhost php my admin. And it's uh, remembering my password from a long time ago. That's actually wrong. All right. Yes, let's update that password. So now that we're in here, uh, you guys are probably used to using this, you know, if you've used servers in the past that use cPanel. Uh, cPanel uses PHP MyAdmin as the uh, MySQL uh, management tool, I guess. So uh, basically, you can create a new database here, uh, call it MyDB, hit create. And then we can, cre let's just create a users table and have four rows. Then uh, let's name the rows ID, username, email, and password. That's going to be 255. So an integer limit is 255. Uh, Firecar, I believe, is 999. It might be more than that, actually. Generally, this is what I stick with, though. The password is going to be... We do MD5, even though it's not great. Uh, let's just go Varkar. We can probably change it later. Uh, AI means auto increment. And that basically means, let's say I add a user. I'm not going to specify an ID number. It's automatically going to assign to the number 1. And then the next user it creates is going to be assigned to the number 2, and so on and so forth. So we don't need to specify uh, you know, ID numbers for each one, they will automatically be assigned. And I mean, this is straight run of the mill PHP my admin stuff. Uh, I'm not doing a tutorial so much into that because that's, uh, I, I don't think it's, you know, necessary enough. Uh, but I, I will give you guys a heads up on a few things. So uh, you can browse tables through here, you can create a new table uh, in the table. Uh, you're automatically going to be put to this, uh, and uh, you just click over to Structure to see the current columns to add or delete uh, columns. Uh, let me, you can either use uh, the SQL, and you can like uh, write your own, like insert into users, uh, and they even have these uh, helpers down here for you. Uh, you can search through the database. I've never done this. I've actually found with PHP my admin that the search functionality is limited. And so I, uh, what was it called? Adminer? 
there's another one that's uh, that's really good at search, but not so great at everything that PHP my admin is. Uh, you can just go to insert here, and I'll show you. I'm going to leave this blank. I'm going to insert a user, and then a password. I should be able to turn this into MD5 in here. And hit go. Now, if you go to browse, here's where you can actually browse the table's data. So right now we've got one entry, and you'll see the ID was automatically assigned as one. Uh, you can export your database. So if you're switching hosts or uh, servers, let's say, you would need to export your database. You can just do this, hit go. It's going to uh, download the... Actually, that just downloaded the table. If you go to the database and go to export, it's going to... Uh, export the entire database as an SQL format or a CSV, PDF, you got all these options here. Uh, and to import the database, you would just uh, make sure you're on your database uh, or table if you just wanted to insert a table. And then you just browse for the file and it, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can drop the table, you can rename it, you can copy it. Uh, and it's pretty much just all standard stuff. So that's how to get set up with PHP My Admin using an Apache uh, web server on Ubuntu. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. So let's create a virtual host. And I'm going to explain this uh, as I do it. In the previous video, when we deployed our Meteor application, we created a virtual host for it. And so this is kind of a follow-up to show you how uh, a basic virtual host configuration would look. Uh, because with the Meteor virtual host, we uh, had to omit certain information that would normally be in a static website's virtual host, and we had to add stuff in. So let's go ahead and get to creating a virtual host. So I'm going to open up Terminal here. And I'm going to change directory first into my HTML directory and I'm going to create a new directory called site1 and another one called site2 and if I list the directories we now see that I have a site1 and site2 and each, in each one of these I'm going to put an HTML file so nano uh, let's go site1 index.html and in here I'm just going to type this is our first site located at site one, whoa, dot localhost. Control O and Control X. And I'm going to do the same thing uh, in the site two directory. And I'm just going to close that. And we're not going to use any uh, HTML markup or anything. This is just going to be to show you guys uh, how it's going to work. So let's go over to our Apache's directory. So that's in the etc directory, Apache2. And I'm going to create two files in here uh, in the sites available directory. And so the first one I'm going to create is sites available. Uh, site1.conf and so what we need to do is open up virtual host and I missed the capital V so virtual host uh, at any web address on port 80 this is going to listen to to try and find our uh, site here. So the first thing we need is a server name and this is going to act as uh, the URL or the domain. So if I was going to point example.com to this server, to the IP address of this server, and then once uh, a request, say if I go into a browser and go to example.com, what happens would be that the request reaches the server and then it parses all these enabled websites uh, to get further information about where the site is stored and even, uh, you know, if you're using modules for it, you can do that in a virtual host as well. For right now, it's just going to be site1.localhost and then we set a document root and this is an absolute file path into our 
uh, document's root. So in this case, it's in our HTML directory, and it's at uh, a subdirectory called site one. And I'm gonna control O to save this. Control, uh, actually, oh, I gotta do this as sudo. Uh, so let's run that previous command with administrative privileges, and I'm going to write it out again. So virtual host at any web address on port 80, and then we have to close it. Uh, the first one is server name, that's going to tell it basically uh, the name of the site, or the domain, or a subdomain it's located at, or the subdomain we want to use for it, and then the document root is where the files are located. And then I can just control O and control X. And then I'm going to do the same thing for uh, site 2. So sudo nano sites available and site2.conf. So as you can see it's all the same. The only difference is going to be that we're going to reference site 2 in both the server name and the document root. It's going to be at fire www html site 2. So I'm going to save this and exit and we actually need to go into the hosts file uh, to create that internal route uh, to come to localhost and so what we need to do is run sudo nano hosts and that is in the etc directory uh, but I'm in the Apache directory so uh, sudo nano one directory up in a file called hosts so you'll see the app.localhost which we created in the last video and this is going to be site1.localhost and site2.localhost. And so the hosts file on a Linux system is basically just a way to uh, create your own records of uh, redirection and whatnot and, uh, you know, different hosts to resolve by different uh, domains or URLs. So I'm going to save this and exit. And I'm going to start the Apache service. Actually, what I've got to do is uh, sudo a2n site. We've got to enable the site. And then we need to restart the service. So system control restart Apache 2. And if I open up a web browser, we should be able to see uh, the different routes actually in effect. So let's go to HTTP site1.localhost. And it says this is our first site located at site one. And if I change this to site two dot localhost, you'll see that it's the second virtual host site. And so if I were to go into uh, where's that? Fire www html. Here you'll see what we've got going on, and so you can have as many websites in here as your uh, disk space permits, and you can serve up each at its own uh, domain name. So that was a, a brief uh, video about what a virtual host is and does. I hope you guys found it informative. So now what we're going to do is set up a WordPress installation on top of our Apache 2 environment. And so the first thing that we're going to need to do is actually go grab the WordPress uh, 
zip file from wordpress.org and then we can extract it and put it into our HTML directory. So just go to wordpress.org and click download WordPress. You might have a different version here if uh, if you're watching this you know off in the future somewhere. Once it's complete just open up your file manager and it should have gone to downloads and just right click it and uh, extract here. And when we go in here, we want to make sure that we're copying all these files and actually the, the directory containing all these files. So I'm going to copy this directory here that I just created. And I'm going to go to computer uh, in my var directory, www, html, and I'm going to drop it right here. Now we need to create a virtual host for the WordPress directory. So let's open up terminal and let's uh, go into our Apache 2 directory sites available now first thing I'm going to do is enable a module so that uh, the WordPress installation will be able to use pretty URLs or permalinks. So we need to enable uh, mod rewrite and how we do that is uh, through sudo's uh, or through Apache's a2n mod command. So sudo a2n mod rewrite. I've already got it enabled but you guys should see a confirmation there. So now let's create our virtual host for our WordPress installation. So uh, sudo nano wordpress.conf. As always, we open up the virtual host and we close it down here. Now we need to give it a server name. And so we're just going to use wordpress.localhost. localhost and most of Apache is camel case by the way so there's a capital letter at the beginning of each word in a directive and so server name right here that's a directive uh, it's, think of it like in programming if you set a variable um, that's essentially what's going on here except it's not called a variable it's called a directive so the next thing we need to do is set the document root and this should look exactly the same as it did in the last video. Uh, we're just going to point it to a different directory. And now we actually need to configure uh, some things. So open up a directory element and just put a forward slash here. So we're going to configure the root directory first. And we're going to put options Follow, oh, follow sim links and then allow override all and then we need to configure the directory of a WordPress installation so directory var www html WordPress and then close that directory element down here and so we're going to allow it to follow sim links uh, we're gonna allow it to override URLs and we're gonna uh, basically order allow and deny and so I'm not gonna go over too much what all of this does but this is the basic configuration for uh, mod rewrite in a virtual host so options indexes follow sim links
And we're actually also going to add an option for multi views as well. Down here, we're going to type allow override all. And then order allow, comma, deny. And finally, allow from all. So this is going to make sure that HT access files work in the rewriting. And we'll have a look at uh, custom HT access rewriting uh, here in the next few videos somewhere. So let's save this and then exit. Now let's enable the site, sudo a2n site, WordPress. Now we restart Apache using system control. It failed. Let's have a look at why it would fail. So system control status Apache 2.service. We must have got something wrong. Valid command options. Interesting. Let's see. Oh. Okay, I think that was the only issue there. Let's try restarting again, and we're good to go. So let's uh, go edit our hosts file. So sudo nano hosts. And we're going to create another redirection here internally to our system. And it's going to be wordpress.localhost. Uh, save and exit. And then we should be able to go to wordpress.localhost. and start setting up the server. Now, actually, we're going to have to create the database first. So let's go to localhost uh, slash phpMyAdmin and just log in here with the same information that you uh, created in uh, one of the previous videos there about phpMyAdmin. And just hit new. We're going to create a new database. I'm going to call it WP1 and hit create. And that's all we need to do in here. So on the WordPress installation, just uh, go through it graphically. And I'm going to show you how to do it manually in a moment. So the database name is WP1. The username, this is going to be the, uh, the information for the MySQL user that we created when we set up MySQL. So in this case, it's root. Uh, and the MySQL password. One sec. I actually used a, a password here that, that I used for some other things. So I'm going to mask that here by using uh, the password type. Submit. Can't create the WP config file, uh, so I'm going to have to create it manually. And after that, we can run the install. So just come back here to the HTML directory. And in here, there should be a WP config sample. Uh, basically, we'll look at that in a second. For right now, I'm going to create. Uh, wp-config.php. I'm going to open this with a uh, text editor. Paste that in here. Hit save. Get out of there now. We should be good to run the install. So this site title is going to be uh, next new site. Username, let's create a username here. Password, I'm going to copy this because I'm not going to put it in when we log in. And my email. And 
It's going to take a few moments to do, but it should return with a success message in just a moment. There we go. I'm going to save that password actually. Let's go log in. And as you can see, we've got a fully functioning WordPress site installed on our Apache server. It's really that easy. If I go to Hello World here, you're going to see this really ugly URL. So let's take care of that. So how we're going to do that is by actually going into the dashboard and in settings, there's a permalinks setting page. Click on that. And here you can choose uh, different structures for the URLs. And so the, this one right here, uh, the post name, that's the prettiest. And so that's what we're going to use. So let's save those changes. And actually the... Uh, our HT access, so this directory isn't writable by the server, and that's because we have the server running under the user Apache 2 instead of uh, under our user. And then the files in here in the directories in our uh, HTML directory is owned by our user. And so what we're going to have to do is change the user uh, that Apache is running at to match our user, and then everything will be uh, fine. Uh, the web server will be able to read and write all these files and whatnot. But for right now, it doesn't. And so what we're going to do is create a new document. We're going to call it .htaccess. Then we're going to open it with a text editor. And what you need to do is basically copy this over here and Something that I noticed actually is that this won't work. This way, I'm going to save this. Save it. I'm going to save this right here. And if we refresh, it's actually going to work. All right. Let me have a look here. Let's open. Right. Uh, okay. So it will work, actually. Good stuff. It was giving me a server error before, uh, but uh, I'm basically this line right here, uh, this rewrite rule, I had to remove it and then everything worked. So if you guys have problems, try removing that third line that says uh, rewrite rule index PHP. Uh, try removing that and everything should work fine. Uh, but we've now got a full WordPress site set up with permalinks enabled. And from here, I mean, you can just go and, you know, create your own pages, posts, and stuff like that. From this point forward, this is basically just all WordPress. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and found it informative. And we're going to be going over uh, more Apache stuff in the next video. Hey, guys. Sorry if I sound a bit off. Uh, for the next few videos. Uh, but what we're going to do in the next few videos is uh, Python. And so we're going to start with uh, the basic installation and uh, how to check your version and a few basic things about Python like the, uh, the command line interface uh, idle. So uh, on Ubuntu 15.10 and uh, the derivatives of that Ubuntu system, you're going to have Python 3.4 pre-installed and Python 2.7.9. And so there's two active versions in development by the Python guys. And basically, if you're going to be developing a new program, I usually recommend using Python 3. And if you want something, if, you, if you're if you jumping into an existing project that's using Python 2, uh, you would need Python 2. Now, the changes between the two are very minimal, but they are code breaking. So you can't just uh, run a Python 2 application using Python 3. It won't work. 
So what we're going to be doing is actually using Python 2, and that's because we need to uh, use a few modules, and we're going to circle back uh, into Apache because we're going to be deploying a Python application through Apache and make it accessible to the web. So first thing, let's check what version we have of Python. So it's 2.7.9. Now, the first thing that we need to do is install the Python. Uh, it's it's called PIP. I don't recall what it uh, it's an acronym for or an abbreviation, but it's basically Python's own package manager. And so to install that, type sudo apt-get install python-pip. This will install pip to your system. Now, if you're going to be using uh, Python 3, you're going to need Python 3-pip. And instead of running pip as a command, you would run pip 3. But for now, we're working with Python 2. So I'm going to install this. Uh, I believe it's already installed on my system. It is. All right. Uh, so you guys should be able to install it this way. And once it's installed, we can actually use it to install Python modules. Uh, and we'll get to that in the next video. Now, something I want to uh, cover very briefly here is uh, the Python interpreter. So Python is an interpreted language uh, where like C and C++ are compiled languages. And so they're different. Uh, you wouldn't typically compile a Python application. So you could actually use a real-time CLI or command line interface program called idle just by typing Python in the, uh, in, uh, the terminal. And here, for instance, we can set... Uh, I was starting to type JavaScript there. <laughs> so to set a variable in Python, you just type the name of the variable. So I'm going to uh, call it age, and that equals 2300. Uh, now, if I print age, it's going to print that number. And you can see this is real time. So that's awesome. Now, if you hit Control Z, it uh, will exit. Uh, if you want to use a different version of the Python interpreter, you can, for instance, type Python 3. Uh, and it will use the most recent version of Python 3. You can also type that. And if you have that installed, that specific version, you can, uh, you, can uh, you know, run that interpreter. So that's how you use different versions in uh, the terminal. And that's basically it for this video. Uh, Python's already pre-installed, so you're good to go. Uh, in the next video, we're going to be covering modules and a few other things. So I wanted to take some time to talk about how truly powerful Python is and why it's so powerful. So a, a lot of what I see when people learn Python, they'll get a handle on the syntax and the internal functions and the way to use Python. And then they're kind of wondering, like, well, how is this practical? Like, what can I do? Or, uh, you know, they're basically missing modules. And so modules are the way that Python has been extended to be such a, a great uh, environment to program in. So we're going to be looking at one specific extension or module in Python. We're going to install it and we're going to uh, start using it. So what we're going to do in the next video, we're going to deploy our Python application through Apache. So we're going to be using a Python module called uh, WebPy. And what WebPy does is basically it just allows us to uh, use Python to uh, serve a web page. So what we're going to do first is install the module. So type sudo pip install web.py. Now, I've already got it installed. You guys should see a little download progress bar, and it should... Uh, well, return with a success message. Uh, 
And once it does, you can start using web.py. So I'm going to actually open up gedit right now. And we're going to start using it. And I'm just going to set up a basic example of uh, this web.py. So let's uh, first crunch bang user bin Python. Now, here's how to import modules in Python. You just type import, and we're going to import web. Now we're going to set a variable called URLs. And uh, so we actually have to do something first. Python requires four space indentation. Uh, and gedit is automatically set up by default to do eight spaces. So we're going to change that to four. Jump out of here. Now here we're going to define routes. So the root is going to reference a class called uh, y class. That's it. Now we're going to create that class. So class my class, and in in the class, basically what returns the HTML is the method uh, get. So you run def get pass itself, and for right now, let's just return h1 hello world h1. Now at the bottom here, outside of that class, we're actually going to uh, set the application variable uh, equal to web app. So application equals web dot application. And we're going to instantiate this here. Uh, so the first parameter is URLs. It's going to take our routes up there. Uh, the globals. And that's it, actually. And then WSGI func. That's it. So let's save. And I'm going to save this into our HTML directory, actually. So var www.html. I'm going to create a new directory here. I'm going to call it Python. And in here, I'm going to call this file main.py. So if we had multiple classes that we wanted to uh, return multiple routes, uh, basically what I would do is uh, say about second class like that. And I could define my second class here. And I would uh, basically just define the get method the exact same way. Pass itself. And then return an HTML string. And I mean, you could even load up uh, HTML template files from files here and, uh, you know, inject uh, variables into the template's HTML file and then return that as a string. And that's a more practical application. Uh, but we're not going to get that in depth into it. I'm going to save this here. And that's all we need to do. So in the next video, we're going to be uh, installing an Apache module in order to serve this up through Apache, and we'll configure a virtual host for it. So thanks for watching this. I hope you guys like it. Hey, guys, welcome back. Uh, so we're all done the development stuff now, and we're moving on to some more uh, basic Linux stuff. And I say basic because this current module is all about users, and so it's all pretty simple stuff, but it is... Uh, 
the reason we decided to do the development stuff and the other stuff before the user stuff is because this is less used, uh, it's less commonly used, and so I don't think it's as important as the other stuff. However, it's still important. So let's go ahead. We're going to do this both graphically and uh, through command line. First, let's do it graphically so we can get that out of the way and then get to the fun stuff. So open up uh, system settings. I realize that my desktop environment is now different from the one that we started on. So if you're still on Unity, just open up Dash and type system settings uh, or just settings, it should find it. If you are on GNOME or any other desktop uh, that uses a uh, full screen launcher with a search, it's going to be the same. If you're using a menu, you would usually find this by going into system tools uh, and there should be a system settings right there. Now, this system settings application, it should look the same on uh, a lot of different desktop environments that, uh, that use GNOME components. And so, as far as I'm aware, there's, you know, most desktop environments actually use GNOME components, uh, including GTK and stuff. So, if you're using a GTK desktop environment, this is probably going to all look the same. If you're using KDE or any KDE-based desktop environments, uh, it's going to look vastly different. Uh, either way, you should have a user accounts item in here. And so you're just going to click on that. And now we've got uh, no access in here. We can't do anything right now because we didn't launch this application as sudo or root. And so we have no authorization over this program to do uh, system level stuff. So we need to unlock it. So just click unlock and then enter your uh, Linux password here. And now these buttons become enabled. So hit the plus symbol and you're going to create an account. Standard is basically a standard user account that doesn't have access to sudo. An administrator would be an account that does have access to sudo. We're going to get to that more uh, in, in a moment. But first, we're just going to create a regular user account. I'm going to give it a name and uh, I'm just going to do this. It's going to create the account and we're good to go. Now we could log out to the login manager or the display manager and log in as this user or we could go into command line and switch user uh, to this user and then do stuff if we wanted to. I'm not going to. For the sake of this video, uh, so we can get out of the GUI stuff uh, as quickly as possible, we're going to just learn how to delete uh, user accounts. So just highlight it in the list on the left and then hit the minus button here. You're going to get a prompt. It's going to ask you if you want to delete files or keep files. If you choose to delete files, uh, this user's home directory is going to be removed. If you decide to keep files, uh, it's just going to leave it. So. Uh, I'm going to delete the files here because I don't need them. And then I'm also going to delete this user account here. So that's all there is to it. Um, let's get out of here uh, and learn how to do this in terminal. So go ahead and bring up your terminal. And in here, we need to uh, use a program or a command called add user. And so we need to run this as root. So type sudo add user and then the username of the account you want to create. So I'm just going to create Nick2. Put in your sudo password. Now it's going to add the user. It's going to add uh, a group for the user and then it's also going to add the user to the group and uh, you know all this other stuff. And then we need to set a password for this new account. So just go ahead and type a password And you can also add additional information about the account uh, if you want to. If you don't want to, just hit enter through all these and then hit Y uh, and enter. And now we've got a new user account. So let's uh, switch over to that account and have a look. So type uh, SU Nick2. We enter the new account's password. And now you can see what user we're using uh, in terminal at the prompt. So it's going to say your username at computer name. And also after here, if we're in any directory, uh, it's going to tell us what directory we're in. We're still in the Nick Germain directory because uh, that's our main user account where we're coming from and that's the directory that we were last in. So if I type sudo nano uh, text file it's already added me to the sudo uh, 
group, so we don't even have to worry about that. Actually, it hasn't. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking that's a bit weird because it shouldn't have uh, been a prompted for the password, so I assumed it did. So this is actually exactly what we wanted to see. We're going to figure out how to get uh, Nick2 into the sudoers file. So let's go ahead and switch back over to our uh, main account. So this, enter your password. And then we're back in this account. In order to add Nick2 to the sudoers file, it's really simple. Just type sudo add user Nick2 sudo. So basically, this command is the same as when we went to create the user, except there's one difference. There's now a fourth parameter in the entire command. So sudo, let's mark that off. We know what that does. Add user is the program we're using. And then there's two additional parameters now. If there's only one, it's going to assume that you're actually adding a user and that's all you're doing. If there's two parameters, what it's going to do is it's going to add the first parameter to the second one uh, as if it was adding a user to a group. And so that's exactly what this is going to do. This is going to add the nick2 user to the sudo group so that it can use sudo. So just hit enter here and, uh, and we're done. So now we can switch back over to that account. And to demonstrate the pseudo privileges, uh, it actually already gave us uh, a, a new message here, logging in as pseudo for the first time. So uh, let's go ahead and use that command. Uh, just make sure everything is working. So pseudo uh, touch uh, text file. Good stuff. Now if we list the directory, we've got a uh, text file there. So now we can sudo rm text file. And then ls again, we're good to go. So uh, that's how to add users to the account. In the next video, actually, we're going to learn how to delete users. It's probably going to be a really short video. So thank you guys for watching. Hey guys, welcome back. In the last video we learned how to graphically add and delete users and in Terminal we learned how to add uh, users and add users to groups. So we're going to bring that full circle at this point and we're going to learn how to delete users from Terminal. So go ahead and open up Terminal and I've got a user created called Nick2 uh, and that's the account that I'm going to delete. So let's go ahead and run this command sudo del user and then the username, and that's it. Uh, and now, you know, if you see this message here, uh, removing user uh, group has no more members, and then done, that's exactly what we want to see. So if I went ahead and tried to switch into that account, it's been deleted. So that's all to this video. Thanks for watching, and uh, in the next video, we're going to be doing some more fun terminal stuff. Hey guys, in the last video we took care of deleting users and now we're actually going to move on to how to change a user's password once the user exists. So it's pretty self-explanatory how you do that through uh, GUI. And so we're going to focus on terminal here. And it's very simple, we're about to learn a new command. So go ahead and type sudo passwd and then the username of the account you want to change the password to. Now you'll get a prompt. You can go ahead and add a new password. And that's literally all there is to it. This is how you would change a password for any user account. And uh, it's really simple. So thanks uh, for watching this video. Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to learn how to uh, create new groups and why we would do that. So for a moment, before we do this, we're going to talk about file permissions again. And this is something we covered very early on, uh, but it, it actually is relevant now. So uh, I'm going to create a file here called text. And, uh, and if I actually I'm going to make a directory here. called group stuff and then move text into group stuff and then change into group stuff just keep things a bit organized here and then I'm going to list the directories here 
you'll see three um, three fields here. Uh, basically, it's read, write, read, write, read. And what this means is uh, owner, group, and everyone else. So I, I'm actually going to play around with the, uh, the user account that I created uh, a few videos ago. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add that user to uh, a specific group. So right now, this is owned by the user, Nick Germain. So this becomes relevant to this section. The group here becomes relevant to this section. So I'm actually going to uh, change ownership of just the group here of this file. So I'm going to uh, chone Uh, so I actually need to create the group first. Good stuff. So now we're going to create the group. And how you do this is uh, type sudo group add tt. That's going to be the name of the group for whatever reason. And now we can run uh, chown germain tt on this file. Uh, let's run sudo bang bang. There we go. So now it's owned by uh, my current user account as well as the group, uh, which has read-write access. So now if we add our second user account to that group and then log in as that second user and attempt to edit the file, we should be able to because we should have read-write access. So in order to add a user to a group, we already learned that actually. So let's go ahead and sudo add user nick3tt. And now if I change uh, user to nick3, uh, I should be able to edit that file without problems, uh, without using sudo. I'm going to control O to save and exit. And uh, so that's why uh, well, that's, you know, a really fundamental reason why groups are used, and uh, it may be relevant to you. It may not entirely be, but it's still good to know how a system works uh, with permissions. So I hope this actually, you know, made more sense of the permissions from the previous videos. I tried to explain it the best I could then, and maybe seeing this will help you guys understand it if you didn't quite, you know, get it at that point. So uh, that's all for this video. Uh, thanks for watching. Hey guys, welcome back. So we're all done with the user accounts and groups and stuff, and uh, we're going to move on to networking. Now, networking is a big topic in and of itself, and so there's no humanly way possible I'd be able to teach you everything there is to know about networking. Uh, and I don't plan to. What I plan to do is give you guys the uh, most essential and necessary, uh, you know, information about networking. And then you guys can take that if you want and, you know, further develop it. But this should be a starting point for you. It should uh, help you understand what's actually happening uh, on a network and even what a network is. So for uh, people new to, uh, I guess, computers and uh, technology, and maybe not new, but maybe uh, you've used the internet before and you just haven't thought about, you know, what's actually happening. And that's how I was for a long time, actually. I, I had worked with an internet service provider, and before I worked there, I just thought, you know, the internet was magic. That, uh, you know, I open up a web browser and type in, you know, a series of letters and, you know, separated by a few dots, and that uh, somehow, magically, I didn't really care how it happened at that point, uh, it went out and found a page and you know, magically brought it to my computer. And so if that's the kind of understanding you guys have at this point, this is going to be some really great information for you guys to take and uh, really absorb. Uh, in this video, we're not going to be doing anything. We're not going to be learning about networking specifically on Linux. We need to understand a few general concepts before we get to that. And so this video is going to be a sort of introduction to networking on Linux uh, and an introduction to networking in general. 
So right now, you are on a computerized device watching this video, uh, which is on the internet. And the way that's happening uh, is basically you're connected to a router or a modem router all-in-one device, and the router is connected to your internet service provider, and your internet service provider has devices that are connected to the bigger world of the internet. So uh, you send a request. Uh, if you open up a browser and type in google.com and then hit enter, your web browser uh, sends that as a request. It's basically saying, okay, this is the web page that this computer wants to look at right now. It sends that through your router, uh, which sends it to your internet service provider and your internet service provider has all these fancy computers that uh, that properly route certain requests uh, to uh, DNS servers any request actually and what a DNS server does is it says okay you gave me this uh, string of text uh, a domain name or a URL and I have a record here that shows this domain or string of text is supposed to serve up uh, the content at this IP address. And so how the internet works is uh, it doesn't understand google.com or facebook.com. Uh, the internet uses network addresses, right? And so think of it like each web server, each server out there has an address, just like every house on your street has an address. So if you were going to send somebody down the street to Joe's place, you would say, uh, okay, well, go to this address. Then you would give them the address of Joe's place, and they would be able to find it. Right? The same thing is happening on a DNS server. You give the DNS server a domain name that you that you want to look at, and then the DNS server takes that and says, "Okay, well, I know this domain name uh, is supposed to route to this IP address, so you request request you need to go over to this server to get that content." And so your request then gets translated to an IP address and other information, and it gets sent to the web server that it's supposed to uh, be at. And then the web server uh, running Apache or anything really, uh, Nginx, or I'm sure there's tons out there that I don't know about, but uh, the web server receives your request. It receives all of the information related to it, so uh, cookies, uh, you know, session variables, stuff like that, as well as uh, the exact item you want to look at. So if you go to uh, website.com slash something slash something else, uh, everything after the .com slash is called a URI, and that indicates uh, w what piece of content on the server you want. So think of the first part, domain.com, as what server you need to be communicating with, and then afterwards, you know, slash about.php or something, that's going to tell the server, once it gets the request, what page it needs to send you. And then it does its, you know, rendering process, and it sends you uh, that page in uh, in the exact same route that your request took to get there. So it's like when you send your friend down the street to Joe's place to pick up uh, a box of pizza, and so your friend walks down the street, he turns left, you know, maybe he turns right, he gets to Joe's place, he walks in, says, hey, I need to get a pizza. Uh, Joe gives him the pizza, and then he walks the same way back to your house, and before you know it, a web page has loaded within your computer box. And that's how that happens. I hope you guys understood that. In the next video, we're actually going to cover a few more concepts before we can dive into, you know, really understanding uh, to the point that we can use applications to do certain things in regards to networking. So I hope you guys found that informative. If you didn't, if there's any point in this video that you felt lost or confused or even that I was just rambling or even if you just want to tell me, you know, a few more web server applications aside from Apache, uh, there is a comment section to the side of this video and you just leave a comment I will reply I'll get you whatever information you need and uh, hopefully this will make sense to you so in the last video we described how the internet works 
what the internet is, is technically an interconnected uh, collection of networks. So all these little networks all over the world can now be connected to other networks in the world. And so we have the internet, which is uh, just that. So to understand a network, and here we're bringing it down from uh, you know the top level stuff down to a more localized uh, thing. And so a local network is the type of network that you have set up in your house, where you connect to the router. The router then you know can interact with the internet for you and then return the uh, information to your computer. Now, I wanted to talk for a moment about IP addresses and the current issues that face them uh, while still using IPv4. So, let's go ahead and open up uh, a document here. So, an IP address looks like this. This is an IP address of a server somewhere, probably. Uh, if you put this in your, let's uh, actually try that. That was just a random one that I just wrote up. See what happens. And this is probably uh, the address of somebody, somebody, you know, uh, somebody uh, is connected to an internet service provider and they get one IP address for all their computers and the reason why that happens is because these IP addresses can go from from uh, they can go from 1.1.1.1 all the way to 255 like that so as you can imagine the range uh, here is pretty big but it's not quite big enough for the human population. And so we've been running out of IP addresses for the last 15 or 20 years. And multiple solutions have been brought into the equation to try and solve this problem. One of them was called a NAT. And what this is, is a network address. Basically, you have one router, you have one IP address. So the IP address you have, let's say, is this one up here at the top. This is your IP address that the uh, internet service provider has given you. Without the use of a router, you can plug one device into the modem and your computer will use this IP address in requests. So basically, when you send a request to google.com to load a page or to load a search, what happens is uh, your IP address gets sent to Google as well so that Google can return uh, this data to your device. But what happens when you only have one IP address and seven computers connected? That's when the NAT comes into place. So this IP address now is, uh, is the IP address of your modem or router and it assigns NAT addresses to uh, all the devices on your network. So let's say you just have two devices on the network. Uh, the first one, actually the IP address of your actual router is likely this. I've seen uh, one instance where a network did not use this IP address as its uh, router's IP address. Okay. Uh, the IP addresses that your router will assign to computers in your home all begin with 192. So basically, it would be something like that, right? That would be the IP address. Actually, hold up a sec. Uh, I got this wrong. Uh, this is the IP address of your router. This is the IP address of your first computer. So it always begins with 192.168. Your second computer might be this. And your third computer might be this. So now you have three IP addresses, three devices on your network, and your router here is keeping track of them. So uh, from this device, I uh, type google.com into the address bar. What happens is this IP address, along with the request, gets sent to my router. 
The router then sends the request off to the ISP and then over to the internet and stuff uh, with the IP address of the router, which internally is this and externally, this is our ISP IP address they gave us. So what happens, this gets sent to google.com. Google.com sends the page back to this IP address connected to the router here. The router then takes that request and connects it with the device that requested it. And then it sends it back to that device, right? And so that's how a, a, a router interfaces between a local network and the internet. So uh, in the olden days, before the NAT address and routers really took off, each one of these computers would have had a different IP address. So it would have looked something like uh, this. Right, and, and so on. So that would have been three actual IP addresses uh, when we found a way that you actually only need one IP address per network. And so that's what a router does. And so these IP addresses are local and you're gonna see these uh, in terminal. Now one other special IP address is 127.0.0.1. On every computer, this means this computer. It's basically a self-identifying IP address. If I were to type this into my browser, I would see my local host, where if you put this into your browser, you would see your local host. Uh, 192.1, uh, you know, the, the NAT IP address basically works the same way. So if I were to go to 192.168.0.3, it would try to find a computer only on my network that has this address and then connect to it. So uh, that's how a router works. And in the next video, we're going to be getting into, uh, into the if config. Uh, on Windows, you have an IP config command. On Linux here, you've got IF config. And we're going to cover that in the next video and a few other uh, commands as well. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we are going to get to some practical networking things, and this is all in Terminal. And so, the first thing we're going to do is bring up Terminal. And first I want to talk about the ping command, and what this means and what it does. So you can ping an IP address or a domain name to see if you can get a successful response from it. This is a great way, uh, let's say you're using a web, this is just an example, if you're using a web browser and you're trying to troubleshoot uh, if the web browser isn't working or if your entire internet connection isn't working, you might drop down here to command line and run a ping command on a known host that you know is always going to be up, for instance, google.com. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, so I'm just going to type in the command ping and then the address of what I want to ping and I'm getting a response and it tells us uh, what uh, what length of time each response is taking to return to us uh, and so yeah I mean that's it also shows other stuff like the exact IP address uh, the the the, uh, the server that it's reaching and that good stuff and this is gonna just go until you close it so just control C to exit and then it gives you a breakdown of what happened. So you could let this run for a while to see if you're getting any packet loss uh, through your network card. And so that's what pinging does. So I'm going to clear this up here. We're going to talk about the command ifconfig. So on Windows in command line you have a command called ipconfig and it spits out a whole bunch of information about your uh, network configuration. Uh, in Linux, it's ifconfig, and it does the same thing. So I'm just going to make this a bit bigger here, and I'm going to run that command again. All right. So this is going to link uh, our addresses here, or our network interfaces, and uh, also any IP addresses that it has and whatnot. So the first one is going to be an Ethernet, which I don't have plugged in right now, and so it's going to be basically... Uh, not working. This is the name of uh, that interface. 
Uh, this is our local loopback. So this is like a virtual interface that runs that uh, it, it has our local host address here and it basically controls that. And then down here we have our wireless ethernet, uh, which we can see this is working as I've got uh, received bytes. Um, so Rx basically means what you've received. Tx basically means what you've transferred out. Uh, so that's how to read that. Uh, there's an IP6 address right here. And uh, my IP address, or this is going to be my NAT address. And uh, it gives IDs and stuff of the uh, network interface device. And so that's basically how to use IF config. Sometimes this might be useful to see if you, you know, you're getting a, a valid IP address from the router and to see you know, if it's actually working at all, which you can see here mine is. So I'm going to clear this. And what we're going to go over now is a command called TCP dump. It's a really powerful command line packet sniffer. Uh, so it can analyze the packets that are, you know, going in and out of your uh, computer or your network. So the first thing we need to do is install it if we don't already have it installed. So sudo apt get install tcp dump. It's probably already installed, but just in case, gonna make sure. And it is, and it's the newest version. So this is a big command line tool. And I was going to do more stuff in the video, but I think uh, we're going to cut it off after this command. So uh, what we're going to do is basically just run the command tcp dump. Uh, we don't have permission to capture on that device. So we're going to run sudo tcp dump. And this is capturing all packets that are coming in and out of my uh, my computer and this is just going to run until you cancel so I'm just going to cancel here now as you can see that was a pretty big output and so what we can do is we can only capture a certain amount so what we're going to do is that so what how we do that is basically using the TCP dump command with a C let's capture 10 and that's good all right, I've got to run it as sudo cp dump dash c 10. So this is going to capture 10 packets, and that's all it's going to do. All right now, it's not capturing any. Let's go ahead and do some updates. So that just captured 10 of the packets uh, from my sh machine uh, that that was essentially coming into my machine. And so we can analyze them a bit. We can see where they're going to and where they're coming from. And so we can see here basically, uh, let's, so the first column is a timestamp, right? Uh, over here, we've got the IP address that we're sending from. So this is our machine here, as you recall. And it's sending this packet out to our router, which basically ends up here at this domain. And so that's how to use uh, you know, TCP dump uh, very, very minimally. Uh, there are some other options that we can go through as well. For this command. So you can print the captured packets in ASCII. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. TCP dump. I'm going to run C10. We're just going to capture, well, uh, let's capture 5. And then we run uh, dash capital A. And this is going to print uh, out the actual packets in ASCII. Uh, so you can use this if you're trying to see, you know, what exactly you're getting. And this just all looks uh, like gibberish to me. Uh, but it's the packets that are actually uh, coming through. So that's that's a neat way to use this command. So 
So basically, uh, if you only want to listen on one uh, network interface, I'm going to run ifconfig again. And we can see WLO1 is the name of this device. So what I'm going to do is run TCP dump as sudo. I'm going to capture 5. And we're going to use dash I WLO1. And what that dash I does is it tells it to listen to a very specific interface that we define after that uh, dash I. Now, in addition to uh, displaying the packets in ASCII format, we can also display them in hex and ASCII. So this may make sense uh, for you if you're looking for some hex, uh, hex response from these packets that are coming in and out. So what we're going to do is run sudo tcp dump dash capital XX dash I WLO1. And this is going to print out, I didn't use the C flag, so I'm just going to cancel there. So this is going to print out packets in hex and ASCII format. So I'm going to clear this here. One other neat thing is you can capture packets from specific ports. And so let's go ahead and do that. So let's run sudo tcp dump. And I'm going to show you guys why that's going to make sense here in a moment. Uh, dash I W L O one. This is the name of my interface. And then port 22. Now, right now, I don't think I have any port 22s going on here. And that's because port 22 is an SSH port. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to my server via SSH, and we're going to see packet activity here. So I'm just going to connect, and here we see a bunch of packets happening. And each time you do something, you can see exactly what's happening here, uh, and you'd, you'd be able to parse through these. Um, and you know basically see that there is activity what kind of activity and uh, you know where it's happening between so so that is a bit about the TCP dump command this is going to be good with troubleshooting uh, network activity there's not really many other uses that I can think for this but if you uh, have any uses for this that I don't know about uh, leave a comment. I would like to know how you guys use this command if you do or any any practical applications that you think this command would serve. Hey guys, welcome back. So last video we looked at a way to really track packets and the packets that are actually being sent uh, to and from uh, this machine individually as packets and now we're going to talk about a command called netstat which is an abbreviated uh, term for network statistics so basically the command that we're going to be using throughout this video is netstat and based on the flags that we pass it it's going to return different statistics So if I put uh, netstat-nr, the n option makes netstat print addresses as dots, uh, you know, dotted IP addresses rather than symbolic host network names. So this is going to make sense if you want to see the actual IP addresses rather than the domains that are connected uh, to the machine. And so this is what I've got right now. Uh, it basically gives us the information that we're looking for regarding uh, the IP uh, routing table. And so the R uh, flag in that command that I just put basically states that we're looking for the kernel IP routing table. And that basically shows uh, what certain things are routed to. So let's actually display inter network interface statistics themselves and we're going to do that with the dash i command so we're going to type netstat dash i 
And this shows us the usage of each of our devices. And so we can see the local host here, which was configured, uh, has sent uh, this many packets right here. Uh, and it's received this many packets. Uh, as, as compared to our wireless interface, which so far has received that many, uh, and actually this is bytes, not packets, uh, and this many. So you can kind of see how this would be useful. We can actually display uh, connections to our machine as well. And so I think my system updater is still going. It is, so this is gonna be good. What we're gonna do is run the net stat with the flags dash TA. And this is gonna look for active sockets and it's going to print out uh, the status of them and basically, you know, uh, the foreign address and the local address. So this obviously is our local machine here. Uh, these are the foreign addresses that it's uh, connecting to. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, run netstat-tan and it's going to show IP addresses instead of the uh, host names and so you can see how that's going to be useful uh, because we can actually combine elements of the different uh, flags that we're passing to the netstat command and it's basically you know going to change the way that each of these outputs works and so that is how you would use netstat to uh, to view active connections and active uh, routes uh, of IP addresses internally uh, through through the command line here, and you know if you're not sure of any, if you think you your computer may be connecting to a malicious host or something, what you can do is you can take these IP addresses and you can actually look them up through um, through a website like Network-Tools. I think it's Network-Tools.com. It could be .org. I'm not sure. But you can find information about each one of these hosts uh, if you're not sure where it came from. And just by looking at these, you might be able to, you know, the, the actual host names themselves, you may, you may know what they are. I think these are all my updates that are happening through the software updater. So that's, uh, I don't recognize any of these. So that's how to use Netstat. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and found it informative. Uh, I hope you guys can basically understand what Netstat does. It's a very simple command, but it's very useful in a lot of circumstances. So thank you guys for watching this video. I'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about hosts uh, briefly. So uh, in terms of our local host actually. So there's two parts to this video. Uh, the first we're going to cover is the hosts file, and we briefly touched on that in a previous video. I think when we were when we were deploying, uh, I think our Meteor application uh, with Apache 2, uh, we went into our hosts file to create uh, some routes for the for the application. So basically, the hosts file is in etc slash hosts. So we can go ahead and open that up. Uh, just type sudo nano slash etc slash hosts and hit enter. Put in your password. And this is our hosts file. So we actually did, uh, we were in here for app.localhost, uh, subdomain and Python. So the virtual hosts and Python deployment and the Meteor deployment, we were in here. And I didn't really explain to what extent you can use this file. Uh, so as I explained in the networking introduction video, uh, a DNS server basically holds records of what domains point to what IP addresses. Think of this file as an internal DNS uh, lookup uh, functionality. So when I go to app.localhost, the first place my computer checks for a route is the hosts file. 
if it doesn't find an entry for a domain in the hosts file, then it goes out to the router and then your ISP and then a DNS server and it checks uh, there if there's any records for it. So by adding entries here, we can actually override default behavior of known domains that we want to change. So what I'm going to do is open up Firefox here for a moment and I'm going to go to a website that will allow us to get the IP address of google.com because we're going to be using that. So I'm just going to go to network-tools.com and I'm going to type in here google.com and we can see that this IP address is the one we're looking for. Uh, so I'm going to copy this here and I'm going to jump back into this file. Now this file can take three columns and we've only discussed two so far so let's go ahead and uh, cover all the columns here in great detail. So the first one is the IP address that we want to route to. The second column is going to be the domain or the host name that we want to route to that. So let's just type in go.com and then the third column is an alias so we can just type go and so when we save this file what we're gonna see is when we go to go it's going to go to google.com and their, their servers have actually uh, they're not okay so they're doing a lot of internal routing there uh, let's try YouTube so what we're gonna do again we're gonna get the, actually let's try something that we know is uh, going to work so I'm gonna just type in my own server name here I'm gonna grab that IP address jump back into our host file I'm gonna paste that there now I'm going to save this again and go to go.com and saying it's not found. It's weird because this just worked. All right, so I just had to restart uh, Firefox here. Uh, this is the default server page, uh, the root page for my server. If I were to go to server.pointybracket.net and I actually get the exact same uh, page. And so what I can do, I believe, is access the routes on the server as normal and it works. So what we're doing, as you can see, is we're just... Uh, we're just setting DNS records internally for this machine that it looks at before it goes out to get the correct uh, DNS information. So again, I'm going to go to network-tools. We're going to try with like, uh, let's try and find uh, Joe's Pizza, a website for them. There we go. So let's see if this will work. This is the IP address I'm getting. So I'm going to check if that IP address will route to the website as well. Uh, nope, but it routes to this page. So this is the page we should see after we paste this into our hosts file. So let's go ahead and save. And then let's go to go forward slash. No, let's close this. there we go and so you can see how this works is basically uh, it routes to whatever we want to route to so you could create shortcuts for your favorite websites uh, with the exception of Google uh, Google does a lot of internal routing and stuff 
And sometimes this will work, sometimes it won't. It all depends on how the web server is set up. Usually though, I just use the hosts file to set uh, domains to go to my local host, and that's for when I'm developing something that uh, a URL needs to be set with. So if I'm developing a WordPress site on my local machine, and I need to set a, uh, set a URL in the WordPress configuration, I would configure a domain and then point that to my local host. So that is the hosts file. Let's exit out of here and close this. I'm going to clear that. So now our host name. A host name is basically a name of machine. And in this instance, uh, ours is called Voltron. And we can see that because we've got this right here. So you can use the host name. Uh, much like uh, the same way you can use, uh, you know, custom hosts that you set. So I can just go to Voltron and it's going to route to my uh, Apache default page. Now you can also update the host name and we need to do uh, a couple things in order to do that. So first we're going to run the command sudo hostname ctl set dash host name, and then whatever host we want to name it to. So uh, Megazord. Now we need to edit the hosts file to update uh, our host name here as well. So we're going to replace Voltron with Megazord. We're going to save this and close it. And then we're going to run sudo service host name restart. There. Uh, it said it failed to restart the hostname service, but it looks like its working hostname is now set to Megazord. And if I were to close the browser and reopen it, I should be able to go to Megazord forward slash. And it does, in fact, uh, redirect me to my default Apache 2 page. And so that's what a host name is and how to change it on Ubuntu. Uh, you could also change it through the system settings, but we're not going to go through a GUI way to do this right now. Uh, so thanks for watching. I hope you guys found this informative. If you have any questions, just leave a comment. Otherwise, I'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, we're about to talk about the trace route command and what it does and why you'd use it. But first we need to install that program. So just uh, come along with me, run sudo apt-get install trace root. And it's going to fetch that from the uh, repositories and it's going to install it for us. And when it's done, we can run the command. So run trace route, all one word, and then the domain that you want to uh, trace the route to. And it's going to spit out every server that the request jumps from uh, and to in order to get to Google's server. Uh, when you see three asterisks, it means the request has timed out on that server, so it's going to try another one. And there we go. So let me make this a bit bigger, so it might be easier to read here. All right. So uh, we can basically trace... Uh, what servers we are communicating with in order to get to google.com. So when I, um, when I type in google.com into my browser, it doesn't just go from my uh, router. The request doesn't get sent automatically right to Google servers. What happens is there's a lot of intermediary servers in between the two, including your ISP, the DNS servers, and then other servers that, that need to be hopped to in order to get to Google. Uh, and so this is what we're seeing here. The first request, uh, it, this is the IP address of my router, and this is the length of time that it took to get there. 
what happens then is this address uh, is where this goes. And, and you can see each address as we go down gets a bit different because we're, we're going to a different part of the world. And the host name will show it's, if it's available too with the IP address in the bracket. So we can see this is my ISP uh, and this is one of the servers that my request has to hop uh, from in order to get the information required to get to google.com. So I'm going to try with my own server here. So I'm just going to type uh, trace route uh, pointy bracket dot net. And we can see that it's accessing different servers in order to get to uh, where it needs to be. So in here we can see two interesting things. Uh, first of all, my internet service provider. And second of all, my uh, virtual private server provider. And uh, I'm not going to point those out, but we can see that. And then we can see also everything in between that holds information uh, about the route that our request needs to take in order to get to that server. So that's how to use trace route, and that's why you would is just kind of to you know trace the route of your request uh, to different servers. Uh, so thank you guys for watching this video, and I will see you guys again soon. Hey guys, welcome back. This is the last video in the uh, networking module. Uh, I just want to give you guys the tools you need to further your knowledge of networking in general and how networking uh, tasks would be performed on Linux. And so there is one more tool that I want to introduce you guys to called Nmap. So Nmap is an abbreviation for the term Network Mapper and it's an open source tool that can tell you what devices are on the network, what IP addresses are in use, and what services each machine is offering. Uh, so let's go ahead. We need to install the tool. So let's run uh, sudo apt get install nmap. And it's going to download about three megabytes uh, of uh, data, and it's going to expand to 18 megabytes. All right, now that this is installed, the way we're going to use this is by simply typing nmap, and then we can do a bunch of things after this. So the first thing we're going to cover is how to scan a specific IP address. And so I want to get the IP address that I have. So I'm going to run ifconfig, and it's uh, 0.100. So nmap 192.168. And we can see uh, what ports are open. Uh, wh well, we can see what ports are available, their state, and then also the service that they provide uh, by name. So I have Apache installed this, on this machine. You guys should have it installed on yours as well if you went through the Apache videos. And so you should see the same thing here. And so the port is 80. Uh, the state is opened uh, because we've got... Uh, we've got Apache running right now. It automatically runs when you start up the machine. And the service that that port provides is HTTP. So if I were also running an SSH server on this uh, machine, you would see another entry in this list for port 22. It would say state open and service SSH or something to that effect. Now, if we want more information, we can run nmap-v and then the IP address again, so 168.0.100. Uh, dash V means verbose, and what verbose mode does in most applications is it also, aside from the regular output, it also uh, gives you more direction on what's happening in the application or provides more information than you would uh, than you would normally get. And so in this uh, instance, we see that uh, it's doing a bunch of scans. 
Uh, it scans the IP address then for a thousand ports and it finds all these ports that are open and then it also finds a bunch of uh, a bunch of closed ports uh, listed here 996 closed ports and it uh, it gives us the same output as before so that's neat I only have one device on my network actually uh, except for my router now my router I believe is uh, 192.168.0.1 or it's .2.1? No, it's .0.1. All right. So that is the IP address of my router. So what we can do is we can um, we can scan multiple IP addresses at a time in multiple ways. So the first way that we're going to do is uh, by specifying each IP address. So let's go ahead and run nmap. 192.168.0 dot and then we're going to add uh, the last values in here separated by comma so first I'm going to scan my machine as well as the router and if I had uh, uh, a network address of 192.168.0.10 I could also do that but I don't so I'm not going to now what we see here is uh, this right here would be my router. We can see this is the IP address for it. And this is what ports that it offers on which, or this is what services it offers on which ports. And then we get my machine right here uh, that, that provides the same output as it does before, but this is how it would output multiple um, machines scan results. Now you can also scan a range of IP addresses. So let's go ahead and run the nmap command again at 192.168.0.1-100. This is going to go from 1 all the way to 100 and it's going to scan all IP addresses within that range. So if I had a bunch of machines on my network, which I actually do, I have my phone on that network as well and that's it actually so I've got my router my uh, computer and my phone my phone is not uh, it's not coming up so I'm just uh, I'm not doing anything on my computer right at the moment I'm just checking what IP address I have on my phone here if I can find out how okay so the IP address on my phone is uh, .101. So what I'm going to do is run the previous command and just have it scan from 1 to 101. We should see three machines come up. Uh, I don't think my phone has any, uh, has any services or open ports that it would list. But let's have a look here. And when you scan multiple IP addresses, the more you scan, the longer it takes. So, no, okay, so there's nothing available for my phone uh, coming up. Now you can also scan, uh, so, so when we talked about IP addresses, whoa, 192.168. Zero dot. We discovered that you can use anything from zero to 255. So if I were to want to scan all IP addresses uh, that begin with 192.168.0, I could then put this in here, right? Uh, but rather than doing that, we can actually use a wildcard here. And I'm actually going to cancel out of this because it's going to take a while. So now you don't only have to scan devices on your local network. You can also scan uh, external uh, IP addresses or host names. So I'm going to scan my server here uh, by typing nmap and then the I or well the host name of my uh, server. It's gonna it's gonna take a moment 
and I've got like a lot of open ports just because I have so many different things running. I've got uh, uh, it's it, there's a lot of things that run on it, and some things that I just set up that I've never really used, and I haven't bothered to uh, shut them down. And so what we get here is my host, and we can see that I've got. Uh, FTP, SSH, SMTP, we've got the standard domain and HTTP, POP3. Uh, there, there's a bunch of stuff here, and uh, I'm not going to go into what all those are, but uh, we can see that these are uh, everything that the server has. Now, you can, also, you can also set a file. So let me clear this. Uh, let's open up gedit. So we're going to create a file of, uh, of hosts that we want to regularly scan, and this can save time when we scan them. Uh, if you've got like a, you know, a few hosts that you regularly check on, so I'm going to put pointy bracket dot net one nine two dot one six eight dot zero dot one and one nine two dot one six eight dot zero dot a hundred, and then I'm going to save this as uh, networks.txt. So what we can do there is we can type nmap-il, so it's a lowercase i and a capital L, and then the location of that file, so it was networks.txt in my home directory. And it's going to scan each of the hosts that is in that network's file. And it returns in the order that they were scanned in. So, so that's pretty neat. Uh, I want to go over a few more things with you guys regarding this command. It does get pretty big. There's so much stuff that you can do with this. And so I really urge you guys to go and explore this if uh, networking is one of your interests, if you want to really uh, you know, follow that. Uh, one of the things that I want to show you guys is how we can turn on OS and version detection during the scan. And so what we're going to do is type nmap dash capital A 168.0 to 100. And this is going to scan, oh, there. I had a little typo in the IP address there, uh, so I had to just fix that. So this should tell me the operating system and versions that are running on the devices on my network. And you can also find uh, this information about other hosts. Uh, aside from this, uh, just while this is running, you can scan a network and find out which servers and devices are up and running by using the flag dash lowercase s capital P. You can display the reason that a port is in a particular uh, state by adding the flag dash dash reason. You can choose to only show open ports, which appears to be the default functionality here. It doesn't show the closed ports. Uh, you can actually also show all of the uh, uh, host interfaces for a machine by typing dash dash if list in the list of uh, arguments for this command. And I mean, it, again, it, it's really big, so so go ahead and uh, look this up. Just, uh, you know, if you want to type in google.com uh, nmap commands, there's a bunch of different ones that you guys should probably play around with. Uh, this was more of an introduction on to uh, the most uh, common or basic functionalities of this program. And actually, I'm going to cancel this here. And I'm just going to restart this so it'll go a bit faster. I'm just going to target my own IP address here so that we can get this done. And uh, you guys can see the example output that this is going to do when adding the dash A flag in here. So here you can see 
a lot of information about this machine. So let's go up to the top here. Uh, we've got the port, the state, and the service, as well as the version of the service. So I have Apache 2.4.12 installed, and that's also the same one here. And if we go down, we get more information about the host itself. So we have OS is Unix. Uh, we've got the computer name, the domain name, if any, is, uh, if any is configured, the fully qualified domain name, and uh, we, uh, just a lot more information. So that is the Nmap command, and it would be useful if you're trying to just scan your network. Um, one of the examples that comes off the top of my head that would be, you know, when you would, when I would use this command is if I notice that the internet's, uh, you know, running a bit slow, let's say I've got 10 people in my house and half of them may or may not be using the internet and I want to see how many people are online, uh, th this is what I would do in, in that instance. Or if you, you know, if you want to check how many machines offer a certain service or what the IP address is that you need to use to access a certain service on another machine, this would help you figure that out. So thank you guys for watching this video. Uh, we'll see you guys again soon. Hey guys, in this video it's all about SSH. So first, what is SSH? It's an abbreviation that stands for Secure Shell, and it basically allows you to access the shell or the command line of a remote host that is uh, that has an SSH server set up. And so in the previous, in one of the previous videos, I connected via SSH to my, uh, my own server. And so I'm going to do that again, and I'm going to explain exactly what I'm doing as I'm doing it. So the way to get connected to a remote host through command line is using the SSH command. And then the only argument it's going to take is the uh, connection string. So in this case, it's my username on my remote host at and then the remote host. So I can use this or any other domain name that points to that server or I could use the server's IP address. And when I hit enter, it's going to ask for my password on that machine. So I'm going to put it in. And you're going to see that the prompt is going to change. Uh, I've actually got this machine named the exact same thing as I have my server name. So it's uh, Nick at Voltron here. And I'm on my local machine. So if I were to go to uh, var www html and then run the ls command, I'm going to see that I've got a lot of directories here actually. And a lot of these are actually unused and old projects that I worked on. But anyway, uh, basically, once you get connected, all the commands are the exact same because uh, it's essentially just a remote Linux shell. So I could return to my home directory and then list those files. And you'll see that again, uh, I've got uh, just a bunch of random files. So that is how to connect to SSH. When you're done, just type exit and the connection will be closed. So that was a really short video. Uh, just to recap, how to get connected is type SSH, your remote username at the name of the remote host and hit enter and it's gonna ask for your password. So thank you guys for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to be going over some SFTP, which is a bit bigger. Hey guys, let's go over some SFTP. So first, what is SFTP? Uh, well, first, before we answer that question, let's ask a similar but different question. What is FTP? So FTP is an acronym for the term File Transfer Protocol and it uses the port 21 and basically what it does is it transfers files between two machines. So SFTP, because in, in regular FTP everything is transferred in clear text so if anybody's sniffing packets on your network like we learned in a previous video uh, they would be able to read all those uh, packets basically. So we're not going to use FTP. I actually recommend never use FTP. 
uh, SFTP is just easier anyway. And so we're just going to use SFTP. So similarly to the SSH command, you're going to write uh, SFTP and then the connection string. So in my case, it's exactly the same as before. It's going to then ask for my password for the remote host. So I'm going to put that in here. And now uh, I can list uh, what's in what's on the remote host by typing ls, but we also have a few different commands to uh, list what's on the local host. I'm actually going to exit here. I'm going to make a directory uh, called sftp demo. I'm going to change into sftp demo, and I'm going to touch a file called names.txt. Now I'm going to reconnect while in this directory to my server. Now if I run ls, I get the remote directory's current directory listing. If I type lls, I get the local listing in, uh, of the directory that I'm in on the local host. And so here we can actually uh, we can grab files and transfer them to and from uh, both machines. So if I wanted to put names.txt onto the server in the current directory, what I would do is type put names.txt and it's going to upload it to my remote uh, host with the same name. So that's when you would use put uh, if you want to push a file from uh, from your local machine to the remote host. Similarly, you'd use the command get to get uh, files. So I'm going to I'm I'm I really don't recall uh, any of these uh, files. I'm just gonna uh, get the composer JSON file. So I'm gonna type get composer .json. And if I run LLS on my local machine, I now see that I have that file there. So if I exit and then run ls, I've got that file there. So that is how you would use SFTP to transfer files to and from machines, and also a few, uh, a few of the commands there that can help you see what files are available. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you guys again soon. So the last video that we're doing is setting up an SSH host on our local machine and it's really simple. So let's go ahead and open up terminal. Uh, we need to install OpenSSH server. So go ahead and run sudo apt get install OpenSSH dash server I believe it is. We'll get an error message if that's not it. It's been a while since I did this so So now, once we have it installed, you're basically good to go. Uh, however, we are going to make it a little more secure. We're going to change the port that this runs on. And so there is an sshd config file now. Uh, let's go ahead and run sudo nano. It's in etc slash ssh slash sshd underscore config, I believe it is. There it is. So we can go ahead and make this more secure by changing the port and also changing the authentication stuff. So let's go ahead and change the port to uh, 2212 instead of the default 22. Uh, and then we're going to scroll down here a bit. And under authentication here, we're going to change... Uh, uh, permit root login to no. So nobody's going to be able to log in as root. We're going to scroll down a bit here as well. And we're going to add a line that says allow users. And this is going to take basically a list of usernames. 
uh, of users who are allowed to log in through SSH. So I'm going to make my user account able to log in through SSH and this is going to restrict all other users from uh, connecting to this machine via SSH. So I'm going to save it and exit. I'm going to clear this a bit. And then what we need to do is restart the SSH service. So run sudo system control restart SSH. And you're good to go. And so now if I were on a different machine here, actually, let's see if I can get my external IP address here. I don't think I can get it through here. No. All right. Let's clear this. I'm going to open up network-tools. I'm going to do something like uh, if you guys uh, have seen the movie Inception, uh, this concept that I'm about to do will feel a little, uh, a little bit familiar to you. This, by the way, when you go to network-tools.com, the IP address that pops into this input field by default is your external, your public-facing IP address. This is the IP address that your uh, internet service provider gives to you. Now, actually, in order for this to work, this would have to be uh, the only machine, or I would have to set up uh, through the router DMOS uh, port forwarding uh, or a host forwarding. But what we can try, we're going to try it anyway. I'm going to SSH into my pointy bracket server. And then from here, I'm going to SSH into this machine. If it'll let me, it probably won't forward that port. So I would have to go through my router at this point to configure port forwarding for that port 2212 um, in order to be able to connect uh, from an external host to this host. If you only have one machine uh, plug, so basically, like the IP address of my server, when I when I go to the IP address, it goes directly to my server. It's not uh, configured through NAT addresses. My server actually has five IP addresses, uh, and those IP addresses go directly to my server, and that's why I can access SSH uh, on that server without having to configure any routers or anything. I think actually the 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 server provider. Uh, manage that in some way. So, uh, so anyway, you know, if I were to go into my router and configure uh, DMOS or port forwarding, what I was just doing would in fact work. So, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you guys again soon. Hey guys, welcome back. So, this is the actual last video of this course. And I'm doing it because I realized that I didn't cover this command when I had meant to in previous videos. And so this command is going to help you find information about all the different uh, flags that you can use for different programs and, uh, and different options that you can pass it, as well as just general information about a program. And so the command we're covering is called man. So you just type that into terminal, and then the program that you want information about. So uh, for instance, if I wanted more information about the SSH command, I would type man space SSH. And this is going to show a manual page about this SSH program. And so you can see in synopsis, it kind of uh, it shows you examples of flags that you can pass it. Uh, it has a description, and then it also has detailed uh, information about each flag or option that you can pass through the command here, and you can just hit Q to quit that. So if I wanted to, for example, look up uh, Chromium Browser in uh, the man pages, I would do that, and it would load up this. Uh, you can actually launch Chromium Browser with a lot of different uh, options as well. And so this, this command here is going to help you guys out. Uh, there's a lot of times when people uh, ask for help and, and the, the help that they need was right there on the computer the entire time, but they just uh, either they didn't know about it or they just didn't uh, think about checking the man page. 
and so that's why I wanted to let you guys know this this is one of the best uh, forms of assistance that you're going to get for Ubuntu or any other Linux distribution that has man installed as well so that's what I wanted to go over in this video uh, if you're confused with any commands or you want to know how far you can take that command uh, for instance I'm going to type man and map and here it's going to give a description you can really learn a lot about programs here and here it's going to give you examples uh, of how you can uh, run the run the command and it also gives you an entire list of all the options that you can uh, that you can pass to this command as well and so I also want to take the opportunity to congratulate you guys and let you know uh, how awesome this experience has been for me as well. I'm so happy to be able to share uh, my knowledge about Ubuntu Linux with you guys and help you guys take that first step towards uh, you know, becoming a Linux master. Uh, we've covered a lot of command line utilities in this program that you guys are going to probably find really helpful later on. Uh, if you guys are going into Linux administration uh, career paths, hopefully this is the stepping stone that you can use to propel you into Linux even deeper. There's a lot more uh, when it comes to Linux. This has been over seven hours of content, but in that over seven hours of content, we've only been able to really scratch the surface on Linux. And so I, I hope you guys can use this to move forward and so thank you guys so much for joining me. Hopefully uh, I will see you guys again soon in maybe another course.